Well, hello and welcome to Hearth and Hose OTR Visual Radio. I'm Mr. H. I'll be your host for this evening. Tonight's compilation is The New Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. This show ran from 1939 until 1950 and had 374 episodes. Unfortunately, many episodes were lost to history. The show starred Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce. For most episodes, although in the later seasons, different actors took over the roles. And of course, they were continuing the characters that they made famous in the film versions of Sherlock Holmes. Over the years, the show had a few different titles, including Sherlock Holmes, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. But the most popular title and the one most remembered is The New Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. So that's what we went with tonight. Now, for tonight's compilation, we've got episodes that start off in 1939 and go all the way through 1945. So tonight we're in for a real treat with such high caliber actors as Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce. The shows are well written and have great production value. So all in all, I think we're in for an enjoyable evening. Now, just before we get into the show, do you want to take a minute to tell you about a couple ways you can help support the channel? First up, we've got the Johnny Dollar Club starting at just a dollar a month. You can help keep these great shows coming. You've got three ways to join. Coffee.com, buymeacoffee.com, and patreon.com. The links for those are in the description below. And many of you have asked about using PayPal. So if you prefer PayPal, the first option, coffee.com, is a great one for you. And the second way you can help support the channel and get a little something for yourself is to check out our Hearth and Home shop on Etsy. We've got a great assortment of old-time radio-related merchandise, including the yours truly Johnny Dollar collection. We've got the old-time radio detective mug series. And our newest collection, starting right now, is, is the Harold Apple Knocker collection. The link for the Etsy shop is in the description below. Head on over and check that out. But now it's time to sit back and relax and enjoy Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. And as always, thanks for tuning in. Attacking me with a sword. A bad guy. Whoa. Bye. <laughs> The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce. The makers of Grove's Bromo Quinine Tablets bring you another adventure of Sherlock Holmes with Basil Rathbone as Sherlock Holmes and Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson. A cold is a miserable thing. A cold may become a dangerous thing. Even a so-called light cold can take a serious turn. Be prompt, be decisive in your treatment of a cold. At the very first sign of a cold, take Grove's bromoquinine tablets. Bromoquinine tablets quickly check the symptoms of a cold, quickly relieve the distress of a cold. They give you speedy results which are very important. Don't monkey around when you can get such a dependable preparation as Grove's bromoquinine tablets. And now, here we are again on our usual visit to Dr. Watson. He's waiting for us in his study, a cheerful blaze crackling on the hearth. Better leave to see you, Mr. Manning. Hasn't the weather been atrocious today? I was beginning to wonder if you'd be able to get here tonight through all this fog. Yes, it certainly is what you Londoners call a regular pea super. Yes, indeed. It reminds me of the adventure of the missing submarine plans. A case that was solved in the underground. Underground? What you Americans call a, a subway. Yes, but what has a solution in a subway got to do with a foggy night? Well, you see, the affair started in weather exactly like this. It was the third week in November, the year 1895 to be exact. On Monday, a dense yellow fog had settled down upon London. On Thursday, it was still there, thickier and and murkier than ever. At first, Holmes had turned his nervous energy to cross-indexing his huge reference books. But when, after pushing our breakfast chairs back for the the fourth morning, we saw the greasy brown swirl still drifting past the windows, Holmes's patience snapped. Holmes, if you 
must face around in circles. I wish you'd change directions now and then. You're, you're making me dizzy. Bah. It's inexcusable, Watson. Inexcusable. No initiative. No imagination. Nothing ever gets done. If you're alluding to the inactivity in this last session of Parliament, my dear Holmes... I'm not speaking of our lawmakers, Watson, but of our lawbreakers. The London criminal is certainly a dull fellow. What makes you say that? Well, look out of the window. Ideal weather for committing a crime. The criminal advances on his intended victim practically unseen. He pounces and disappears into thin air. <laughs> there have been numerous petty thefts, ah, I believe. Petty, petty thefts, pickpockets, ragamuffins. What's the country coming to? Now, if I were a criminal, Watson... Well, I, for one, would move to America. <laughs> oh, hello, hello. Mrs. Hudson's knocking. Excited. What's up, I wonder? Yes, Mrs. Hudson, what is it? Oh, a telegram for me. Uh, yes, sir. Very well, thank you. Oh, well, what's it say? Oh, wait until I open it, can't you? Ah, dear me, what next? Most unusual, Watson, most unusual. What's most unusual, Watson? What's it say? Well, it's from my brother, Mycroft. You remember him. He helped us solve the case of the Greek interpreter. He's coming here. Why not? What's so phenomenal about Why the... not? Why not, indeed? It's as startling as it would be to meet a tram car coming down a country lane. Yes, yes, now I come to think of it. Uh, Mycroft is rather like a tram car. His rails lead from his Pall Mall lodgings to the Diogenes Club in Whitehall. That's his circle. I wonder what upheaval could have derailed him. Doesn't the telegram explain? It says, uh, must see you about Cadogan West coming at once. Cadogan West? Doug and where? Why, that's the young chap who's found dead in the underground on Tuesday morning. I remember reading about it in the papers. Oh? The young man had apparently fallen out of a train and, and killed himself. He hadn't been robbed and there was no reason to suspect violence. Quite an uninteresting case, if I remember correctly. And yet, it's serious enough to cause Mycroft to alter his habits. No, Watson, this must be an extraordinary event. Uh, do you recall any other facts about the affair? Yes, now I come to think of it, there was one unusual bit about who came out of the inquest. They were unable to ascertain at what point he entered the train, because his ticket was missing. Strange. What articles were found on the body? Oh, two pounds fifteen, I believe it was, a checkbook and... Oh, yes, 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 two dress circle tickets for the Woolwich Theatre, dated for that evening. Theatre tickets, eh? Then it wasn't suicide. A man doesn't procure theatre tickets for the evening on which he intends to end his life. Anything else? A small packet of technical papers. Technical papers? What kind of technical papers? The, new, the newspapers didn't say. Ah, as serious as that. What did the young man do? Where was he employed? He was a clerk at Woolwich Arsenal. Ah, government employee. There we have it, Watson. British government. Woolwich Arsenal. Technical papers. That's why Mycroft is involved in this affair. I don't understand. No, I suppose not. Watson, have I ever told you what Mycroft is? Your brother, of course. Oh, no, 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 Watson. Do you have to be so dense? I mean, do you know what he does? Hmm? I seem to have some vague recollection that you once told me that he'd held some small office under the British government. It would be more accurate to say, in a way, that he is the British government. What? His position is unique. He made it for himself. As the tidiest and most orderly brain of any man alive, with a great capacity for storing facts and giving them the proper interpretation... The conclusions of every government department are passed on to him. He's the central exchange, the clearinghouse. Again and again, his word has decided the national policy. He thinks of nothing else. Nothing else can lure him from his contemplations. And yet he's coming here. Yes, Jupiter is descending on us today. What on earth can happen? Uh, Watson, that sounds suspiciously like a bad pun. Ah, here he is, if I'm not mistaken, to speak for himself. Come in, come in. Hello, Mycroft. What's up? What's up? You look flustered. Most annoying business, Sherlock. Most annoying. You know how I dislike altering my habits. Extremely awkward for me to come away from the office, particularly with Siam in its present state. Oh, dear me. Yeah, sit down, Mycroft. Sit down. Uh, you know Watson, of course. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, I'm trying to find a chair that I can trust to hold me. Uh, I'd better take the sofa. You certainly haven't got any thinner. I've never seen the Prime Minister so upset. As for the Admiralty, it's buzzing like an upset beehive. You know anything about the case? Uh, Watson just been telling me what was in the newspapers. Uh, just what were the technical papers found on the body? Sherlock, for the love of heaven, not so loud. Those papers which the wretched youth had in his pocket were none other than the plans of the Bruce Partington submarine. Oh? The submarine which would completely revolutionize naval warfare. The most important papers in our government archives. Under no circumstances could they be removed from the office. 
Even the chief constructor of the Navy was forced to go to Woolwich if he desired to consult them. And yet we find them in the pockets of a dead junior clerk in the heart of London. Yeah, from an official point of view, it's deplorable, my dear Mycroft. Simply deplorable. You may laugh, Sherlock. But this country won't be safe until they're recovered. I thought you said that they were found in the pocket of this chap, Cadogan West. Ten papers taken from Woolwich. Seven were found in the pockets of Cadogan West. Three are still missing. The three essential ones. To recover those three papers is imperative. The peace of Europe depends on... Mm, Nice little problem, eh, Watson? Why did Cadogan West take the papers? How did he die? How did his body reach the place where it was found? And where are the missing papers? Find the answer to those questions, Sherlock, and you will have done your country an invaluable service. Why don't you solve it yourself, Mycroft? I believe you could. Mm, Possibly. But it's a question of digging out details. Give me the details and I can give you the solution from an armchair. No, when it comes to running about and cross-questioning railway guards and lying on one's face with a lens to one's eye... <laughs> no, no, that's not my major. <laughs> Besides, your your figure prevents your taking such an undignified position, eh? <laughs> Very well. Leave that part of it was, eh, Watson? That's <laughs> all. <laughs> Good. I've got a cab waiting outside to take the place where the body was found. I can give you the details on the way. <laughs> Now, Mycroft, who was the official guardian of these famous papers? No less a personage than Sir James Walter, a gentleman who's grown grey in the service. His patriotism is beyond suspicion. A bachelor, if I'm not mistaken, lives with his brother. Yes. He was the house of Admiral Sinclair at Barclay Square during the whole of the evening when this accident occurred. The Admiral vouches for him. He's one of the two who have the only keys to save. And his key was with him all evening? Right. His key, the key to the building, the key to the room. Hmm. Who was the man with the other key? The senior clerk, Mr. Sidney Johnson. Man of 40, married, silent, morose, with an excellent service record. Any alibi? He too had his key with him and seems to have spent the evening playing a game of drafts with a green grocer around the corner from his lodgings. Of course, he has only the word of this green grocer to back him oh, up. Oh, come, come, my dear Mycroft. No class discriminations, please. The word of a green grocer is often just as good as that of an admiral. Now, what about Cadogan West? He had a good reputation. A bit hot headed, but straight and honest. At least everyone thought so. He was next to Sidney Johnson at the office. His duties brought him into daily personal contact with the plans. No one else ever had the handling of them. Oh, that's perfectly clear. He must have taken... Ah, not so fast, Watson, not so fast. Who locked them up that night? Mr. Sidney Johnson. Ah, they were of value, commercially, I mean. Oh, yes, there's no doubt that West could have got several thousands for them very easily. And yet, only a small amount of money was found on the body. Perhaps the buyer took it back. After he'd murdered West. Ah, what puzzles me is, how did West obtain possession of those papers? To do so, he must have had a false key. Several false keys, Sherlock. He had to open the building and the room as well. Oh, well, well, well. Several false keys, then. Let me see, let me see. Suppose West did take the papers and went into town. And on the way back to Woolwich, where he is hoping to replace the papers, he is killed and thrown from the train. But the spot where the body was found is considerably past the station for London Bridge, which is the route to Woolwich. Ah, it's interesting. Also, if young West did make an appointment with some foreign agent to sell the papers that night, why didn't he keep the evening clear? Why buy two theater tickets? Exactly. Furthermore, he actually escorted his fiancée halfway there before he disappeared. A blind. That's what it looks like to me. Why did he take the papers at all? Why not copy them out in the office and sell the copies? He certainly had plenty of opportunity to do so. And why the absence of his underground ticket? Perhaps a ticket would have shown us which station was near the agent's house. So the murderer destroyed it. Good, Watson. Very good. (laughs) And yet, I wonder... Well, here's the underground station. The railway authorities have sent a man round to show the exact place where the body was found. You won't change your mind and come with us? Well, crawling round that black hole on my hands and knees, (laughs) not very likely. Well, I shall expect a report on your efforts this evening. Uh, Never expect too much, Mycroft. Never expect too much. Before we follow Holmes and Watson into the mazes of the London subway system, I have a word of advice. Every year, colds cause a lot of sickness. Every year, they cause a lot of expense and time lost from work. Always regard a cold seriously. Always treat it earnestly. At the first sign of a cold, take Grove's bromoquinine tablets. Bromoquinine tablets are famous relief for the distress of a cold. 
Their efficacy has been fully established. Bromoquinine tablets go right to work on a cold symptom. They don't waste any time. They don't pull any punches. They quickly relieve the misery of a cold. They help reduce the fever of a cold. Thousands of people keep bromoquinine tablets handy all winter. Thousands of people depend on them as their relief for colds. No other preparation enjoys greater confidence than bromoquinine tablets. Follow the example of millions, and at the first sign of a cold, take Grove's bromoquinine tablets. Get them at any drugstore, a few cents a box. Ask specifically for Grove's, G-R-O-V-E-S, Bromo, B-R-O-M-O, quinine, Q-U-I-N-I-N-E, Grove's bromoquinine tablets. This way, sir. Step right along the tracks. But it isn't safe. Supposing a train should come shooting round that curve. Oh, that's all right, sir. There won't be another for five minutes anyway. Here we are, sir. This is where they found the body. Right here alongside the rails. Lying on its face, it was. Mm, spooky old place, eh, Holmes? Like the catacombs, only without the skeletons. No. Yeah. Anything in his hands when they found him? No, sir. Were they clenched? Or spread out as if he were protecting himself? No, sir, they was what you might call relaxed. Ah. What time did all this happen? Well, sir, the train he was hoisted out of, as near as we can figure, passed along here about midnight on Monday. All the carriages have been examined for signs of violence, I suppose. They didn't find nothing, not even the missing ticket. There was a passenger to Allgate on the ordinary train, about 11.40 it was. He said he'd heard a heavy thud, like something striking the line, just before the train reached this station. But it was so foggy, he said he was blessed if he could see what it was. Oh, what's the matter? What are you staring at? The curve, Watson. The what curve of the rails. What of it? What do you mean? I suppose there aren't many curves as abrupt as this. No, sir, I can't say as there is. What have curves got to do with it? Oh, an indication, Watson, merely an indication. Hmm, unique. Perfectly unique. And yet, why not? I don't see any indications of bleeding on the line. No, sir, there wasn't any to speak of. But I understand there was a considerable wound. The bone was crashed right enough. Holmes, you hear that? It's a train. It's, it's coming this way. Run, sir. Run for your life. Yes, yes, but where? Uh, up ahead. There's a place where the train switches off. Run, Watson, run. It's just around the curve. Well, we'll never make it. We, yes, we will. Faster, faster. Uh, there's the switch up ahead. Come on. Here comes the train now. We'll make it. We'll make it. Ah, Justin. Watson, for the love of heaven. You're on the wrong track. <laughs> Well, that was a narrow escape, Holmes. I, I must say my knees are still shaking. Look at the shoulder of my coat where you pull it there. Lucky thing for you that I did. Where are we off to now? And then this fog. Yes, it's a nice afternoon. Suppose we pay a few calls. I think Sir James Walter claims our first attention. After that, we might drop in on Miss Westbury. Miss Westbury? Who's she? She is Cadogan West's fiancée and the last person to see him alive. Holmes, we seem to be going around in circles. We've accomplished absolutely nothing so far except to get to, to get ourselves nearly annihilated in the underground. After all, it's perfectly obvious that the young man had a quarrel with someone, in all probability the agent, to whom he sold the papers, and got himself thrown out of the railway carriage for his pay. I disagree with you, my dear Watson. His body fell from the roof of the carriage where it had been placed. Cadogan West met his death elsewhere. The roof? Of the train? Consider the facts, Watson. A. The curve in the tracks. The body is found at a spot where the train pitches and sways as it comes around the points. B. There was no ticket. C. There were no signs of bleeding on the line because the body had bled elsewhere. Of course. Everything fits together, but... But where was the body placed on the train? I think I can make a fair guess of that, my dear Watson. Ah. Oh, here we are. This is the famous official villa of Sir James Walter. And that, if I'm not mistaken, is his brother, Colonel Ballantyne, just coming out of the house. What's the matter with the man? He, he looks positively haunted. Oh, uh, pardon me, Colonel Ballantyne, but can you tell me if, uh, if Sir James is at home? Sir James, sir? Sir James is dead. Good heavens, dead? He died this morning. It's terrible. Terrible. How did he die? Oh, it's this horrible scandal. My brother, sir, was very sensitive of his honor. He couldn't survive the disgrace to his department. It broke his heart. Pardon me, gentlemen, I must go. It broke his heart. Most appalling development. Eh, Holmes? Mm. I wonder if his death was natural, or if the poor fellow killed himself. 
Tell Miss Westbury that Mr. Sherlock Holmes would like to see her. Oh, please come in, gentlemen. I'm Violet Westbury, Mr. Holmes. I've been expecting you ever since I heard you had taken the case. Please be seated. Well, thank you. Oh, Mr. Holmes, we, we must save his good name. He couldn't have done it. Cadogan was the most chivalrous patriotic gentleman on earth. He, he couldn't have done it. He would have cut his right hand off rather than sell a state secret. But the facts, my dear Miss Westbury. I admit I can't explain them. Uh, was he in need of money? No, Mr. Holmes. His need was simple and his salary very good. He'd saved several hundred pounds. We were to be married at the new year. I see. Had you noticed any signs of mental excitement? Why, I... Well, that is... Uh, come, Miss Westbury, be frank with us. Yes, Mr. Holmes. Well, that night, I, I had a feeling that there was something on his mind. Mm -hmm. Tell us about it, will you? We were on the way to the theater. It was a foggy night, you remember? We were walking slowly. Our way took us close to his office. Cadogan seemed thoughtful and worried. <laughs> Darling, what's the matter? You haven't said a word for the last five minutes. Have I said or done something? Of course not, silly. It's just that I've got something on my mind. Oh, why not tell me about it? Perhaps I can help. It's no use, Vi. It's too serious for me to talk about, even to you. You know, sometimes, Caddy, I feel just the least little bit jealous of that old job of yours when you're cooped up in that building all day. Oh, now you're not going to be jealous of a building. <laughs> well, not really. But it is funny to think of a husband having secrets he can't tell his wife. Mighty important secrets, I can promise you. There's one in particular that any foreign spy would pay good money to get hold of. How thrilling. Well, I don't know. They're awfully slack about some things over there in that building, Violet. What's too slack? It would be too confounded easy for a traitor to get his hands on those plans. What plan? Oh, never mind, darling. I guess I'm getting a bit melodramatic. But there's something been worrying me. Hello, what's that? What's what? Over there, that shadow moving along the side of the building. It's a man. So that's it. I always suspected... Oh, what's the matter? You're so excited. What's wrong? Stay here, Violet. There's something I have to find out. Stay here. <laughs> I waited and waited, but he never returned. Oh, Mr. Holmes, if you could only save his honor, it, it meant so much to him. We shall do our best, Miss Westbury. This, uh, this shadow, this man moving along the building, did you see it too? I think I did, Mr. Holmes. But the night was so foggy, I can't be sure. But there must have been a man. Another man. It, it couldn't have been Cadogan. Surely character goes for something. Let us hope so. Come along, Watson. We must return home. I'm expecting an answer to some telegrams I sent Mycroft early this afternoon. We've done enough for one day. Holmes, where have you been all day? You left this morning before I was up. Now you've come home with your towel awry, your suit torn, and as ravenous as a wolf. <laughs> yes, I've had a bit of exercise, my dear Watson. Uh, pass me the tongue, will you? It would have done you good to go along. Yes, what were you doing? Investigating the premises inhabited by foreign spies known to have been in London on last Monday. Mycroft sent me a list of them. Took a bit of doing, too. Climbing walls, breaking into cellars, prowling around rooftops. Well? I discovered there was only one residence which had the uh, proper facilities for disposing of West's body after the murder. Well, whose residence was that? It belongs to a Hugo Oberstein. The address is 13 Corfield Gardens, Kensington. The gentleman himself has departed for Europe. Gone, has he? If he took the plans with him, it's, it's too late. Not necessarily, Watson. What can we do now? We're going to keep a rendezvous with the gentleman who stole and sold those plans. The assignation will take place at Mr. Oberstein's house this evening at nine. What the deuce are you talking about? Uh, these newspaper clippings. I found them in the drawer of Hugo Oberstein's desk. Read them. Hmm. The Daily Telegraph agony column. The first one says, Two complex for description must have full report. Terms agreed. Two payable when goods delivered. Signed, Piero. Piero, indeed. Sounds like a Mardi Gras. Now, read on, Watson. Read on. Second goes, matter presses must withdraw for unless contract completed. Piero again. And the last, dated Monday, the day the crime is committed. Monday night after nine, two taps, payment in hard cash. I say, 
Do you think it was a submarine that, that the plans that, that he was buying? I'm almost positive. And Puro was Oberstein himself. But we'll find out for certain this evening. I've invited the gentleman who sold the papers to meet us. Well, how? I don't understand. I inserted this advertisement in today's Daily Telegraph. Tonight, same hour, same place, two taps, vitally important. Your own safety at stake. Signed, Piero, as usual. By George, if he answers that, we've, we've got him. Unless we're too late. Come along, Watson. There's no time to lose. You can take this passage, uh, package for a change. I'll, uh, I've been carrying it around all day. What's in it? Oh, just a jemmy, a dark lantern, a chisel and a revolver. Nice equipment for a respectable citizen to be carrying about the streets of London. I must... Yeah, you know, Watson, there are times when I suspect we aren't quite respectable. <laughs> Here we are. This is Caulfield Gardens. Thank heavens, it's so foggy. I shouldn't like to be caught in the act of housebreaking. Yeah. Over this wall, Watson. There's a window we can easily pry open in the back. Scale that wall? Oh, come on, hurry up, hurry up. There's no time to lose. Here, here. I'll give you a boost. <clears throat> come on, up you. Oh, that's it. Look out, here I come. I must say, Holmes, you're as agile as a cat. <laughs> it's uncanny. This is the window. Light the lantern and give me the jimmy. One. Two. The gun runs right past here, almost on the level of these windows. I could have reached out and touched it. Yes, quite convenient, wasn't it? It was here the body was placed on the roof of a train. Look out of this, uh, look on this windowsill. Hmm? You can see the soot is blurred where they rested the body. And here, look here, look, look. This brown stain is blood. Mm, nasty, eh, Holmes? Let's, let's get on to the house. Very well, then. Come along, come along. The window's open. Easy, easy, don't break the glass. Supposing Oberstein should happen to return home. Well, we must take our chances in this business. Come along, Watson, come along. Our visitor will expect to be let in by the front door. I wish these stairs didn't, didn't squeak so. Nine o'clock. We can expect him at any moment now. You take your position on one side of the door. I'll be on the other. So we can pounce on him when he enters. I'll throw my greatcoat over his head. Oh, well, I, I wish he'd hurry. Shh, Watson. What if, what if he doesn't come? There he is. Ready now. I'll open the door. You wanted me? No, you don't. Oh, take that! What oh, the oh. Easy, Watson, easy. All right, Holmes, I've got him. Well, let's take a look at our catch. Take the overcoat away, Watson. All right. Hi. It's Colonel Valentine Walk Walter. Sir James's brother. Quite. Well, sir, what have you to say for yourself? Why did you steal the Bruce Paddington plans? Oh, you... What do you know about this? I am Sherlock Holmes, and I know everything. Oh, this is terrible. I'm lost. I didn't realize their importance until my brother killed himself. But I needed the money. I had to have it. Oberstein offered to give it to me if I'd let him see the plans. So you took an impression of your brother's key, opened the safe, and procured the papers. Cadogan West saw you leaving the building, followed you here, and you killed him. No, I didn't do that. I swear I didn't do it. No? Then perhaps you'd better tell us who did murder Cadogan West. And placed him on the roof of the railway carriage. I'll tell you. I promise you I will. I did the rest. I confess it. But, but not that. Very well, then. How did it happen? I got the papers, as you've discovered. Made my way through the fog until I reached the door. Once or twice, I fancied I was being followed. I could hear footsteps on the pavement behind me. Colonel Walter? Yes. You have the papers? Yes. Let me in, quick. I think someone's been following me. Yes, it's me. Huh? You can't do this, Valentine. It's treason. Oh, All right, do you hear? No, you can't sell the papers. Papa Overstein, he knows how to use some blackjack, eh? You, you, you've killed him. So? It's murder. I'm going to get out of this. Oh, no. I think different. You will come in here if you do not wish to taste a blackjack, too. But I... I... But... That is better. Oh, what can we do? They'll find the body. I have an idea. First, I look at those papers. I take the ones I want under arrest. You put it in the pocket of this foolish young man. And then we give him a nice ride on top of the underground train, no? He will be the guilty one. Who will ever know? What a thoroughly unpleasant gentleman. What a pity that he got away with the papers, Dr. Watson. Oh, but he didn't. Oberstein had left a Paris forwarding address with Colonel Walters. That gentleman sent him a letter dictated by Holmes, saying that he had discovered that one essential detail in the plans was missing, and that he had procured a tracing which would make it complete 
for a price. And did Oberstein swallow the bait? <laughs> did he swallow it? He was arrested as he got off the boat at Folkestone. Some weeks later, I learned incidentally that Holmes had spent a day at Windsor Castle and returned with a remarkably fine emerald type-in. When I asked him where he got it, he answered it was just a small present from a certain gracious little old lady for whom he'd been able to do a, a small f favor. Yes, and I think I can guess the lady's august name. Elementary, my dear Mr. Manning, elementary. I see. Ladies and gentlemen, in just a moment, Dr. Watson will be back to tell us about next week's story. In the meantime, let us repeat. Watch out for colds. At the first sign of a cold, take Grove's bromoquinine tablets. Bromoquinine tablets are made especially for the relief of colds. In other words, they're specialized medication, and that's what you want. Yes, at the very first sneeze or sniffle, go right to your druggist and get a package of Grove's bromoquinine tablets. Now, Dr. Watson, next week? Next week, I think I'll tell you the story of the lion's mane. The lion's mane? What was that, Dr. Watson? Well, the answer to that question, Mr. Manning, almost stumped Sherlock Holmes himself. Suffice it to say that they were the last words gasped out by a dying man as he lay writhing in agony on the sands of the Sussex coast. <laughs> You have been listening to a Sherlock Holmes adventure, adapted from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Bruce Partington Plans, with Basil Rathbone as Sherlock Holmes and Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson. The dramatization was by Edith Miser. This program is presented from Hollywood every week at this same time by the makers of Grove's bromoquinine tablets. Quick relief for colds. This is Knox Manning speaking. <laughs> Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Basil Rathbone, Nigel Bruce. The makers of Bromo Quinine Cold Tablets bring you another adventure of Sherlock Holmes with Basil Rathbone as Sherlock Holmes and Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson. Watch out for colds, ladies and gentlemen. They're very prevalent now, and a little cold may be the start of a serious illness. What you want to do at the first sign of a cold is take famous bromoquinine tablets. Bromoquinine tablets are made for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is the relief of colds. They act fast, give you CD results, and that's what you want when you have a cold. Bromoquinine tablets are known the world over for their efficacy. Trust your reputation when buying a medicine. Do this when you feel a cold coming on, and you'll ask for bromoquinine cold tablets. And now, as we make our way through the night to Dr. Watson's hospitable door, we notice a feeling of spring in the air. The buds are swollen on the trees, still black and dripping from the rain. There's the smell of warm, damp earth. Delicious. Hey, Mr. Manning? Well, hello, Dr. Watson. I didn't see you in the dark. Yes, I've been out checking up to see if my magnolias survived the winter. Any casualties? No, they all seem to be fairly bursting with buds. <laughs> There's nothing as delicious as that first faint whiff of spring. Or oh, oh, as treacherous. Come along to the house before we both catch our, our death of cold. After you, sir. Not a trauma boy, and I'm about age before beauty nonsense. I'm not as decrepit as all that. Oh, what's this? The front hall littered with trunks and suitcases? Oh, yes. I'm afraid my annual wanderlust has broken out rather early this spring. I'm off on a little jaunt first thing tomorrow morning, but... Uh, but come along into the study. Does that mean that this is the last of our storytelling evening? Uh, for this winter, yes, I'm, I'm afraid it does. Well, I, I trust I'm not too forward if I hope to be invited back in, in the fall. Oh, of course not. You know we'll be waiting for your return. Oh, thanks very much. It's very, very decent of you. To put up with the meanderings of, of an old fellow like myself. Huh? Oh, I appreciate it, you know. But sit down, Mr. Manning, down there over there in the usual chair. <laughs> Let's get on with our story before I get all glittery and <laughs> sentimental. You're going to tell us about Professor Moriarty tonight, aren't you? Well, I had intended to, but I've changed my mind. I'm going to tell you the adventure of a retired colorman instead. Retired colorman? Isn't that a military term? No, it isn't. Mr. Josiah P. Amberley has been the junior member of Brickfall and Amberley, manufacturers of artistic paint boxes. He made quite a tidy little fortune. Retired from business at the age of 61, bought a house at Lewisham and settled down. The next year, 1897, I think it was, he 
still full married. Married? She was married. The woman thirty years his junior. Yes, that's always a bit risky. Risky? <laughs> <laughs> Within two years, he was as miserable a creature as crawls beneath the sun. So, oh, dear me, I'm uh, jumping ahead of the story again. As I was saying, it was the 3rd of April, 1899, and a rainy and disagreeable April it had been. Holmes was in a melancholy and philosophic mood that morning as he stood by the window, watching the raindrops chasing one another down, down the pane. Rain had always depressed him, and he was up working on a case. When he was looking on a case, I don't believe he realized that there was such a thing as weather. Look at that beastly rain. Hasn't stopped for three days. Might as well be another flood. Though heaven only knows what transgressions could have brought it on. That's been a really first-class crime for months. Oh, cheer up, Holmes, cheer up. It's probably good for the crops or something. The shortage in crime? No, 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 the rain, of course. Probably makes the little buds sprout and the little shoots shoot. Oh, don't be so blasted little... optimistic. Oh. More likely rotting all the seeds that's already been planted. Rain, where the deuce does it all come from? This confounded English climate. Why any man with half a brain stays on this rain-soaked, mist-bound island is beyond me. Oh, I don't have the men have anything to do with it. It's the ladies, God bless them. This climate gives them perfect complexions. And with so many lovely creatures about, what Englishman would think of quitting the country? So much beauty, such exquisite... Oh, rubbish, Watson, rubbish. rubbish. The spring has given you a temporary softening of the brain. I regret to say it seems to have that effect on most impressionable males. Impressionable nonsense. When a woman's concerned in one of your cases, you've never even noticed whether she's 16 or 60. And then you don't care whether she's got a well-turned ankle or, or whether she's flat-footed. Well, why should I? Holmes, there are times when I think you're... Uh, cold-blooded fish. <laughs> possibly, Watson, possibly. Why do you suppose the fool doesn't show up? What fool? Josiah P. Amberley. Oh, is he one of your clients? Oh, I suppose I may call him so. He's been sent to me by Scotland Yard. Oh, by, by Scotland Yard. Right, by Lestrade, to be exact. You must consider the case fairly hopeless if Lestrade hands the matter over to me of his own accord. Look, look home, there's a, there's a cab drawing up in, in front of our front door. He must, he must be your client, Mr. Yeah. Amberley. Yeah, Strange-looking individual, eh, Watson? He's quite an old fellow. Looks literally bowed down with care. Ah, but no weakling. Look at those shoulders and that chest. The framework of a giant. He's arguing with the cab driver about the fare. Huh. <laughs> Watches the pennies, eh? I must say, I don't like his face. So fierce and eager, and the way those snaky locks of grizzled hair stick out from under his hat. I wonder what he's worrying. What worrying, Mr. Amberley? Worrying to bet it has nothing to do with money, I imagine nothing else could upset him to any great extent. Nonsense, Holmes. You always look on the base side of, of human nature. Here he is now. Come in, come in. Uh, uh, which of you is Sherlock Holmes? I am. Uh, this is my friend, Dr. Watt. Uh, oh, you... I'm a broken man. He's robbed me, this one. Taken everything I had in the world. I thought he was my friend and he took everything. Right from under my nose, in my own house. Robbed me, he did. Yes, I felt sure it was a question of money. Money? Who said Money? And stole my wife, the light of my life, the apple of my eye. It's true, she was very expensive, but after all, she was my wife, and he stole her. And now, Mr. Amberley, my beautiful, beautiful blonde wife, oh. hair like gold, and my securities. The money I saved up with years of hard work. Gone. All gone. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, first, tell us about your wife. Now, how long have you been married? Two years. Two years, and she's tired of me already. Two little years. Easy, my good man. Easy. More facts and fewer recriminations if we're to get to the bottom of this case. Well, three years ago, I retired. Bought a house. Big house at Lewisham. Cost me plenty of money, that house did. Well, sir, I'd never lived alone in a big house before. Got sort of lonely. House began to need looking after, so I thought I'd start looking around for a wife. Nice, healthy, young wife to look after me. Then I met Ella. And some girl she was, too. A good cook. Hair like gold. Could bake a beef and kidney pie that would melt in your mouth. So I thought I might as well get married. Yeah, very practical, I'm sure. Yes, that's what I think it is at time. But Lord, Mr. Holmes, the money a woman runs into. They made my heart bleed the way the money went. Mm, I should have thought you'd have been glad when the other fellow took it off your hands. But who was this? Uh... This wolf in sheep's clothing? Yes. Uh, his name was Dr. Ray Ernest, a young fella. He used to come over at night and play chess with me. I see. He stole your wife. Yes, and my securities. Yes, but surely the securities are registered. You can hardly hope to convert them. Maybe not. But I must have them back. And you've got to find those securities for me, Mr. Holmes. You've got to find them. And your wife, of course? Well, of course, of course, wherever she is, they are. Ah, quite. 
On the other hand, Mr. Amberley, I confess I don't see that I can be of much service. It's a routine matter, and I'm oh. sure that Scotland Yard would be only too glad... Very heavens, Master! Not a single security! Oh, very well, very well, very well, very well. And we'll do our best. Uh, Dr. Watson will take a run down to your house at Lewisham to look over the ground. Oh, really? Oh, yes. Oh, oh. I hardly expect you to come yourself. After my heavy financial loss, nobody cares if an old man's heart is broken. Now stop that, brain. I'm not coming myself because I'm preoccupied with the case of the two Coptic patriarchs. This particular case doesn't seem to be very complicated. I'm sure, Mr. Amberley, that Dr. Watson can handle it as well as I could myself. <laughs> well, if that's the best that you can offer, I suppose I must be satisfied. Huh? Uh, Pampered, that's what she was. And that young man that uh, he picked pocket, I hated him like my own son. He had the run of the house. And now look how they've treated me. Me, you never harmed him. Quite, soul. quite. And now, um, good day, Mr. Amberley. Eh? Eh? Oh, 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 yes, well, well, good day, Mr. Holmes. And I shall expect Dr. Watson this afternoon. You have my address, I believe. Oh, the ingratitude, the rank ingratitude of it all. I must say, Holmes, uh, I like the way you shoved all this off onto my shoulders. Coptic patriarchs, indeed. You just don't want to go. <laughs> right, Watson, right, the very first time. You've been begging for a case all to yourself for months. Well, here it is. Yes, and a nice case you've given me, I must say. That old skin. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my daughter, oh, my ducats, eh? The emphasis on the ducats, I'm not mistaken. Oh, confound that passage. There. Ah, that's better. That's dash good. <laughs> Hello. Steps on the stairs. Watson, if I'm not mistaken, and in a triumphant mood. Hello, Holmes. Well, <laughs> I'm back. Hail the conquering hero. <laughs> it's last afternoon, I take it, with the light of victory in your eye. Well, I I did manage to dig up a clue or so. Good. Now about Mr. Amberley's place of residence. Uh, what's it like? Well, he, he calls it the Haven. Oh, charming. Yes, isn't it? I, I think the place would interest you, Holmes. You know that particular quarter, the monotonous brick streets, the weary suburban highways. Well... Right in the middle of them lies this beautiful old home, surrounded by a high sun-baked wall, mottled with lichens and topped with moss, the sort of wall... You may omit the pearly, Watson. I note that it was a high brick wall. Mm-hmm. 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 I should have guessed it was the haven, even if I hadn't lost a lounger who was smoking outside in the street. A lounger? Yes, a tall, dark, little moustached man with a, with a curious look in his eyes. With great tinted glasses and a masonic type in. Good, have you? How do you know? Oh, a fool. A child of ten could have seen through that. Oh, Mr. Holmes, I don't see. Never mind. Continue with your story, Watson. Well, I'd hardly entered the gateway before I saw Mr. Amberley coming down the drive to meet me. He began at once, pouring out his grievances. We walked back to the house together. And, uh... Well, once inside the wall, I must say, I've never seen a place worse kept. Garden, under weeds, and in a dreadful neglect. The house, too, was flattened to, to the last degree. It just goes to show what happens to a place... And there's no woman in their hand about to, <laughs> to keep it in order. Yes, but uh, Mrs. Amberley's only been missing a few days. Hardly time for so much disintegration to take place. Must have set in before she left. Oh, possibly. At any rate, Mr. Amberley seemed to be ashamed of it. He's doing his best to remedy it. Though I must admit that his efforts looked a trifle ineffectual. <laughs> Become of me. What's to become of me? My wife gone, most of my fortune stolen. Now, oh, come in, Dr. Watson, come in. Here yeah, you see what remains of what used to be called my home. An Eastman's home is in castle, so they say. But home is where the heart is. My heart. Oh, look out, Dr. Watson, look out. That wood waste just seems to Oh, look, look at that. Look at that. My, my best pair of trousers. Mm, too bad. Hey, careful, careful. You almost kept in that pot of paint. Oh, that's it all, am. Mrs. Uh, Anderson, the limit. Sorry, I shouldn't have left that pot of paint in the middle of the passage, I suppose. That when one's alone in the house, one forgets. Well, alone? So you've been doing this painting yourself? I must try to this strange occupation under the circumstances. One must do something to ease an aching heart. Then step in here, Dr. Watson. This is my study, my sanctum sanctorum. Oh, so sanctum sanctorum. <laughs> I see you've just finished painting woodwork in, in, in this room, too. Hmm. What's the smell of paint? Yes, it's not dry yet. That's why I have a fire in here. Now, let me see. Where did you keep your security? In the safe in that wall. This room is really a strong room, I think. With an iron shutter on the window and an iron door. Failure proof. Ah, that's the irony of it. 
No thief from without could have taken my money, but my wife, my own wife. There's a picture, Dr. Watson, on the mantel, taken in a wedding dress. Mm-hmm. I'm looking well, Emily. Doesn't look the sort. Uh, I'm a piper, the ingrate. Mm-hmm. Why, the very night, that very night, I bought two upper circle seats at the Haymarket Theatre. What did you give her a treat, I did? Oh, didn't, didn't she go? No. Last moment, she said she felt sick. Said she had a headache, she did. I believed her, went alone. When I came back, she was gone. My safe was right next. Uh, Jimmy, uh, what night was that, Mr. Amler? Last Thursday. Oh, Thursday, was it? Yes, and I used it. Money wasted. She was always wasting money. May I have that ticket, Mr. Amler? Hold on, hold on. You thrown it in the fire. Oh, no, why? I want to get rid of it. I want to get rid of everything to remind me of her. Yeah, give me that picture. Well, I, I see. Red in the fire she goes, Cosa. May her soul burn in torment. That picture's burning now. <laughs> Unpleasant fellow, eh, Watson? This case begins to look more somber than I suspected. If you could only have brought me that ticket, Watson. Oh, I did my best, Holmes. I may not have the ticket itself, but I did notice the number of the seat. Oh, bravo, Watson. How did you happen to remember it? Well, as a matter of fact, it, it was my place in form at school, 31. See from the bottom. And, and so it, 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 it stuck in my head. Splendid, old fellow. Then uh, Amberley's seat must have been 30 or 32. Hear me, hear me now. Uh, who can that be? Well, whoever it is, he's fast impatient. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Here he comes up the stairs, fairly running. Come in. Well, bless my soul if it isn't our old friend, our good friend, Mr. Amberley. What's up? I tell you, guy, Mr. Holmes, I can't make anything of it. Here, here see for yourself. Uh-huh. Come at once without fail. Yes. I can give you information as to your recent last signed Elman at the Vicarage. Ah. Dispatched at 210 from Little Purlington. Little Purlington in Essex, I believe, not far from Trenton. You will start at once, of course. Uh, Watson, look up the train. Uh, it's probably a hoax. What could anyone in Little Purlington But it's from a very responsible person. Uh, where's my crockford? Uh, yes, here it is. Uh, we'll look up this minister of the gospel. E, 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 Elman, Elman, here it is. Yeah, J. C. Elman M. A. Living of Mossmore, Little Purlington. Yes, but I still don't. Think Surely, Mister uh, Amberley, you want to find your wife and your lost security. Of course, of course, but it's a waste of time and money. Here we are. Here we are. Here we are. Here's a train from Liverpool Street, five twenty. Yes, just have time, Mister Amberley. You go downstairs and hail a cab. I'll help Doctor Watson throw a few things in the bag. You think I need Doctor Watson? Perhaps I'd better go alone. Oh no, 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 no! It may be a trap for all we know. Uh, don't think I shall go, Mister Amberley. It would make the worst possible impression on both police and on myself if you refused to follow up so obvious a cue. We should feel that you were not in earnest about this investigation. Uh, very well, very well, I'll go. Perhaps you'd, be- you'd better go with him, Holmes. What? Take your case, Watson. After the brilliant way in which you've handled it? No, 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 no. Go along, Mr. Ambley, or you'll miss your train. Uh, very well, but the expense <laughs> Here you are, Watson. Here, here, here's your bag. <laughs> it's packed. Yes, you never know when you may be called off on a case like this. I packed it for you. Holmes, I do think uh, that... Quite. I... Now, whatever you do, see that he really does go to Little Purlington. Yes, I don't think that he's uh, Again, got quite. It. Should he break away and uh, try to return, get to the nearest telegraph station and send me the single word bolted. I will arrange to have it reach me wherever I am. What? You have something to look into at this end, then? I have, Watson. This case is beginning to take on a rather curious and sinister aspect. Above all, old man, take good care of yourself. And Mr. Amberley. <laughs> find the outcome of Watson's curious mission, ladies and gentlemen, I have a few words to say. Here's what you want to do when you feel a cold coming on. Here's what you want to do with the very first sign of a cold. Take famous bromoquinine cold tablets. Bromoquinine tablets don't fool. No, sir, they get right after a cold symptom. They get right after a cold's misery. They relieve the headache and other pains that go with a cold. They relieve that stuffiness and feeling of depression that accompanies a cold. They help reduce the fever that goes with a cold. Bromoquinine tablets are fast and decisive in their action. First, because they're made especially for the relief of the common cold. And secondly, because they act internally. You can take lots of things for the relief of a cold, but nothing more reputable and reliable than famous bromoquinine tablets. Get them at any drugstore at the first symptom of a cold. Ask for Bromo, B-R-O-M-O, quinine, Q-U-I-N-I-N-E. Romo Quinine Cold Tablet. Oh, 
Ah, oh, confound this rain. Everything's as dark as a black hole of Calcutta. Yeah, the haven. Shitty little haven this is. Uh, I can find a window unlatch. Not much chance on the first floor. The old boy's too cautious. Ooh. Second story window, perhaps. Now they can manage to scale this porch pillar. Ah, this confounded rain. Just simply as a grease pole. Come on. Hey, there we are. Yeah. Ah. Here's the window that's unlatched. Easy, easy, easy. Ah, now. One foot over the sill. Now Up with go. your end. Up with them, I tell you. Thought I wouldn't see you prowling around down below, eh? Well, I've caught you red-handed. <laughs> Uh, nice wild goose chase that turned out to be. That friend of Sherlock Holmes is a fool. I'm sure, Mr. Hamlet, if you'll call and see him, he can explain. Explain, explain nothing. That vicar had never seen that telegram before. The way he treated us. You might have thought we were suspicious characters. Then missing the last train and having to sit up all night at a confounded station with the rain dripping through the roof. Well, we could have gone to an hotel. Gone to an hotel, then cost money. Gone to an hotel, indeed. Well, here's your house, Mr. Hamlet. I think I'll go along home now and get some breakfast. You will not. You're going to come into the house and see if everything's all... I, I look up there. The window over the porch. It's open. Perhaps you left it like that yourself. Rubbish. I tell you, I don't like the looks of this. Uh, where's my key? Where's my key? Here it is. Uh, we'll soon find out. I say, it is gloomy, isn't it? Uh, look, look, look. So, someone's been here rising up. Footprints on the fresh paint. I'll find him if I have to tear the place apart. Meet we'll the Mr. Ambly. We're here waiting for you in the study. Holmes. Good heavens, oh, what a start you get. How did you get in here? I've been through the, um, the one upstairs window. That's burglary, young man. Yes. Burglary has always been an alternative profession that I cared to adopt it. I'll admit I was glad I hadn't when I walked into Inspector Lestrade's gun last night. He thought I was a burglar, too. But come, we're, we're keeping him waiting. He's in the library. Here they are, Lestrade. I told you we could expect them back before 10. No, but look here. That's not Lestrade. That's the man I saw loitering in front of the gate yesterday afternoon. The fellow with the black moustache and glasses. Oh, yes, that's right, Dr. Watson. Yes. The strand fondly imagines that's a disguise. Oh, no, look here, no. Well, it's yeah. as obvious to anyone who tricks... Uh, take now, the here, I've had enough of this. I won't have two busybodies prowling around my house in the middle of the night. And what's for Mr. Sherlock Holmes? I suspect you sent that telegram yourself. Very clever of you, Mr. Amberley, very clever. You look trifle pale. I thought a night in the country might oh, be... Oh, no, good. enough of that. What kind of a fool do you take me for? I have you put behind the bars, all of you. Oh, surely not Inspector Lestrade. Why, he's from Scotland Yard. I don't care if it's from the House of Lords. Yeah, no, no, that's all. all disgrace. Somebody did disgrace. Breaking into my house in the middle of the night. Oh, I'll get you for that. What were you doing in here last night? Answer me that. Looking for the bodies. What? <laughs> Looking for the bodies. The bodies of your wife and Dr. Ernest. What have you done with them? I you. I dare you. You murdered them in this room. We have ample proof. Why, you... Stop you him, Watson. Stop him. He's got a capsule in his hand. It's poison. He's swallow it. Oh, no, 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 no. Come on, get that out. Put it out. Put it out. Put it out. Put it out. Oh, short track, Mr. Ambly, if you please. Uh, Everything decently and in its proper place. Uh, Take him away, Lestrade. Right. Uh, come along now. No more monkey business. Come on, put it out of All right, come oh, What a scene. That old brute Ambly is a murderer. How did you find it out? Well, the first clue was the theater ticket which he didn't use. We found that out. Oh, that destroyed his alibi. Yes, the theater people assured us that there had been two empty seats, not just one. The second clue was the smell of fresh paint. What was he trying to hide by that? Uh, what? Gas. He asphyxiated his wife and Dr. Ernst in this room. Good heavens. His strong room, which was as near airtight as anything could humanly possibly yeah, be. but how? Well, that's what I wanted to find out. That's what I was looking for. I broke into the house last night. And what did you find? Look here. Notice the gas pipe along the skirting here? It rises in the wall, in the angle there, and ends in that plaster rose in the center of the ceiling where it's concealed by that ornamentation. It ends wide open. How, oh, how horrible. Yes, then look here. Look, near the floor. What do you make out? Two words written on the wall. Two, we were. We, uh, then a scroll. We were. What, what does that mean? The poor devil was trying to write, we were murdered. I can see the whole ghastly scene. It was last Thursday night. Amberley had lured his wife and Dr. Ernest into this room. Oh, listen to that 
that wind. I wish it would stop. It's not so bad in this room. I have a little game in here, eh, Dr. Ernest? Uh, just you sit here, I will. Entertain the doctor while I go and look for the chessmen. Excuse me a minute, Dr. Ernest. Oh, certainly. And if you don't mind, i close the door. It's such a draft. It'll be much cozier in here with the door closed. Much cozier. You said wind only wouldn't hold. I feel so depressed. Is there something terrible were going to happen? Oh, nonsense, my dear Mrs. Amberley. This house is getting on your nerves. It is any wonder. He gets worse and worse. Oh, Dr. Ernest, I'm so frightened. You must go away. What? Now, don't be alarmed, Mrs. Amberley. I've had your husband under observation for some time. I'm afraid he isn't quite normal. It, uh, it isn't safe for you to stay here any longer. But, Doctor, uh, don't you understand? I can't leave my husband. Heaven knows what would happen if I left him alone. We could get a nurse to take care of him. You can't stay here with him. <laughs> what was that? Josiah, he heard us. He was outside the door listening. Oh, Doctor Ernest, this is terrible. What can we do? Listen. You hear that? It's the gas. Someone turned on the gas. I can smell it. Hurry, hurry. We've got to get out of here. Oh, the door's locked. He's locked the door. Amberley. Oh, there, Amberley, open the door. Quick. Here we go. No, that's locked, too. The, the iron shutter. Amberley. Amberley, let us out. <laughs> you realize what this means? He's going to kill us. He must have gone mad, I'm afraid. Yes, yes, it's what I was afraid of. He's a maniac. I'm a side of maniac. Oh, this is horrible. We're, we're trapped. What a fool I was. What can we do? I... I feel so faint. I, I can hardly breathe. Here, here. Lie down on the floor. The, the air is better down here. Oh, it's, it's no use. I can't stay... stay awake. I, I don't mind anymore. I'm quite all right. Really. Mrs. Amberley. Mrs. Amberley. Don't give up. You think, too. I must warn people. It's dangerous. I... I, I can't think. Oh, God, I... I can't breathe. I can't think. <laughs> <laughs> A tragic story, Dr. Watson. Was Mr. Amberley insane? They decided he was. He ended his days in an asylum. Did they ever find the body? Yes, at the bottom of an old well, the opening of which had been cleverly concealed by a dog cat. I see. And now I'm afraid it's, it's time to say goodbye. Well, not goodbye, Dr. Watson. I'll reply. Uh, just as you say, Mr. Manning. Anyway, in conclusion, I want to thank you and our radio audiences who so patiently listened to the reminiscences of us. Of a sentimental old fellow. And I want to wish you all, old and young, an extremely happy summer. Thank you, Dr. Watson. Ladies and gentlemen, in just a moment, Basil Rathbone would like to say a few words to you. But first, may I give you a word of advice? Remember the danger of the so-called common cold. Remember the sickness it can cause and the bills it can cost. Act promptly, decisively, at the first sign of a cold. Take famous bromoquinine tablets. Bromoquinine tablets have a reputation. Their fame extends to all quarters of the globe. Their merit is an assured fact. Reliability is the one thing you want in any medicine, especially medicine for the relief of cold. Don't wait. Don't procrastinate when you feel a cold coming on. Go right to your druggist and get a box of bromoquinine tablets. The small cost may save you a lot in grief and expense. Ask clearly for bromoquinine cold tablets. And now, here's Battle Rathbone. Ladies and gentlemen, to me, Sherlock Holmes has always been one of the greatest characters ever created. Tonight, as our present series ends, I'd like to thank our sponsor, the makers of bromoquinine, for giving me the opportunity of playing Holmes on the air, <laughs> especially with such an inspired Dr. Watson as Andrew Bruce. Oh, that's all right. Quiet, Andrew, please. Oh, sorry, what? Speaking to myself and Mr. Bruce... May I express our gratitude to our radio audience for the many letters of interest and encouragement that we've received. And finally, a word of appreciation to all the performers and others concerned with this program who have helped so immeasurably in making the Baker Street days live again. And now, until fall, it's time for me too to say au revoir and good luck. <laughs> You 
I've been listening to a Sherlock Holmes adventure adapted by Edith Miser from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Retired Colorman, with Basil Rathbone as Sherlock Holmes and Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson. The Sherlock Holmes series was produced by Tom McKnight. This program was presented from Hollywood by the makers of Bromo Quinine Cold Tablets. Quick relief for cold. This is Knox Manning speaking. <laughs> Basil Rathbun and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. This rebroadcast is especially for the American Armed Forces and their allies. Now let's join Dr. Campbell as he enters Dr. Watson's study. <laughs> Well, here we are once again in Dr. Watson's study. Come in, Mr. Kimball. Come in. Here, sit down and relax. You, uh, you look a bit wilted, old fella. Oh, yes, it's such a beautiful spring evening. I, I thought I'd walk over. In fact, it's so beautiful I dawdled most of the way. Drinking in the warm air and the smell of things growing until suddenly I realized I was blame well going to be late if I didn't hurry. I ran the last three blocks. Yes, I know how it is. This lovely spring weather is certainly conducive to indolence. My household claim that when I go out to do the spring planting, I spend most of my time leaning on the spade, sniffing, and listening to the birds. Not an unpleasant way to pass the time of day, incidentally. Yes, a day like today is almost as relaxing as a Turkish bath. Which reminds me of a curious and gory experience that Holmes and I had in just such an establishment some years ago. It sounds suspiciously like the gentleman who said, bang. Oh, uh, speaking of explosions. Now, Mr. Campbell, uh, you must never complain about the way that a storyteller begins his yarn. Anything is better than an abrupt beginning. Now, uh, put me all out. Where, where, where was I? Uh, in a Turkish bath, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, yes, it's a Turkish bath. You were not mistaken. Yes, yes, yes. Well, now, to, to begin at the beginning, it was in the hectic, hair-raising, and I might even say the glorious day of the great battle of wits between Sherlock Holmes and the notorious Professor Mariachi. What you might call a real battle of the titans, eh, Doctor? Indeed it was, Mr. Campbell. Things had been unusually hectic for Holmes for several months. Mariachi had been particularly active, and Holmes had had many sleepless nights. Finally, things had calmed down a bit, and I tried to persuade him to take a badly needed holiday. The result being that he finally did agree to have an afternoon off and accompany me to a Turkish bath. As a matter of fact, both uh, Holmes and I had a witness for the Turkish bath. Over the smoke in the pleasant latitude of the drying room, I've often found him less reticent and more human than at any other time. The heat melted his cast iron reserve, eh, Dr. Oh, Watson? No, only slightly, Mr. Gibble, only slightly. Well, as I was saying, on the upper floor of a certain Thumberland Avenue establishment, there is an isolated corner where two couches lie side by side, and it was on these that we were lying. Holmes had just shot his long, sinewy arm out of the towels which enveloped him and was fishing about in the inside pocket of his coat, which hung beside him. Where did I put it? Where on earth did I put it, oh, confound the thing? Watson, mm-hmm. I forgot to bring my tobacco. Oh, relax, Holmes, just relax. <laughs> Forget about tobacco. Forget Mariachi and relax. That's what we came in here for. Burble, 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 burble. I am relaxed, my dear fellow. I want to smoke. You mind about the burble, burble? Nothing like the peace and seclusion of a, of a Turkish bar. Victor Holmes. Victor Sherlock Holmes. Hello? Gassy, the steam room attendant seems to be paging you. Oh, my goodness. Now what? I do want to see Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Why, my oh, God, oh, 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 my God. Oh, 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 Here I am, Gus. Here oh, I am. What do you want? Oh, Come on. Oh, yeah. Mr. Holmes, it's good I find you. There has been an accident, Mr. Holmes. A bad accident. It's Lord Canterbury. He's in his dressing room, covered with blood. Oh, in that case, I fancy you want uh, Dr. Watson, don't you? Not me. I'll be with you in a minute, Gus. Oh, no, not Dr. Watson. It, it's too late for you. He's dead. Dead? 
Stab in six places. Come and look at him, Mr. Holmes, please. Good. Me. All right. I'll come at once. Uh, good gracious me. Uh, what's all the commotion? Why can't we have a little peace and pot? Uh, right. 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 Um, what's the meaning of this, Gus? Uh, why are these two persons talking uh, at the top of their voice? My dear Mr. Mr. Uh, well, whoever you are, I was never under the impression that the Olympia Baths were church. Furthermore, my dear Mr. Uh, oh, well, never mind the name. Tunbridge. Frederick Hubert Tunbridge, a liberal leader in the present parliament, of which everyone knows who keeps the breast of the time. Dear Mr. Tunbridge, I do not concern myself with trivialities. Furthermore, as I was saying, before being so rudely interrupted, you may be interested to know that your hated rival, Lord Tilbury, the conservative leader, with whom you are known to have publicly locked horns on several occasions... Oh, oh, oh what have I had? Oh, what's he done now, the old fool? If you mean Lord Cantlebury, he's done absolutely... Yes, he hasn't done anything, and probably never will again. Oh, what are you blithering about? Well, it seems that Gus has just discovered your, uh, shall we say, political vis-a-vis dead in his dressing room. Oh, you mean he's had a heart attack? No, I don't mean anything of the kind. He's been stabbed. In how many places did you say, Gus? In six places, Mr. Holt. Oh, but that's impossible. I, uh, we, uh, that is, I uh, talked to him about half an hour ago. We had a little uh, conference, Tuberose, you understand? So while he was waiting for Gus to come in and give him his batter. Oh, he was quite all right. I left him. Oh, really? Are you sure? What do you mean? Of course I'm sure. Canterbury was alive and cursing like a trooper when I left him. I passed uh, Gus in the corridor where I came out of Canterbury's dressing room. Uh, he'll kill the old boy. was alive and kick it. Oh, will he? How about it, Gus? Uh, it is true, I hear swearing, but from which dressing room it comes, I could not be sure. The walls are so thin, you understand. Yes, yes, indeed. It's quite true. The dressing room walls are thin. And uh, Gus, uh, who is this person, and why is he asking all these uh, stupid questions? Uh, but, uh, Mr. Turnbridge, this gentleman is Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the famous detective. Hmm, I've never heard of him. <laughs> Got even me there, Holmes. <laughs> well, well, send for Scotland Yard. This is a matter of national importance. Right, yes, I think you're quite right. Uh, you may as well send for Inspector Lestrade, Gus. Scotland Yard will have to be informed in any case. In the meantime, however, well, I... I think I'll take a look. Well, in the meantime, Mr. Whoever you are, I insist that everything be left strictly alone. Very well, then, Mr. Uh, uh, thingamabob, if you insist. But uh, you'll be losing valuable time. I most emphatically do insist. Well, I'm getting out of here. Beat you out. Like some of the uh, uh, If you can do without me, I think I'll just... Oh, just a moment, gentlemen. Just a moment, if you please. I think it's only fair to point out to you all... But suspicion is bound to fall on anyone who leaves before the authorities have had a chance to search and question him. Watch me. Oh. You mean I have to be searched? All right. We seem to have stirred up quite a hornet's nest, eh, Watson? Yes, and I brought you in here for a rest. <laughs> Lestrade? Nasty mess, eh, Mr. Holmes? Right from the back. Yes, not once, but six times. Deep, ferocious thrusts. Quite unnecessarily brutal. And, uh, if I may say so, bloody. Yeah. Place looks like a charnel house. Yes, whoever did the deed must have been drenched in blood. Mm. Might tell your men to search for bloodstained towels or garments, will you, Lestrade? Yes. Well, I don't pick up anything that's got blood on it. Never you fear, Mr. Holmes. I've ordered a search of everybody and everything on the premises. Yes, that's, uh, <laughs> that's not going to be, be very popular with, uh, with Mr. Tunbridge, eh, Holmes? Oh, I wouldn't care if he was the Archbishop of Canterbury. When Scotland Yard says search everybody, we search everybody. Besides, everybody knows he and the corpse here are bitter enemies. They fought like cat and dog. Uh, um... How long uh, would you say he'd been dead, Mr. Elm? Oh, I don't know. About, uh, let me say, uh, an hour and a half. Took 30, 40 minutes to get you here, Lestrade. Mm. And Cantlebury had been dead, let me see, over half an hour when Gus found him. Yes, uh, Gus. Did the um, doorman notice who left the establishment during the half hour before the body found? Uh, yes, sir. Only old Mr. Velford. And he's too feeble and excited to do a crime like this. No. Mm-hmm. Was the um, door to Lord Canterbury's dressing room locked? Uh, no, sir. No? Huh? And how does it happen that he lay here for over half an hour before anyone found him? Particularly as he was down on the books for a massage half an hour before he was found. Uh, well, you see, I... I, I thought he was asleep, uh, Lord Canterbury. Uh, sometimes he liked a little nap after he was in the steam room, and he didn't want I should disturb him. Oh, that's very interesting. 
Then you did come in this room once before you realized Lord Campbell was dead. Uh, yes, Mr. Holmes. But he was lying there so peaceful. So peaceful. Yes, on his back. Yes, sir. Just like we found him. Uh, it wasn't until the second time I come in, I see he has his eyes open. Mm -hmm. And the place is, um, shall we say, all spattered with blood? It, it was so dark. The, the shades were drawn. It was not easy to see anything if you don't look close. Even then, some people are unable to observe the most obvious facts. Uh -uh. Um, and what might you mean by that? Oh, just an observation, Miss Strand, just a gratuitous observation. Uh, come in. Well, Willis, what's up? We searched the place from top to bottom, uh, just like you said, Inspector. And there's no blood stains nowhere, except on this. And uh, what's that? A pocket knife, sir, large size. Oh. The handle's been wiped off, but there's still some blood stains on the blind. Uh, we found it in the locker of a bloke, uh, and I'm a thumbprint. Uh -huh. Just a minute, Miss Strand, don't go off the deep end. Will it? Yes, sir. You say there were no bloodstains anywhere except on this knife. Not a sign of a bloodstain nowhere. You searched the dirty linen hampers, the towels and lockers, the rest of their clothes? Oh, yes, sir. We searched everything. There's not a sign of blood anywhere but on that there weapon. Amazing. That's uh, enough for me. This here is the murder weapon, and it was found in Tumbridge's locker. Bring him in here, Willis, and we'll have him on the carpet. Yes, right away. I knew he was a murderer from the beginning. Who has the motive for killing Canterbury? This chap Tumbridge. Who has the opportunity? This chap Tumbridge. He admits himself he had a talk with the deceased and, and they had words. Where is this here bloodstained knife found? Nowhere but in the uh, this Mr. Tumbridge's locker. Hmm, stupid place for a murderer to hide the fatal weapon in his own locker. Tumbridge isn't as stupid as that, was Oh, uh, no? And why was it there? Uh, look here, this, this is an outrage, keeping me here like this. Well, don't you realize I have influence? Well, you might at least let me put on my clothes instead of pawing them about. I'll complain to the politics. I'll have you dismissed, all of you. Oh, maybe you will, sir. And then again, maybe you won't. But first of all, you'll answer some questions. Have you uh, ever seen this knife before? Knife? Uh, knife? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, it's mine. Uh, I've uh, had it all my life. I used to take it fishing when I was a boy. Oh, indeed. Explain its size, then. Uh, now I use it to open my letters. Oh, you do? Are you sure that's all you use it for? Yes, of course. And why are these here bloodstains on it? Uh, bloodstains? Yeah. Where? Here, and here, and here. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, don't you touch it. We don't want to destroy any possible fingerprints. But if it's mine, my fingerprints are already on it. Yes, he's right there, Mr. Now, furthermore, that stain doesn't uh, doesn't look like blood to me. It, it's not uh, red enough. It, it looks like rust. As a matter of fact, if a stain is a nice blood red, it's fairly certain it's not blood. Now, this particular stain... You is need by this the... particular stain to Scotland Yard, Mr. Yes, uh, don't forget, my dear Lestrade, I invented the first infallible test for blood stains. That's quite true, Lestrade, you did. Indeed, my test, uh, my test is infallible. It works on blood that is new or on blood that is old. I discovered the first reagent, which is precipitated by hemoglobin. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Mr. I'm sorry, but Scotland Yard hasn't any time for letters. We believe in action. <clears throat> now, uh, Mr. Tambridge, it's my uh, duty to take you into custody, and it's also my duty to warn you that anything that you may say may be used in evidence against you. Anything I say? Oh, yeah. Do you realize whom you're arresting? I'm a leading figure in British politics. So will this fellow who lies here stand with your knife, which has still got bloodstains on it. Well, Lestrade, if you'll pardon me for saying so, in this case, it's not the bloodstains that are in evidence, but the bloodstains that are not in evidence, uh, which is the significant factor. Uh, 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 oh, what do you mean by that? Uh, simply that it would um, have been rather difficult for Mr. Tumbridge to have committed a murder as as this one without having bloodstains on the towel he's wearing or on the uh, clothes which are still in his locker. Uh, what was to prevent him from dropping his towel outside Lord Canterbury's letting room, going in and knifing him in the back, then sneaking down to the shower rooms, not more than 20 feet down the corridor, and washing away the evidence. Me going round about in the, in the nude? Uh, certainly oh, not. Most certainly not, sir. Remember, my dear Lestrade, as you drag one of Britain's leaders away to jail, that it might have been possible for him to stab his enemy in a fit of temper, but he would never have dreamed of running up and down the corridors in his birthday suit. <laughs> Let me see. I'm afraid I shall have to look for another explanation of the missing bloodstains. Holmes, it's uh, late. Everyone else left the Turkish bar. Mm, everyone's faithful, Gus. Oh, 
I don't mind. Uh, tonight we have by my house sauerkraut. I don't like sauerkraut. Uh, besides, I've got to stay and lock up. Then you'll have to, to find the bloodstains. Uh, here somewhere. That's why I sent home for my famous benzidine peroxide mixture. Somewhere on the premises there is a towel or linen or something that has blood stains. Oh, but we've been through the towels and the linen a dozen times, Holmes. No sign of blood. Furthermore, according to your establishment checklist, there are no towels or any linen missing, even guts, which he, his linen, which he washes himself, is, is hung here on the, on the line. You don't wash any linen but your own, do you, Gus? Uh, no, Mr. Holmes. Everything go out to the laundry. Mm -hmm. I, I wash my own because I'd like to be fresh and clean. Twice a day I wash, noon and evening. Mm -hmm. Yes. The evening's job hasn't been done yet, eh? Uh, no. Uh, this one, I, I washed this noon. It's my towel from this morning. Oh, yes, yes. This morning's towel washed this noon. Yes. But was it? Candlebury was murdered in the middle of the afternoon about 3.30. Now it's, it's now after 7 o'clock. Don't you see, Watson? This towel. Don't you see? No, Holmes. No. Don't see about the thing. The towel's as clean as a whistle. It's not dry. If it had been watched at noon, washed at noon, it would be dry now. But it's still damp. Yes, it was washed after Canterbury's death. Of course. To remove the bloodstain. Gus? Yes, Mr. Holmes. That's why you didn't report the death until half an hour after Canterbury had died. Oh, no. You had to have time to remove the bloodstains. <laughs> That's not true. Besides, you can't prove anything. The towel is clean now. There are no marks, no stains. The very fact that there were no stains on it, Gus, at first made me suspect you. Lord Canterbury was found lying on his back. And yet, when you uh, informed us that he had been stabbed, you were quite definite about the number of times that he'd been stabbed. But in the back, yes. Yes. How did you know that, Gus? Well, I, I lift him up I, I, and I look. Of course, I see what you're getting at, Holmes. He couldn't have done that. No one could examine the corpse without getting blood all over himself. And yet when Gus appeared to tell us of Canterbury's death, there wasn't a spot of blood on him. But if I can prove that this towel, which you so carefully washed, once had blood stains, and that you were very careful to remove those stains, that you will never prove. I have scrubbed, I have used soap, I have even boiled that towel. There is not even a suspicion of a blood stain left. That is why you're wrong, my friend. And what, mm, run the water into this tub, will you? No matter how thoroughly you try to remove a blood stain, it will never... Out. Damn this spot. Yes, we only need enough to moisten the cloth. Now I'll drop a few drops of my famous solution onto the cloth. There we are. Well, all I can see is a lot of fair blue streaks. Yes, yes, it's undoubtedly blood. Blood? Yes, curious blue streaks prove infallibly that there was blood on this towel. And now, Gus, are you going to explain why you were so anxious to remove these blood stains? No, 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 I, I, I did not do it. It was Mr. Turnbridge. He did it. The knife. Watch his knife. There was blood on it. <laughs> Let me out of here. It's not my fault. I don't want to hurt. Holmes, Holmes, he's running away. Him, Watson. I'll get him a chase. Well, there he goes down the corridor. He's gone to the steamroll. Don't worry. I'll get him. Phew. The steam's thick in here. I can hardly see my hand before my face. Must be in here. Look under the benches, Watson. Watson, leave the door open. Let some of this blasted steam out of here, will you? I, I didn't shut the door. Oh, did you hear that? The door. Someone's locked the door. Hey, somebody, let us out. Let us out, you hear? We're locked in. We've been locked in by mistake. No, you're wrong. It was no mistake, my friend. Now, why are you? We share the steam room with us. No, that's just the voice through the ventilator. So you were behind this murder, too, Professor. Of course. Perhaps you would like to know why I have to kill Lord Canterbury. Yes, indeed, that would be very interesting. Good. I found it necessary to start a feud between the two great political parties because they're in danger of forming a coalition to pass certain housing reforms that would have proved very expensive to me. Well, what better way to break up an incipient collaboration than by killing one leader, having the other hang for his murder? A very ingenious theory, I believe you should have chosen such a clumsy tool as God. Uh, perhaps. But fool Scotland Yard, Mr. Holt. It was just my ill luck that you should be on the premises when the accident occurred. Oh, thank you for the compliment. Not at all. However, it's a mistake which I'm sure Gus will be able to rectify. Gus? Yeah. Oh, very simple. I have sent him to put more coals on the fire. Any moment now, there should be more steam. Yes, gentlemen, much more steam. I'm afraid that when you finish with this steam bath, you will never need enough. No. You will be boiled alive. 
He's right there. There comes the steam pouring out of the opening over our head. If only we could reach that opening, we could stuff some of these towels into the pipeline and cut off the flow. The no towels are getting very hot here. Yes. Wait. I have one of the long benches. I'll stand on the end. We'll have to balance it while I climb on the top. Talk and make a noise. Anything to cover up the movement of the bench. Very really well. Oh, get it off. My arm here. This is gone far enough. We become firm at all this. Steady, Holmes. I'll hand me up a towel, quick. Mariotti, turn the steam off. You hear, Mariotti, can't you hear? The heat is it's becoming unbearable. Yes, more towels, Holmes. Is it getting hot enough in there, gentlemen, Boyle? I'm sure it is. <laughs> boiled nice and pink, boiled in steam, live steam. <laughs> Goodbye, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Uh, now, what happened? You can't stand up there all night, Holmes. I won't have to. That's just terrific. Huh? That luck is full. The sun becomes so great that it may burst the boiler. That's dangerous. Buildings will be known to collapse because of bursting boilers. Nevertheless, it's our one chance. Run the confounded boiler first before my arm is snapped into. But Holmes, your arm isn't as strong as a boiler plate. Pressure. Pressure, my dear Watson. Uh, measured per square foot of air surface. Quite a bit of service to a boiler. Uh, the opening of this pipe is very small. All the same, I'm afraid. I I can't hold out much longer, Watson. Hold on, Holmes. Hold on. It must go soon. It must. The pressure. Ah, my hands. My hands. Oh, look out. Look out. And you came through the explosion all right, Dr. Watson? Well, I had a nasty crack where Holmes and the bench fell on me, and Holmes had the wind knocked out of him, but we were we were in fairly good shape by the time the fire brigade pulled us out from the wreckage. Moriarty wasn't by any chance uh, trapped or killed or something. Unfortunately, no, but they found Gus, however, quite dead. I suppose the exploding boiler did for him. No, there was a bullet wound in the back of his head. I rather imagine that Moriarty wanted to make sure that he would never appear in court. Doctor, if I had to go through what you went through in that Turkish bath episode, I think I'd never want to work on another case with Holmes again. Oh, what a tough Mr. Campbell. I, uh, I certainly did feel like that for a couple of hours. By the time we got back to Baker Street and sat down to one of Mrs. Hudson's good meals, well, I was ready for anything that Holmes had in mind. You know, there's nothing like a good dinner to kill a new man. <laughs> You have been listening to An Adventure in Crime with Basil Rathbone as Sherlock Holmes and Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson. The town was full of bevies of fresh young beauties brought up from the country to be presented at court. The papers were full of accounts of dinners, forays, garden parties, and all the rest. For what now seems like a forgotten life. Naturally, all this meant very little to home. Consequently, I was more than a bit surprised on returning one afternoon to our Baker Street lodgings to find him deep in a veritable snow drift of illustrated society magazines and papers. Watson. What do you know about this man, Damery? 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 What Damery? Your Damery, of course. He's got his photograph and all this is part of these days. No, not true. The fellow's a household word in society. Mm, yes. He's a man of the world, and that will turn to the and he's asked you for a fortnight in the point, not to touch it. You mean that the old dame is coming here? It's 4.30 now. And look at the mess of the place he here. Oh, time, you know. Damery is not saying that we should take a seat to investigate our house, but to consult me in my professional capacity. Ah. That's what the gentleman now, unless I'm very much mistaken. Thanks for all the minute. Take a look out of the window, will you, Watson? That's a good fellow. Well, really very um, why you always expect me to play Sister Anne for you? Oh, all right, very well. Yes. Yes, Mrs. Harris. You have to see. She's up in the door to him. I choose she's up in the front step, making his chair. Oh, not this time. He's the movie is happening by. His lordship must have got a very expensive tailor. Every detail. And his black satin cravat, the Satan never shoes is perfect. The state must have cost him a stupid 
Ah, Lord Damery, I presume. And this must be the celebrated Mr. Sherlock Holmes. I'm delighted to make your acquaintance. Won't you sit down, sir? Watson dumped that encyclopedia off the other arm chair. Ah, uh, yes, sir. Uh, I was hoping to find Dr. Watson. A pleasure, I assure you. Well, the pleasure is mine, sir. Yes, I'm truly delighted to find Dr. Watson present. This collaboration may be very necessary, Mr. Holmes. We're dealing on this occasion with one of the most ruthless individuals in all England. Oh, and who might that be? My sister, the Lady Alicia, <laughs> widow of the late Earl of Devlin. <laughs> Don't say. Yes, she has the well-known whim of iron. Anyone who crosses her in any way is in great danger. You mean that she'd go as far as poison them or, or life them, is that? Ladies in high society, my dear Dr. Watson, have more subtle but nonetheless deadly ways of dealing with their adversaries. Mm -hmm. And for whom is uh, the Lady Alicia sucking her knife this time? Well, I suspect it's Miss Kitty Kissam. Kitty Kissam? You mean the delightful Kitty Kissam, the star of the... Sweetheart of the regiment? The same. And how did Lady Alicia's path happen to cross the uh, charming kitty? Through my dunce of a nephew, Percy, who also happens to be Alicia's only son. Oh, oh. he's become uh, infatuated with this kitty? He's asked her to marry him. And uh, quite, uh, well, quite naturally, his, his mother objects. No, that's the most startling aspect of the whole affair. As soon as I heard of the engagement, I rushed around expecting to find Alicia in the midst of hysterics or... <laughs> At least having taken to her bed surrounded with smelling salts. And uh, such is not the case. No, on the contrary. She was sitting at her desk in the morning room, making out her list for a reception and musical to be given tomorrow afternoon to honor Miss Kissam. Mm -hmm. Lord and Lady Coverdale, the Duke of Rockington, Lady Windermere. Well, I must say, my dear Alicia, I hardly expect to find you into the cheerful mood. Why not? After all, what this family needs is new blood. They tell me dear Kitty's father was a butcher and her mother a barmaid. Yes, I'm sure Percy should be very, very happy with the dear little thing. She's bound to make a big impression on all our friends. Alicia, I don't like the way you say that. You have a, a certain glint in your eyes. What glint, dear? The glimpse you had the evening you met the lady you stay at the top of the grand staircase at Buckingham Palace. <laughs> yes, we've been quarreling all the winter. It's such fun. Yes, you smiled politely and left her sweet color. Then you deliberately stepped on her train, ripping it off at the waist, revealing the fact that she wore certain uh, red flannel undergarments. <laughs> Dear Eustasia, she was the laughing stock of Mayfair. I warn you, Alicia, Kitty Kissam is no lady Eustasia. Of course not, darling. She's no lady at all. That's what makes me so anxious to have our friends meet her. Sounds like a rather ominous situation, Lord Damery. By the way, do I gather that you have the pleasure of this person's acquaintance? Uh, well, that is, uh, yes, in a way. We, we've partaken of a bottle and a bird several times, don't you know, after the theater. It is really a dear little thing, in, in spite of her reputation. Reputation? Well, surely you've heard of her confounded soul. I'm afraid I'm rather ignorant of the uh, chit-chat of our metropolis. But everyone knows that she was given those dashed pearls by a certain Balkan king who spends most of his time in Paris. She wears them constantly. Luncheon, for tea, for dinner, in and out of the theater. <laughs> I believe she even wears them in her bath. Mm, it's ostentatious. Well, and um, they a sort of trademark. Yes, I suppose you might call it that. The only evidence of bad taste I've ever known Kitty to indulge in. Bad taste? Well, confounded, man. You're going to take a woman to go flaunting her. Well, her past about as if you were proud of it. Not even if it packs uh, the theater? Oh, blast those clothes. I suspect that whatever my sister has up her sleeve concerns them. Oh. Well, for one thing, she insists I hire a private detective to keep an eye on them. Says she doesn't want to run the risk of having them stolen in her house. Very solicitous of her. Hey, Watson? Why not solve the whole situation by suggesting to Miss Kitty that she leave her jewels at home? Like five. And, uh, well, there are times when Kitty Kissam can be as difficult as my sister. She absolutely refuses. She says she would soon appear in public without her petticoats as without her clothes. I've warned her that my sister Alicia means business. But she says no 
Grand Dame is going to get the better of her. Oh, an interesting situation, eh, Watson? It reminds me of the sign of leading hostesses in conflict with them. one of the theater's most popular leading ladies. Well, I've been trying to bet on Miss Kitty. <laughs> you don't know my sister, Alicia. What makes you so positive that your sister is still opposed to the match between your nephew and Miss Kitty? Because in the first place, Percy can't afford to marry an actress. She has no money and is quite incapable of earning a living. My sister had a match practically arranged between him and Lord Beaverbottom's oldest daughter. He's the millionaire. Man. And in the second place, Kitty must be a good ten years older than the boy. Well, she doesn't look like it. No, she's an actress. In okay. short, you, um, you don't approve of the match, but uh, you'd hate to see her sister put one over on Miss Kitty Christmas. Well, that's the situation in the nutshell. Now, I, I beg of you, Mr. Holmes, come and keep an eye on things. Ostensibly, you'll be there to guard these silly toes, but in reality, I want you to, well, prevent any unpleasantness that might harm Miss Kissam's professional popularity. After all, she's a bad fine actress, you know. Oh, yes, and an equally delightful supper partner, eh? Miss Kissam, at this party of yours, I shall cut Percy out of my will. He won't get a penny from me. And then where would you be? <laughs> my dear James, calm yourself. Anyone might think that it was you who'd become engaged to Miss Kissam instead of Percy. Besides, if Percy has to wait till you pop off, my dear, before he inherits the family wealth, I'll be dead and gone. You're too disgustingly young and healthy. Uh, it's no good trying to butter me up, Alicia. And I wish to remind you that it's not the family wealth Percy will inherit. It's my money, my own. I made it myself, and I shall leave it to whom I please. Of course you will, James. But we Damerys are famous for sticking together, aren't we, Sue? Oh, look. Who is the lean, rapacious, and uh, very distinguished man who just entered? Hello, Holmes and Dr. Watson. Oh, uh, these are the gentlemen I've asked to guard Miss Kissam's toe. And, and I warn you, Alicia, Sherlock Holmes has the best brain in England, so no monkey tricks. Don't be vulgar, James, my pet. Ah, oh, they see you. Coming over. I'm all of a flutter. Ah, Mr. Holmes, it's so good of you to be so prompt. The guest of honor is you at any moment. Good evening, good evening Lord Emerson. Uh, James, my darling, haven't you forgotten something? Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, Alicia, my dear, may I introduce Mr. Sherlock Holmes and his friend and colleague, Dr. Watson? How do you How do? How do you do, madam? This is really delightful. I was just saying to Lord Damery, Mr. Holmes, that I had no idea a member of the police force would have so perfectly fascinated. I'm sorry to disappoint you, ma'am. But um, we are not members of the official police. We are merely amateurs of the not-so-gentle art of detection. How charming. How simply charming. Give me kiss Oh, here's my guest of honor now. Oh, judging by the rush in her direction, it would seem that quite a few of my male guests have already had the privilege of meeting her. Yes, you see, um, they no longer lock actresses up in the wardrobe trunk after the performance, lady. Mm, yes, I think she's wearing her pearls. They certainly are magnificent. Almost as fine as mine, I should say. You don't suppose she insists on wearing them so consistently because her neck is too skinny? No one could ever suspect you of that man. <laughs> Touche, Alicia. He had you there. Don't be unpleasant, James. Come along, Mr. Holmes. You too, Dr. Uh, Wilson. Uh, what? Oh, of course, to be sure. After all, if you're to stand guard over Miss Kissam's pearls, it's high time you made her acquaintance. Are you sure you wouldn't rather be kept an eye on yours? I imagine they must be quite as valuable. Yes, the family pearls are handsome. It's a good thing James has never married, or his wife would be wearing them. Hmm. But I fancy they're in no danger. I'm not in the habit of having them stolen, which is more than can be said of actresses nowadays, judging by what I read in the papers. But come, I'm being very remiss to host it. Not that my guest needs to feel any need of me. Oh, how are you, Lady Coverdale? See what I mean, Mr. Holman? Yes. The lady in this case doesn't want to drag her up into three. Yes, and one in each garter as well. Come along and meet Kitty. Really, yeah, she's charming. Oh, I understand she she today has been nothing but no. Excuse me. Oh, there you are, my dear Kitty. Looking younger every day. <laughs> That's because I'm happy. You must try it sometime. <laughs> I want you to meet two friends that Lord Damery has invited. They're here to see that nobody steals your pearls. I die if anything should happen to them while you were at a party of mine. Oh, they've never been threatened before, Lady Elizabeth. Are your parties more dangerous than the others I go to? Oh, oh now, Kitty, easy, does it? Uh, may I introduce my friend, Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson? Oh, no, this is wonderful. I've read all of Dr. Watson's famous accounts of your wonderful adventures. Oh, thank you so much. Your sensationalism, my dear Miss Kissam. Oh, I don't believe it for a moment. Such wonderful, dramatic material. Have you ever thought of writing them into a play, Dr. Well, Watson? that's already been done most successfully with a great American actor, Mr. William Gillette. 
who plays the leading role himself and does a far more creditable job of it, no doubt, than I could myself. Oh, I never believe that either. Yes. Have you ever thought of playing the board, Mr. Holmes? There's a certain, uh, shall we say, voltage about you. You would make a very exciting performance. No, no, no. Don't you try and persuade him to, to change his mitt here, Miss Kitty. I'll never be able to follow him onto the stage. Well, oh, my dear, this will never do. Hello, Fred. <laughs> we can't allow these two people to monopolize you, Kitty, my sweet. You must meet some of our other friends. All in good time, Percy. Just give your fiancé a chance to catch a breath. Kitty, my dear, you must have a glass of champagne to brace you for the ordeal of meeting all these people. Percy, tell Paddleford to bring that tray over here. Oh, very well, dear. I'm sure Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson could do with a spot. There's a bar in the ante room here if you'll just set in for a moment. Oh, James, my dear, aren't you forgetting what these gentlemen are here for? We can't leave Kitty unprotected. Ah, here's Paddleford. Allow me, Kitty, my dear. Oh, thank you, lady. Elizabeth. And a glass to you, Mr. Holmes, and one for... Oh, 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 how clumsy of me. Get a towel, run, Percy. James, change your handkerchief. Oh, I don't need kiss them. Beautiful, please. Oh, dear. Uh, look out for the glasses. Get them swept up, Paddle, for quick. Uh, you're not hurt, are you, Kitty? Pray went right past your shoulder. Oh, no, I'm quite all right. Oh, really? but your sleeve, your beautiful sleeve, it's so... Oh, it doesn't matter, really. Here's the towel, my dear. Oh, just let me pack it dry. Good heavens. What is it? Your pearls. They're missing. Someone has stolen a kiss of pearls. Oh, dear. Now, now, control yourself, Alicia. They must have come loose and excited. No, they were stolen. I knew they would be. Yes, yes. I, I rather expected the same thing myself, Lady Alicia. Of course, of course. They must be found. We must search everybody. Oh, no, please. Oh, oh, this is awful. It's so embarrassing for everyone. Alicia, have you gone out of your mind? Uh, your sister's quite right, Lord Amory. We must search everybody. It's the only way to recover the pearls, and you and your nephew and the lady, Alicia, will be the first to search. But that's preposterous. Yes, I know it is. But you can hardly expect or get to submit to the indignity of a search if you don't um, set some example. So shall we adjourn to the um, ante room, Lady Olivia? <laughs> Well, here we are, Mr. Holmes, my sister, my nephew, and myself. Which would you like to search first? Uh, first, we allow Miss Kitty to choose. After all, it was she who lost the pearls. Oh, really, Mr. Holmes? I... Well, that is, I feel as though so unnecessary. The pearls came loose in the excitement over the upset tray that well, they probably rolled under a chair or rug somewhere. If we wait until the guests have gone, I'm sure we'll find them. Certainly not, my dear. Those pearls were stolen. There wasn't a chair or rug anywhere near us. Nothing but their parquet floor. And a lot of people. Yes, he's right about that, huh? Of course, I'm right. There's a thief in my house, and I insist that the fact that he or she is probably a guest of mine should be no protection. After all, that necklace was given you by a certain royal personage. It's practically a historical relic. Yes, I know, but really, I'd much rather not have any such a promotion. Nonsense, my dear. We must find the culprit. Everyone must be searched. Bravo, Lady Alicia. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. And now there's enough time for that, so that they will think that we've been thoroughly searched. Suppose we call in the rest of the guests, one at a time. You gentlemen can search the men, and uh, Kitty and I will search the ladies. Uh, behind that screen. Oh, please, I'd be much happy if you wouldn't. Nonsense. Let's get on with it. Right. But I still insist uh, the search begins with the camera. Oh, very well, if you insist on being a stickler for form. I suppose Percy and Lord Damery may as well turn out their pockets. Uh, no, Lady Elizabeth. We should begin with you. Me? But I haven't any pockets. I don't even carry a reticule. So where could I hide anything? In your body. And Miss Kitten, if you will investigate Lady Alicia's body. The idea. The very idea. Oh, I'd... I'd much rather not. Very well. If you won't, Kitty, I will. Jane, don't you dare. Jane, put your hands off my neck. That's an outrage. Jane, stop. Stop it. I'm sorry, but I can't let this pass go on. I... That is... Not worth it. That is, I... Well, you see, those pairs aren't real. My dear. You mean the king gave you imitation jewelry? Oh, that whole story was made up by my publicity agent. He, well, he thought it would be good for me. I rather suspect you knew the pairs were imitation the first time you saw them. That's why you planned to show me up. But uh, all, all these stories about you and the king... Oh, I'm so sorry to disappoint you, Percy, but... I'm really quite a respectable person. I've never met a king. Well, I, I must say this is a blow. 
Uh, uh, surprised, I mean. Uh, well, I shall be terribly ragged by my pals, you know. They were all not uh, envious of me. Well, after all, no one needs to know. We don't have to publicize this thing to the world. Oh, but I must tell my guests, James, here. After all, I owe them some explanation if I let the whole matter drop after making such an issue of things. I'm sure that everyone will be interested to know that not only are Miss Kissam's pearls not real, but Miss Kissam is somewhat of an imposter herself. But how could you know that pearls were false, Mother dear? After all, ladies don't wear imitation shoes. And actresses don't wear trinkets given them by men who don't consider them ladies. Here is your engagement, Oh, uh, let me... Well, I didn't really... Oh, this is... Keep the ring as a remembrance, don't you know? Thank you, Percy, but I'd rather not. Well, Alessia, now that you've accomplished the result for which the party was undoubtedly given, suppose you let me send the guests home. Oh, not before I've had a chance to explain. You'll do nothing of the kind. If Kitty Kissam wants people to think a king gave us some souls, that's her business. Thank you, Lord Jamie, but it really doesn't matter. I'd... Well, I'd just as soon they did not. That story of the royal pearls was beginning to make me feel just a bit foolish. Oh, I'll admit it was helpful when I was just a struggling small part player, but now, well, I flatter myself that my hold on the ladder of success is firm enough, so that it'll take more than a few imitation pearls to shake me loose. Bravo, Miss Kitty. I salute your courage. Thank you, Miss Kitty. I see. Look here. Perhaps I've been a bit... Hasty, don't you know? You keep your silly mouth shut. I'll handle this from now on. You stay here, Alicia. I'm going to explain the situation to our guest. But, James... Alicia, shut up! Well, really? I'm afraid, Mr. Holmes, there's a speak of vulgarity in my brother. I'm sure I don't know where he comes from. Yes, probably from the same place he gets his honesty and sense of fair play. Yeah, me. Don't tell me you're going to be cross with me, too. By the way, whatever makes you think that I might have secreted Miss Kitchen's pearls in my body... My dear Lady Alicia, when something of value disappears during a manufactured promotion, the first one suspected should be the person who did the manufacturing. You mean, uh, you thought that I had set the tray on purpose? Uh, quite. But come, let us uh, join the other Toby. I think we have given Lord Damery ample time to make his explanation. Let's get him, if you will do me the honor. Watson, uh, you may escort the Lady Alicia. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Oh, here's one. Well, that makes 99. Uh, here's two more. 100 and 101. I found five more. All in a little bunch. Oh, this is simply thrilling. So much more fun than hunting for you say. Well, that makes 106. James, what on earth are you doing? Hunting for pearls. Seems I was right in the first place. The Chisholm pearls weren't stolen. The string must have broken and threw them all over the place. Any more? We've looked everywhere. I'm sure there isn't an inch we haven't searched. Then here you are, my dear Kitty. Allow me to return your pearl. Oh, thank you. But I don't understand. Uh, tell me, uh, Miss Kisholm. Yes? How many pearls were there on your string? A hundred and five. But Holmes, the uh, Lord Dame, has just counted them. He mentioned a hundred and six. There's one more pearl now than there was when it was stolen. Incredible. It's absolutely impossible, my dear Watson. No, 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 no. It's not incredible. It's not even impossible. It's, uh... Really enlightening. Uh, what do you deduce from the presence of this added proof of the humble oyster, Lady Alicia? Perhaps you can explain uh, why there are now 106 pearls in this business necklace. Did you say 106? But my necklace, the Davery the pearls have 106. Good heavens, my necklace, it's gone. Someone has taken my pearls. Then uh, may I ask, uh, Lady Alicia... What pearls are those still hidden in your body? Oh, but those are Miss Kissam's imitations. James must have taken mine off my neck when he was threatening to search me. And now he's pulled this trick to get even with me. The string that broke are my pearls. She has no rest of them. They are the same of pearls. My dear Lady Alicia, there is one person who has a better right to them than yourself. That person, of course, would be Lord Damery's wife. Yes. Judging by the look in Lord Damery's eyes, Watson, wouldn't you say they, uh... They've been handed over to the proper party? My Joe, yes. Elementary, my dear Holmes, elementary. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... <laughs> Battle Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The 
Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us about an exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And so while you're getting comfortable, I'd like to tell you about an old, old American custom. The custom of serving a glass of sherry wine before dinner. Petri, California sherry. You know, Petri sherry is to a good meal what the overture is to a good musical comedy or an opera. Before you sit down at the dinner table, just pour yourself a little glass of Petri sherry and sip it slowly. Look at that beautiful amber color. Smell the fragrance of those sun-ripened grapes and taste that fine sherry flavor. You'll agree with me, I'm sure, that Petri sherry is the best beginning a good meal ever had. And say, if you happen to like your sherry dry, as I do, you'll really like Petri Pale Dry Sherry. Believe me, you can't go wrong with any wine that bears the name Petri, the proudest name in the history of American wines. And now let's drop in on the good Dr. Watson, who's waiting for us in his California ranch house. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Mr. Foreman. Come in and make yourself a home. Thank you, Doctor. Sitting here with the lights off, I see. Have you been getting yourself in the mood for tonight's Sherlock Holmes story? No, my boy, I was watching the sunset. It's quite a beautiful tonight. I, Doctor, the sun set over an hour ago. Yes, I know that, young fellow, my lad, I know that. But at my age, a fellow's entitled to take a little snooze after dinner, isn't he? Of course he is, Doctor. And now that we've settled that, how about tonight's story? Well, a very beautiful girl figured prominently in this adventure, Mr. Foreman. Her name was Jasmine Lafleur. Huh? You say that again, Doctor, please? <laughs> I know, my boy, but that was her stage name. When she was a magician's assistant, unfortunately, I never had the opportunity of seeing Jasmine Lafleur in the theater. But I'm told that she was a, a fascinating figure in tights and, and, and spangles. <laughs> when Holmes and I first met her, however, she was uh, dressed a little more conventionally. And her name was then Diana Venering. Lady Venering. Lady Venering? Say, those tights and spangles really paid off, didn't they? Well, how did you and Sherlock Holmes come to meet up with her, Doctor? In rather spectacular style, Mr. Foreman. Miss Lafleur became something of a femme fatale in the early 1900s. First of all, she married Signor Rossoni, the magician for whom she was working. On the wedding night, he was mysteriously stabbed to death. A few months later, Madame Rossoni, very fetching in her widow's weeds, I'm sure, met Sir Wilfred Venering. And, after a whirlwind courtship, she married him. Don't tell me he got murdered, too. He did, Mr. Foreman. Also on the night of the wedding. But this time, the police found a suspect. It was a certain Major Beckworth, cousin of the dead man, and an ardent suitor of the fair Diana. The trial at the Old Bailey was one of the most sensational I ever remember. Sherlock Holmes and I, in, in court on the closing day as a jury, were still considering their verdict. Holmes, the, the jury's been out over eight hours. I bet you they can't agree on a verdict and there'll be a new trial. I think not, old chap. Look, here they come now. You know, there's a strong moral probability of guilt, but I'm sure they'll agree that there's insufficient evidence to convict. Oh, perhaps you're right. Just look at Lady Venering down there ahead of us. What a what a stunning woman. Yes, and a woman of great poise and courage. Here it comes. Gentlemen of the jury, have you arrived at a verdict? We have, my lord. How say you? You find the defendant guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. Exactly. Come on, Watson. Let's get a breath of fresh air. Well, I was wondering, perhaps, if we shouldn't go over and congratulate Lady Venering. On what? The fact that her husband's murderer has not been found? Oh, I suppose you're right. You ever read the book of Turbid, Watson? Turbid? I don't think so. When was it published? Well, a little before our time, old chap. It's an Old Testament story. <laughs> Whatever made you think of it at this moment? Well, it's so remarkably... Apposite with a case of Lady Furring. It deals with a highly peculiar series of murders, seven of them, if I remember correctly. Who's the murderer? A jealous demon by the name of Asmodeus, who strangled husbands on their wedding nights. Well, judging by the verdict just now, Mr. Beckworth isn't the Asmodeus, or whatever you call him in this case. Here you are, boy, here. Give me a paper. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. Paper! Paper! Well, Holmes, huh? what does it say? Oh. Anyway, here we are. Listen to this. Oh, 
Lady Benring, widow of the murdered man, says that she will marry the suspect. Lady Benring told newspaper reporters this afternoon that if Major Beckwith is acquitted, she will marry him before the year is out. Oh, from my soul, Holmes, there's a positive sparkle in your eyes. You read about her. I must admit the lady fascinates me, old chap. I hope before she becomes involved in any further tragedies that we may have the opportunity of meeting her. And something tells me that we will. <laughs> Sunday papers are certainly having a field day over the veteran case, Holmes. <laughs> Did you read them? No, I didn't, Watson. There's a complete life history of Lady Venering in one of them with photographs. It's uh, rather interesting. Really? What are you doing over there, Holmes? Looking out of the window. Ah, yes, yes. You expecting anybody, Holmes? No, come over here, old fellow. Oh, it's a clergyman. Yes, a very agitated one. Look at the way he's pacing up and down. And looking up at our window, too. Right, Joe. What eyes? Yes, there's a fanatical look about him, which suggests either the martyr at the stake or the inquisitor lighting the faggots. Mrs. Hudson's letting him in now. Well, I'll be interested to know what he's come to us about. I can hear footsteps on the stairs here. I'll, I'll go and have a look. How do you do, sir? Uh, come along in, won't you? It's all right, thank you, Mrs. Hudson. You're Mr. Sherlock Holmes? I am, sir, and this is my colleague, Dr. Watson. My name is Whalen, the Reverend Arthur Whalen. How do you do, How sir? How do you do, sir? Sit down. Would you and uh, tell me what I can do for you? Oh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Holmes, this, uh, this is a very difficult subject to broach. In fact, it's only after intense personal conflict that I've been able to force myself to come to. May I ask you, are you familiar with the Book of Tobit? Book of Tobit? Gracious me. You, you were talking about that yesterday, Holmes. I see that you've come to consult me about the Venering case. But that's amazing. How did you know? Has Lady Venering been in touch with you? Uh, no, sir, but uh, I'm familiar with the book of Tobit. Lady Venering's case closely resembles that of the woman Sarah in the Old Testament story. More closely than you realize, Mr. Holmes. Did you know that before each one of Lady Venering's husbands was killed, they received a threatening note? Yes, I recall that from the trial. Signed in some sort of gibberish, weren't there? No, Doctor. Yesterday I was permitted for the first time to examine one of these books. The apparent gibberish was, in reality, ancient Hebrew writing. Indeed. Were you able to translate it? Yes, Mr. Holmes. In effect, it said, If you go through with this marriage, your hours are numbered. And it was signed Asmodeus. Oh. The name of the jealous demon who strangled husbands in the Book of Tobit. Exactly. Just why have you come to me, sir? I want you to talk to Diana, uh, <laughs> to Lady Vannering, to tell her she must not go through with this new marriage. Mother is stalking her, Mr. Holmes. I have argued with her, prayed with her, implored her to realize her danger. But she is adamant. Ah, I'm afraid I should feel extremely presumptuous in giving her my advice. No, Mr. Holmes. I have prepared the way for you. You could, I'm sure, and her realize her danger. And she's willing to see me, you say? Willing and anxious. Oh, very well. But I'd like to ask you a few questions first. Anything, Mr. Holmes. What is your interest in her? She is, she's a member of my flock. She needs a guidance. Nothing further? No, no, Mr. Holmes. Well, I, I believe that you uh, performed the marriage ceremony at both of her previous weddings. Yes. Are you proposing to officiate the uh, ceremony if she marries Major Beckwith? Well, I... Uh, I don't know. I'm hoping that marriage will never take place. And so I want you to help me, Mr. Holmes. Hmm. Where does the lady live? 47, Barclay Square. Very well. Uh, Dr. Watson and I will call on her this afternoon. Mm, delighted to, delighted to. I doubt if I can be there myself. In fact, Diana might speak more freely if I'm not. But uh, here's my, my card. Oh, thank you. You'll God. know where to get in touch with me if you want to. Very well, sir. Good day to you, gentlemen. And I, I'm greatly in your debt. Well, good day, good day. Hmm. Strange business, Holmes. I, I can't believe that Mr. Whalen's motives are entirely impersonal. Nor can I, old chap. <laughs> hmm? <laughs> What are you laughing about? I was thinking of the Book of Tobit once. Hmm? Hmm. In that, the role of protector, the role I have just been asked to take, uh, was played by the Archangel Raphael. I can't help feeling, Watson, that I'm making distinct strides in my profession. Mr. Sherlock Holmes, I'm so glad to meet you. How do you do, Lady Venering? May I introduce my old friend, Dr. Watson? 
How are you, Dr. Watson? I'm awfully glad to meet you, Lady Vettering. <laughs> uh, let's sit down, shall we? You're just in time for sure. tea. Thank you. Um, you know why we're here, of course. Oh, naturally. Mr. Whalen came round here as soon as he'd left you. Uh, you were to persuade me to look after my mortal affairs, uh, while he takes care of my immortal ones. Isn't that it? He takes care of my immortal put Lady Vettering. <laughs> uh, may I say, Mr. Holmes, that I'm flattered that a man of your eminence should be sufficiently interested to bother about me. You underestimate your own importance, Lady Benring. Though I may mention that if your problem had been as simple as Mr. Whaler made it out to be, I might have been otherwise engaged. For well, being very frank and a little mysterious. Are you suggesting that Mr. Whalen didn't tell you everything? I am. And I hope you will be more candid with me. <laughs> Sherlock Holmes, I like you. <laughs> You're most refreshing. Uh, milk and sugar in your tea? Uh, just milk, thank you. Here you are. How about you, Dr. Watson? Oh, just the same way, please. Hey, thank you, my dear. And now, Mr. Holmes, perhaps you'll tell me why you think that you haven't been told everything. Before I answer that, uh, Lady Venering, I wonder if I might ask you some questions. But of course. Anything. When your first husband... Uh, Signor Sonny was killed. Did the police find any suspects? Uh, yes, one. Ferdinand Gautier, a young man who had been an assistant in our magician's act. A stupid, good-looking boy who thought he was in love with me. But, of course, Inspector Lestrade had to release him. There was no evidence. Inspector Lestrade, well, you can bet that if he arrested him, <laughs> the boy was innocent. A warning note was found among your husband's effects, wasn't it? Yes, and it was signed in Hebrew with the name Asmodeus. Uh, but perhaps you're not familiar with the Book of Tobit. Oh, yes, yes, sir, I am. I'm familiar with it, Lady Venering. Uh, how did you know then that the Hebrew letters signified that name? Mr. Whelan translated them for me. Oh, I see. And also read me the Book of Tobit. Uh, he's always been particularly fond of that book. Perhaps because it illustrates his own ideas on the dangers of marriage. But Holmes told us that he hadn't seen one of the warning notes until yesterday. Precisely. Lady Venering. I read in the papers that you intend to marry Major Beckwith, the man who has just been tried for your late husband's murder. Yes, Mr. Holmes. When are you going to marry him, may I ask? When it pleases me. Doesn't it occur to you that uh, a great deal of comment will be caused? Also, that Major Beckwith's life is in obvious danger? Of course it occurs to me, my dear man. But because of two tragic marriages, am I to spend the rest of my life alone? As Mr. Whelan would have me do. I'm young, alive. Peter! What are you doing here? I just arrived back in England today, Diana. What's this I read about you marrying Beckwith? Peter, I have guests. Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. This is Pimmer Comis, one of our most promising young painters. I know, so Diana, I know. tell me it isn't true. When I left England, you loved me, and I you. I come back, and what do I find? You're planning to marry Beckwith. Well, I won't stand for it. If you think you can throw me over like some silly boy, you're very much mistaken. I can tell things, you know. I can tell lots of things. Get out of here, Peter. Get out. Diana. And don't come back until you've learned manners and discretion. But, but Diana... Get out. I'm sorry, gentlemen. Were there any more questions you wanted to ask me, Mr. Holmes? Uh, one, Lady Bennering. Uh, where is your fiancé, Major Beckwith? He's upstairs. Uh, I'm letting him stay here until the scandal of the trial has died down. I must see him at once. At once? Why, Holmes? He's in no danger until the marriage takes place? The marriage has taken place, Watson, unless what? I'm very much mistaken. What makes you think so, Mr. Holmes? You're much too discreet and intelligent, Lady Venering, to let him stay here in your house unless you were already married. <laughs> we were married this morning. But we planned to keep the fact a secret for a few months until the scandal had died down. May I talk to him, please? Of course. I'll ring for the butler and ask him to come down. May I ask, uh, madam, who married you? The Reverend Arthur Whelan, of course. Oh, and all the time he talked to us today, he knew perfectly well this marriage had taken place. He must have just come from it. I don't trust that man, Holmes. Oh, there you are, Hudson. I just rang for you. Uh, will you ask Major Beckwith? Excuse to... me, lady. I, I was just on my way to telephone the police. The police? What do you mean? It's Major Beckwith, my lady. He's been stabbed to death in his bath. Mr. Beckwith murdered, too. Hodgson, I'll telephone the police. I know I'm rather well acquainted with Inspector Lestrade. Excuse me, gentlemen. What a dreadful business, Holmes. The third husband murdered on his wedding day. But what a woman, Watson. 
Gee, superb, magnificent. What on earth do you mean, Holmes? What courage. What unconquerable spirit in the face of a fresh tragedy. Watson, she fascinates me. I haven't seen such a splendid female since we solved that case for the Club Bohemia. Dr. Watson's story will continue in just a few seconds. Time enough to remind you that the easiest way to make good food taste better is to serve that good food with a swell Petri wine. And there are two Petri wines in particular just made to go with food. Petri California Sautern, a delicate white wine with a subtle flavor that's perfect with chicken and fish. And Petri California Burgundy, a hearty, rich red wine that's out of this world with any meat or meat dish. So if you want to know just how good a cook you are, serve your good food with Petri wine made to go with it. A Petri Burgundy or a Petri Sautern. Two swell Petri mealtime wines. And now back to tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure. The famous detective and his old friend Dr. Watson have become involved in the affairs of thrice-married Diana, one-time magician's assistant. Each of her husbands has been mysteriously murdered on his wedding day, the latest murder occurring the same day that Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson are brought into the case. As we rejoin our story, it's a month later, and for some obscure reason, Sherlock Holmes seems to have lost interest in the case, though not in the beautiful Diana. Mr. Holmes. Yes, Mr. Stard? It's over a month now since Major Beckwith was murdered, and we haven't found a single clue. Do you expect me to supply the deficiencies of Scotland Yard? Well, it's unlikely not to help us, Mr. Holmes. And after all, you and Dr. Watson were in the house when it happened. If you ask me, the murderer's either McComas, that Irish painter, or the clergyman Whalen. What do you think, sir? As far as I'm concerned, the case is closed, Mr. Arden. I wish you'd stop bothering me. What do you think I am? Nothing but a detecting machine? Mr. Holmes, whatever's come over you... Holmes, you're not going out again this evening, are you? I'm afraid so, old chap. Well, this will be the fourth night in a row. I was hoping that we might have a nice, quiet evening in front of the fire. Oh, I'm sorry, Watson, but I promised to take Diana to the horse show at Olympia. I should be home by midnight. Mr. Holmes. Yes, Mr. Whalen? You're seeing altogether too much of Diana. She seems to be completely under your spell. But you introduced me to her in the first place with a request that I keep an eye on her. I made a great mistake. As her spiritual protector, I'm afraid I must ask you to stop seeing her. I'm afraid I must ask you, sir, to mind your own business. I say, Holmes, have you seen the paper that that violinist, the Zywe, is playing at the Albert Hall tonight? Uh, no, I haven't looked at the paper today. Oh, I thought perhaps we might go along and see Oh, I'm afraid I can't hold you up. No, I'm taking Diana to the French maid at Dahlia's Theatre. I hear it's a, a charming musical comedy. <laughs> Here, Holmes. We've been friends for a good many years now. Very true, old fellow. And I think I'm entitled to speak to you straight from the shoulder. Of course you are, Watson. Very well, then. This Diana Beckworth. Oh. Oh, It's your own business, I suppose, but I can't bear to see her making such a fool of you. You've neglected your work entirely since you met her. You get about as though you're a young fellow of 20. What's come over you, Holmes? Stop stop pacing about, old chap, will you, and sit down. In fact, uh, it might be a good idea if you fortified yourself with a nip of brandy from the tantalus there. Uh, what I'm about to tell you uh, may be something of a shock. Um, Watson, uh, uh, Diana and I are getting married tomorrow. What did you say, Holmes? Uh, I'm getting married tomorrow. But uh, you're insane. Oh, that's not very flattering, Watson. Anyway, I don't see why you should be so surprised. You, you, you yourself married and left Baker Street once, didn't you? Well, you, Holmes, a confirmed woman. Oh, no, 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 my what? dear Watson. No, indeed, no. You will remember in our adventure that you titled A Scandal in Bohemia, I met a lady that I have often referred to as a, oh, the woman. You mean Irene Adler, but she was a criminal. Exactly, and yet Diana has the same magnificent characteristics. Keen intelligence, courage, and unconquerable spirit. But Holmes, three of her husbands murdered on their wedding nights. You're proposing to be the fourth. Oh, rubbish, my dear fellow, because tragedy has attended her previous marriages. Is she to go through life alone? Holmes, you... Uh... You really mean it, don't you? Of course I do. I think I will have a nip of brandy. Oh, don't take it so bad, old fellow. We'll continue to see a lot of each other. Diana's very fond of you, you know. Oh, well, I'm, I'm glad. Who's going to perform the ceremony? Not the 
the Reverend Mr. Whaler. Oh, no, 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 no. We decided, in view of Diana's previous marriages, that he might prove to be a trifle, uh, well, unlucky. A clergyman named Bernay will officiate. Whalen, of course, insists on being present just the same. Uh, what time is the wedding tomorrow? Two o'clock, old fellow. Oh, uh, I should have mentioned this before. I hope your cutaway coat and top hat are in a good state preservation. You'll be a pretty prominent figure at the ceremony, you know. You mean that, uh, that... Well, I mean that uh, if Sherlock Holmes gets married, who else could be his best man but his old friend, Dr. Watson? It's elementary, my dear fellow, elementary. <laughs> I now pronounce you men and wife. And those whom God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. Diana, I'm going to claim the privilege of the best man and <laughs> give you a kiss. Of course you shall, Doctor. It's you, Holmes, you... you. It's Lucky Fuller. Of course I am, old chap. Uh, Sherlock, I'm going upstairs to change my dress now. Very well, Diana. I'll be up shortly. I'll see you later, Dr. Watson. Very well, Mrs. Holmes. <laughs> you know, Holmes, I, I never thought I'd live to say that. Uh, Watson, old fellow, I'm worried. Worried? Today? Oh, my dear fellow, what, what's the matter? Well, just before the ceremony, I received one of those warning notes signed by Asmodeus. Oh, you better be careful, Holmes. I think I'll slip out and have a pipe or two on the matter. Yes. Look after my guests for me, will you? And keep your eyes open and your ears. Yes, I will indeed. Uh, there you are, Mr. Whelan. Would you care for a glass of champagne or a punch or something or other? Thank you, no, Doctor. I'm in no mood for celebration. I'm certain that Diana has made a shocking mistake. Well, really, sir, I don't think... I you... only came here in a last-minute attempt to dissuade her. Now that I've failed, I shall leave. Good day, sir. Yes, sir. Oh. Dr. Watson. Oh, hello, McCormick. Where's Mr. Holmes? We'll be back in a few minutes. Would you care for a glass of champagne, sir? Well, thank you. I should like to drink a toast to the pair. I've been in love with Diana for years, you know, but well, she wouldn't marry me, and well, I suppose I might as well make the best of it. I, I must say your friend Sherlock Holmes seems like a splendid fellow. He is indeed, McCormick. In fact, I may say... What? What? Excuse me, sir. All right, Holmes, I'm coming. Up here. What is the matter, Holmes? Follow me. Lock the door behind you. Allow me to introduce you to the demon Asmodeus, Watson. Unfortunately, at the moment, she's in a faint. Good Lord. It's Diana. Exactly. Always an impetuous woman, she made the mistake of trying to stab me with that knife. So I bent over to strap up a suitcase. She didn't allow for the wall mirror in which I was watching her. You mean you suspected her all along? Of course I did, old fellow. The problem was to find the proof. I first suspected her when I knew that she had been a magician's assistant. The key to the profession of magic is misdirection, and these murders have been a perfect example of misdirection motive. How do you mean, Holmes? Well, by creating Asmodeus, thanks to the well-meaning stories of uh, the Reverend Mr. Whalen, whose theological libraries, she must have copied the Hebrew signature, she focused the murders on jealousy, concealing the fact that the one person with a perfect motive was herself. The widow who was to inherit. Oh, why hasn't she been caught before? Because she was cle devilishly clever. She left no clues except an indirect one that I had once spotted. That the likeliest person to be able to approach a bridegroom unsuspected and stab him is his bride. And now I wish you'd see if you can revive her, old fellow. When the police get here, I should like Mrs. Holmes to be in full possession of all her faculties. <laughs> Well, Holmes, I must say I never expected to be driving back with you to Baker Street on your wedding day. <laughs> I can't tell you how I feel. Dear old Watson, you really thought that I deserted you, didn't you? Oh, well, naturally, I wish you'd tell me the truth. Why couldn't tell anyone? Not even you. If the faintest shadow of suspicion had entered her mind, I'd never have caught her. Well, it seems to me you paid a pay high price, Holmes. You told me you made a will in her favor. Supposing something happened to you before her trial, she'd get the money, you know. Oh, the will? Oh, no, that was worthless. I, Diana... But it was a holographic will and perfectly valid. Well, what on earth is a holographic will? Uh, a will drawn up in uh, one's own handwriting on a piece of perfectly plain paper. Such a document is quite legal, but I drew mine up on a paper with, uh, well, with a little head. That made it um, invalid. Oh, I see, but the fact remains that you are married, Holmes. <laughs> I, I really fooled you completely, didn't I, Watson? Uh, didn't the name of the 
clergyman who married us suggest anything to you? The Reverend Vernet, no, and why not should it? Well, Vernet was a French painter of some note. He also happens to have been a great uncle of mine and, um, you, Mycroft's. You mean that, that your brother Mycroft was a clergyman? I mean that Mycroft was disguised as a clergyman. And a very convincing job he did, too. A more satisfactory clergyman than the Reverend Mr. Whalen, no doubt, whose possible complicity may compel him to answer some very awkward questions. Then you're not married. Well, I put myself home to... I, I don't know what to say. Then I suggest that you say nothing, my dear chap. Let's just sit back quietly, as two good friends can, and brood about the uh, mutability of human affairs. <laughs> Well, Doctor, tonight's adventure was really a little extraordinary, to say the least. Holmes sure had a narrow escape. Uh, doubly narrow, Mr. Foreman, doubly narrow. He not only escaped the, the jaws of death, but he also escaped the, the clutches of matrimony. Actually, the story had a happy ending for everybody but Lady Venering. Uh, uh, Jasmine Lafleur. Well, what about that artist fellow, McComas? How did he take it? Oh, very well, very well indeed. In fact, in gratitude, he even painted Holmes's portrait. Not exactly a good likeness, though. One of those... Modern artist who paints impressions of a person but rather than a portrait. What do you mean? Well, now, let me see. If he were to paint his impression of you, you'd probably end up by looking like a bottle of Petri wine in a sports jacket. Go ahead, Doctor. You can tease me all you want, but I'll still rave about Petri wine. And why not? The facts bear me out that Petri wine most certainly is good wine. After all, the Petri family knows all there is to know about the art of turning plump, sun-ripened grapes into fragrant, delicious wine. That's because they've been making wine for generations, ever since they started the Petri business way back in the 1800s. And because the making of Petri wine is a family affair, the family has been able to hand down from father to son, from father to son, all their skill and knowledge and experience. And believe me, that adds up to plenty. So no matter what type of wine you prefer, one to serve with meals or a wine for any special occasion, choose one of the fine Petri wines. You can't miss, because Petri took time to bring you good wine. And now, Dr. Watton, what story do you have lined up for us next week? Well, now, let me see, Mr. Foreman. I'm going to tell you about, uh, about a strange adventure that began by my taking a wild cab ride through the moonlit streets of London and ended Holmes and me being trapped in a luxuriously furnished cellar below a furniture warehouse down by the waterfront. <laughs> Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is based on an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventure of Shoscombe Old Place. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Oh, the Petri family took the time to bring you such good wine. So when you eat and when you cook, remember Petri wine. To make good food taste better, remember... Pet, Pet, Petri. This is Bill Foreman saying goodnight for the Petri family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Doc Watson tell about another exciting adventure he shared with that master detective, his old friend Sherlock Holmes. And say, I want to tell you about a little present I've got for you. Uh Uh-huh, a present and it's free. It's a swell recipe calendar printed in full color and it's good for two years, 1945 and 46. But best of all, this calendar not only gives you the dates, it gives you loads of swell recipes and ideas for cooking with Petri wine. Want to know how to make spare ribs that are out of this world? You want to learn a new way to fix liver and onions, a swell way to make soup more delicious than ever. 
It's a cinch with this calendar handy in your kitchen to tell you how. In fact, this calendar tells you all you ought to know about wine. And remember, it's free. Just write to Petri Wine, P-E-T-R-I, Petri Wine, San Francisco 26, California. Petri Wine, San Francisco 26, California. We'll send you your swell recipe calendar immediately. And now for our weekly visit with the genial Dr. Watson. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Mr. Foreman. Come in and settle yourself down. Thank you. You're looking particularly comfortable tonight, Doctor. Feet up on the sofa and the puppies asleep on your lap. Yes, my boy. The three of us went for a long walk on the beach this afternoon. Monty and Winnie had a running battle with the seagulls. In consequence, they've been fast asleep ever since we got home. Well, I hope you're not too tired, Doctor. I'm counting on a new Sherlock Holmes story, you know. No, no, no. I'm all ready for you, Mr. Foreman. In fact, I was going through my notes on the case just before you arrived. Well, last week you told us it concerned a strange society who held their meetings in an underground vault of a furniture warehouse. Yeah, that's right, my boy. Now, down, Winnie. Now, get down, Monty. No, 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 no. no. Shoot. Down, 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 down. The story really began one stormy November night in 1887. I was married at the time and living away from Baker Street. On this night in question, my wife had already gone to bed and I was nodding in front of the fire over one of Clark Russell's fine sea stories. I'd had a very tiring day, I remember. It was about the hour that a man gives his first yawn and glances at the clock. When suddenly, my front doorbell jangled discordantly. Oh, our servant Edna had gone up to bed, so I crossed to the window and opened it. It was uh, very dark, but I could just see the outline of a figure standing on my doorstep. It looked like a woman. Suddenly, a, a cultivated voice called up to me. Is the doctor in? Uh, yes, madam. Uh, I'm the doctor. Then please come at once. It's a matter of life and death. I have a carriage waiting. Gracious me. Oh, all right, all right. I'll, I'll be down immediately. I closed the window, scribbled a note to my wife, grabbed my coat and hat and my bag, and a few minutes later I stepped out of the front door and closed it behind me. The carriage was standing at the curb, but I couldn't see any trace of the lady who'd called me. The only person in sight was an old and repulsive looking bigger woman, dressed in rags and tatters. After a moment of bewilderment, I spoke. Uh, my, my good one, did you see a lady leave here a moment ago? No, doctor, she didn't leave. She's still waiting for you. Oh, oh. oh forgive me, madam, but, uh, <laughs> clothes are yours. I, I thought you were a beggar woman. There isn't any time to discuss that now. Please get in this carriage. Oh, but, uh, where, where's the driver? I'm going to drive. Please get in. Oh, very well, very well. It's only business. Uh... Are you sure that you can handle those horses, madam? Of course I can. Well, you should tell me the way you're, you're driving, ma'am. Please don't ask me any more questions, doctor. You'll find out soon enough. Thank heavens we've finally reached our destination. Must have driven halfway across London. Hello, hello. Must be somewhere down near the river. No dwelling places here. Nothing but enormous warehouses. Uh, why have we stopped here, madam? Well, this is where we're going. Please follow me down these steps. I wish you'd tell me where you're taking me. We have a, a club here in the basement. You'll see for yourself in a moment. Oh, it's a very solid-looking door. How do you propose to get past it? I'll show you. Oh, it must be a very secret club of yours, madam. It is, Doc. Who knocks? Number seven. Give the password. To the lanterns. You may enter. Follow me, Doctor. Madam, I do wish you'd tell me where you're taking me. This looks like the entrance to an opium den or a thieves' kitchen. 
Don't worry, Doctor. You're in no danger. There. Does that look like a thieves' kitchen? Great Scott, I don't believe my eyes. A luxuriously furnished room. What a strange collection of people. Some look like beggars. Others in full evening dress. Amazing. Uh, number seven. Who is this man? He's a doctor. I went to fetch him. I thought I said there would be no strangers inside Now look here, here, my good man. I've been extremely patient, but my temper's beginning to wear a little thin. Either let me see your patient at once or show me out. My time's valuable and I don't propose to waste it. I'm sorry, doctor. Where is Julian? He's in the back room. And if you know what's good for you, doctor, whatever you call yourself, you'll forget everything you see in here. Stop threatening me, sir. I'm not the least interested in your blasted club. Just take me to the patient. Ah, uh, this is the man we want you to examine, Doctor. No? What happened? He fell down the stairs leading into the club room. Well, why'd you move him? We wanted him to be comfortable. It's the worst thing in the world you could have done. Never, never move a person with an injured skull. Is he... Is he going to be all right, Doctor? No, madam, I'm afraid he isn't. His neck's broken. He's dead. Huh? Julian, dead. You sure of that, Doctor? Of course I'm sure of it, my man. I'm afraid you need an undertaker, not a doctor. We must tell the others. All right, quiet, everybody. Quiet. Quiet. Uh, Julian is dead. Ju Julian? Julian dead? Oh, this is terrible. Who is this man? He's a doctor. We better get him out of here at once. We don't want any strangers nosing about. That's Quite right. Though. Shouldn't have brought him here anyway. Now, just a minute, just a minute. I assure you, ladies and gentlemen, I have the slightest desire to stay here one moment longer. If you direct me to the door again, madam, I'll try to find a cab myself in this godforsaken district and go home. Show him out and give him his money. Follow me, please. I'm delighted to. Do you mind if I don't drive you home, doctor? Oh, well, uh, no, I should prefer it. My nerves aren't uh, in the best of shape. You mustn't be angry with me, doctor, please. Leaving again, number seven. No, but this gentleman is. Will you see if you can find a cab for him? Right. To whom shall I send in my bill, madam? Oh, here's a five-pound note. That should cover your time and trouble, shouldn't it? No, no, no. no. It's, it's far too much. Adam. No, I Doctor. It's late at night and it hasn't a very pleasant case for you. Please take it. Oh, it's kind of you. Very generous indeed. But by the way, uh, uh, how did you happen to, to come to me in, in the first place? Well, I was driving about looking for a doctor and a policeman directed me to your house. Oh, I see. I have found a cab for you. Well, uh, thank you, my man. Thank you. Oh, Doctor. May I come round in the morning... For a death certificate. Of course, of course. You remember my address? Yes, but I don't know your name. Uh, Watson. Uh, Dr. Watson. Dr. Watson? Not, not the Dr. Watson who's associated with Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> that is that is that you know of me. <laughs> Good night, Doctor. And please forget about everything you've seen. So, what an amazing business. Holmes will be interested to hear about this. And that's the way it was, Holmes. One of the most curious adventures I ever had without you. Very interesting, Watson. You say this underground cellar was luxuriously mm. furnished. Yes, and the people there were an amazing mixture. Some were in rags and some in evening dress. Huh, like the nursery rhyme, eh? Some in rags and some in tags and some in velvet gowns. Exactly. In the feeling that I was taking part in a story out of the Arabian Nights. I must say, though, I was pretty angry at the time. However, after a good night's rest, I, I feel quite differently this morning. But I thought I'd just drop round and tell you all about it. I'm glad you did, my dear fellow. It would be interesting to see if any repercussions of your strange adventure reaches. Oh, I doubt it. The woman seemed frightened to death when I mentioned your name. We shall see. Meanwhile, I'm expecting a client. You're not too busy. Perhaps you can stay. No, I'd like to very much. Uh, who is it? You this know? telegram will tell you much more than I can. Arrived an hour ago. Mm, let's have a look. Be at your lodgings this morning to discuss our problem. Signed, AMS. <laughs> Pretty high-handed message. Be at your lodgings. Oh, please. <laughs> what do you suppose AMS stands for? I was just toying with that problem when you arrived. Could it be the uh, American 
medical school? No, no, there's no such body. It's the American Medical Association. Oh, yes, 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 yes. The imperious yes, yes. Uh, tone of the message inclines me to believe that the A stands for amateur. Very possibly. Amateur Masker Society. Or uh, the amateur murderers. <laughs> that, uh, that would be a nice thought, wouldn't it? Mm. Ah. As their representative now, no doubt, to save us further guesswork. Holmes, it looks like the same carriage that I drove in last night. The girl standing on your doorstep dressed in the height of fashion. Mrs. Hudson turning her in. Splendid. It seems that we have not heard the end of your adventure. Go and meet the lady at the top of the stairs, will you, old chap, and save Mrs. Hudson's legs. Right, you are, Holmes. Thank you, Mrs. Hudson. Thank you. All right, uh, come in, madam. Want to come in? Thank you, Dr. Watson. Mrs. Sherlock Holmes. At your service, madam. Won't you, uh, won't you sit down? I'm Lady Dorothy Brownlee. It's your voice. You're the lady who fetched me last night, uh, dressed up as, as a beggar woman. Yes, I am, Dr. Watson. Forgive me for being so mysterious at the time. <laughs> Doubtless you have come to consult me regarding last night's unfortunate accident at the Amateur Mendicant Society. How did you know what the initials stood for, Mr. Holmes? Well, after hearing Dr. Watson's story of last night's happenings, the, uh, connotation seemed obvious. Am I right? Perfectly. Last night, when Dr. Watson told us Jim was dead, we thought it was an accident. And now you think it is, uh, murder, eh? Lady Bromley, if you expect my help, there must be no more mystery. Just what is this amateur mendicant society? I'm afraid it'll be a little hard for you to understand our motives. We're a group of people, rather wealthy people, I suppose, who find pleasure in deliberately leading a seamy life disguised as beggars. We use the basement that you were in last night, Doctor, as our headquarters. We keep our beggars there and change out of them before we go home. Mm, what a fantastic idea. What a futile, worthless of spending your leisure time, Lady Bromley. I suppose <laughs> it must seem so, Mr. Holmes. But we are curious to learn how the other half lives. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's a certain thrill in rubbing shoulders with the police. At least we do some good. Indeed. I should be interested to learn how. All the money we make the beggars, we give to charity. Oh, do you really? And you feel that this gesture on your part absolves you from any responsibility to the real beggars whose livelihood you are impairing. I hadn't thought of it just like that. No. Then I suppose you won't want to help us. Oh, that's quite another matter, madam. As a professional detective, I cannot afford to be a moralist. Yes, I will investigate this case for you, though I warn you my fee will be an extremely high one. Money isn't important, Mr. Holmes, as long as we can solve Julian's death without bringing the police into the case. Lady Brownlee... Who is the dead man? The man you refer to as Julian? Julian Trapper, the poet. Oh, he was yes. the one who started our society. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think I've read some of his work. Decadent. Distinctly decadent. Well, what makes you think that he was murdered, Lady Browner? Well, after you left last night, Dr. Watson, there was a terrible scene. You remember Sidney Holt? Oh, was he the big fellow who was so unpleasant to him? Yes, that's the one. Oh, do I remember him? <laughs> he said that he saw Lord Cecil deliberately trip Julian as he came to the head of the staircase. Oh, Lord Cecil being, uh... Lord Cecil Deerenforth, son of the Earl of Mersham. Oh, yes. And there was a bitter argument. Cecil accused Sidney of doing the same thing. Then they had a dreadful fight. And it ended up with Cecil threatening to go to the police. So that's when we decided to send a telegram to you. Oh, yes, yes, I see. So the proof of murder depends on such flimsy evidence as to whether the dead man fell or, well, should we say, uh, was pushed? <laughs> what it seems like. Mr. Holmes... Even though you don't approve, please help us, won't you? Yes, Lady Brownlee, I will. Then you come back with me now to our headquarters. I shall join you in the hour. In the meantime, my old friend Dr. Watson can go with you. But Holmes, what can I do without you? You know my methods, old chap. Act accordingly. Oh, very well, Mr. Holmes. But you promise you'll be there? I promise you that I will be there, madam. Thank you so much, Mr. Holmes. We'll be expecting you. Come on, Doctor. Well, I'll, I'll just get my hat and coat. Holmes, what are you up to? Go with her and ask no more questions. I shall join you within the hour. Holmes, there's a glint in your eye. I don't think you, you believe the story. Of course I don't, Watson. Well, then what? Then go with it, old fellow, and keep your wits about you. The game's afoot. The story of the Amateur Mendicant Society will continue in just a few seconds. Time I'd like to use to remind you that you're really missing something until you try having wine with your dinner. And I mean a Petri wine. Let's say a Petri California Burgundy or a Petri California Sauterne. Both wines are just made to make good food taste better. If you like a red wine, try Petri Burgundy. Try it with hamburger, with stew, with any meat or meat dish. 
And if you like a delicious white wine, a wine that'll make chicken taste better than ever, try a well-chilled Petri Sautern. With food, nothing can take the place of a good Petri wine. And now back to tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure. The Amateur Mendicant Society, a group of wealthy eccentrics who pose as beggars, have come to Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson with a problem. One of their members has apparently been murdered, and the famous pair have been asked to investigate the killing. As we rejoin our story, Dr. Watson, still awaiting the arrival of the great detective, is cross-questioning three of the members at the headquarters of this unusual society. I'm afraid I don't find your story very convincing. Oh, don't you now? Well, then suppose you stop asking questions until Sherlock Holmes gets here. He's the man who engaged to settle this business, not you. We're paying for his services, not those of his assistant. Uh, Mr. Holmes asked me to conduct this preliminary investigation, my good man. I'm perfectly familiar with his methods. So keep a civil tongue in your head if you want us to continue with this case. Well, I'm not answering any more questions till he gets here. Stop, uh, uh, Lord Cecil, you say that you saw Holt deliberately trip the dead man as he came down the stairs last night. Yes, I did. Well, uh, where were you standing, sir? At the head of the staircase. Holt was beside me, and as Julian came by, he deliberately... Excuse me, please. Excuse me, number 11. Excuse uh, me. What is it? There is a strange man just come in. He is dressed as you when you work, but I do not remember to have seen him here before. He speak very rough. Mm. Did he give the correct signal? Yes, and the password. He must be a new member. I suppose we better see him. Bring him in. Oh, bad time for him to come here, can't I? Come this way, please. Tommy, what a nice place you got here. Yeah, what a nice place. Certainly do yourselves proud, don't you? Who are you, and how did you get in here? I'll give you a signal in the password, just like Julian told me to. Are you a friend of Julian? Of course I am. You got me to meet him here today. Who are you, really? Are we all friends here? Yes, you can talk freely. And permit me to introduce myself. I am Don Luis Jose Fernando de las Torres at your service. Why? Why do you want to join us? When Julian tell me about it, uh, well, it uh, tickled my, how you say, uh, my funny bone? <laughs> It is a so charming idea to see all those of mendicancy. Huh. I suppose he's all right. Of course I'm all right. Now, where is Julian, please? He will uh, vouch for me. He's in the other room. He had an accident. An accident? Not a bad one, I hope. A very bad one. Dr. Watson, you better take him in there and break the news to him. Uh, well, well uh, follow me, sir. This is terrible. Please tell me what happened, Doctor. I'm afraid you must prepare yourself for a shock, sir. Your friend is dead. His neck was broken last night in some brawl. Yes, except that I do believe it was an accident, Watson. Holmes! Chiquado, Chiquado. But not quietly enough, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Come on, come back to the others and let all take a look at you. Come on, get moving, both of you. This isn't a pop gun in my hands. Oh, sorry, Holmes, I gave the whole thing away. That's all right, old chap. Oh, Cecil, Dorothy, yes. come here. I want you to take a look at the great Sherlock Holmes. Walked into our trap just like any stupid policeman. No, I had to dress up to do it, though, Mr. Holmes. We were waiting for you here anyway, you know. Oh, I was well aware of that, Mr. Holt. You see, I knew I was walking into a trap. How did you know that, Mr. Holmes? Lady Brownlee, the story you brought to us today was so obviously a false one. Just as there is no amateur mendicant society. Who are they, Holmes? Go ahead, Mr. Holmes. Tell him. Let's see how much you really do know. Yes, yes. go ahead. Huh. Why should I tell you what you already know? Go on, talk, if you know what's good for you. Oh, you're so persuasive, aren't you, Mr. Holt? Very well. Undoubtedly, Julian Trevor's death last night was an accident. You fetched the doctor, Lady Brownlee, a very natural move, and later discovered that the doctor in question was the old friend of Sherlock Holmes. Hmm. You were all afraid that I would become interested in your unusual society, and so you invented that very thin story about the accident being a murder. You want to lure me here so that I could be disposed of, and you could all continue your nefarious works without hindrance. Huh. Well, now aren't we clever? What is our nefarious work, may I ask? Your password gave me a clue to the lanterns. Try the French revolutionists. They strung the aristocrats up on the lampposts. Then again, the combination of Various costumes and a luxurious establishment in a low-class area posed another question. What political belief provides a common meeting ground for misguided aristocrats and dangerous commoners? And how did you answer that question? Oh, very simple, my dear sir. One word. Nihilism. Its doctrine of assassination and over of government would find every chance of being put into practice 
by all of you at the forthcoming Jubilee celebrations to be held here in London. And also would account uh, for your beggar's clothes. A beggar would have greater freedom of movement in a crowd than an ordinary person. You're a clever man, Mr. Holmes. Too bad you'll have to die. I'll get the rope. What are you going to do with him? Do? Give him a first-hand taste of nihilism, of course. He can't live. They know too much. Well, you can't possibly do this, you know. The police will track us here. By the time the police get here, you and your friend Holmes will be blown to kingdom come. Here's the rope, Sidney. Oh, right. Hands together, Mr. Holmes. That's it. Ah! Oh, mind that bandit wrist of mine, will you? It's confounded us all. Oh, isn't that a shame now? Is this any better? Ooh. Tie up the doctor, Cecil, while I bind Holmes' legs. With pleasure. I can't go through with this. Green Dorothy, you can't go through with it. I don't... can't stand by and see two innocent men murdered. Don't be a fool, Dorothy. We can't let them live. They know too much. I don't care. If you go on with this, I'm going out for the police. Are you fool. Oh. Tie her up as well, Cecil. Leave me alone. Sit down there beside him. Go on. <laughs> You're a devil. Oh, you? shut up. Now, Mr. Holmes, I'm going to fetch a little invention. A little invention I'm sure you'll be interested in. Mr. Holmes, it's a pity you and your friend didn't learn to mind your own business. I'm afraid it's too late to teach an old dog new tricks. It's too late now, at any rate. Quite comfortable, Dr. Watson? Don't you speak to me, sir. You're a filthy traitor to your country. Oh, rubbish. Here we are. Example of Mikhail Petrov's mechanical genius. This bomb will blow the entire building sky high. And the three of you with it. Now, I wind the time clock so. And we'll set the fuse to go off in in five minutes. It'll give us plenty of time to get away. So. Come on, Sidney, let's get out of here. Right. <laughs> Charming picture. Three of you bound hand and foot sitting beside each other on the sofa. <laughs> well, ta-da, Dorothy. Think of our cause during the five minutes. <laughs> and as for you, Mr. Holmes, and your friend, good riddance to bad rubbish. <laughs> well, Holmes, this looks like well, the well, end. Wait so, old chap. <laughs> I blame myself. I hadn't been so infernally noisy when I recognized you. We would be in this mess. Wasn't your fault, old fellow. I think they suspected me anyway. I must say, it seemed to me that you told them a great deal more than was necessary about your suspicions. Surely you could pretend it ignorant. Oh, I suppose I could have done. I can't die yet. I'm not ready to courage, die. Courage, Brownlee, courage. And by the way, was I right in assuming that your associates are nihilists? Of course they are. They're planning to assassinate the Prime Minister. During the Jubilee celebration. Prime Minister, great heavens, Holmes, we've got to get free. Assuming some miracle happened, we did get free, and your former associates were arraigned in court. Would you testify against them? Oh, of course I would. But what chance is there of that? That plot, that devilish plot, why doesn't it? <laughs> it bothers you that much, Lady Barney, I'll stop it for you. Holmes, your hands are free. Of course they are, my dear fellow. Bandaged wrist I mentioned just now concealed a razor-edged blade. I cut through the ropes almost before our friends had left the room. But then... Why did you keep us in the suspense, Mr. Holmes? I wanted to be quite sure that you'd testify in the forthcoming file, madam. There we are. That renders the bar harmless. Ah! Uh -huh. And that means that the police have sprung the trap that I set for your associates, Lady Brownlee. It's lucky for you that you uh, had a change of heart and prevented you from leaving us. Oh, Mr. Holmes, how could I ever thank you? Holmes, you had the place surrounded with police when you came in here. Of course I did, my dear fellow. Yeah, you can do your ropes. No wonder you were so calm. No wonder you told them so much. You wanted them to show their hands. Precisely, old fellow. And they obliged me most satisfactorily. They attempted our triple murder. They are self-confessed anarchists. And with the evidence of Lady Brownie, I'm sure that we can put them where they all belong. Considering it uh, barely noon, I think you'll agree, Watson. That is a very comprehensive morning's work. <laughs> Doctor, tell the truth. Were you scared waiting for that time bomb to go off? Scared, my boy? I was so scared that to this day I can't stand being in the same room with a, a loud ticking clock. Each tick of the clock seems to speak to me. Seems to say, tick tock, this is the end. Tick tock, this is the end. The clock ever speak to you like this? Well, yes, Doctor. How did you know? Well, what's the clock say to you? Tick tock. Petri took time to bring you good wine. Petri took time to bring you good oh, wine. Precious me, Mr. Foreman. You listen to your clock and I'll listen to mine. 
Gosh, Doctor, can I help it if I like to hear about Petri wine? After all, that Petri family really knows how to make good wine. And it's no wonder. They've been making wine ever since they started the Petri business generations ago, way back in the 1800s. And because the making of Petri wine is a family affair, well, they've been able to hand on down from father to son, from father to son, the skill and experience of each preceding generation. So naturally, when it comes to turning luscious, sun-ripened grapes into fragrant, delicious wine, well, you just can't beat the Petri family. Because Petri took time to bring you good wine. And say, don't forget to take time to send for your Petri recipe calendar. It's free. Just write to Petri Wine, P-E-T-R-I, Petri Wine, San Francisco 26, California. San Francisco 26, California. This offer is intended to apply only in those states and other localities where its acceptance is permissible by law and regulation. And now, Dr. Watson, what adventure are you planning to tell us next week? Well, next week, Mr. Foreman, I'm going to tell you a story of old Vienna. The Vienna of sparkling lights, beautiful women, and lilting music. And of an extraordinary murder that takes place to the accompaniment of a Mozart sonata. Boy, that sounds like a thriller. I'll see you for sure next week. Oh, uh, oh just a minute. Before I go, Mr. Foreman, I want to urge every registered nurse listening in to get all the facts about the Army Nurse Corps. The army needs you, nurses, needs you desperately. They'll make you an officer at once and give you every chance to further your post-war careers. So if you're a registered nurse under 45, call at your local Red Cross chapter and get all the details. Or wire collect to the Surgeon General, U.S. Army, Washington, D.C. And if you can't qualify for the nurses' call, see if you can't get into essential civilian nursing so that you can release a nurse who does qualify. But do something about it first thing tomorrow. Won't you? Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is based on an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Five Orange Pips. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine... Invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell about another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective Sherlock Holmes. And say, I want to ask you if you've sent in for that little present we've got for you. You know, that swell recipe calendar? It's free, of course, and it's really something. It's a two-year calendar for 1945 and 46, and it's beautifully done in full color. But the best part of it is that it's jammed with recipes and ideas for cooking with Petri wine. Send for your free recipe calendar tonight. Just send your name and address to Petri Wine. P-E-T-R-I, Petri Wine, San Francisco 26, California. San Francisco 26, California. The requests for this swell calendar have been coming in so fast that you better hurry up and get yours before we get snowed under. Write tonight and we'll send you your free recipe calendar at once. And now for our weekly visit with the good Dr. Watson. Let's see if he's waiting for us. Come in. Come in. Good evening, Mr. Fox. Oh, good evening, Doctor. Playing the phonograph, I see. Yes, my boy. And that particular melody has very potent memories for me. Here, I'll, I'll turn the thing off. You haven't come here to listen to a most sonata. You want a story, don't you, young fellow, my lad? That's right, Doctor. Well, let's sit down. Uh, All right. That's better. Now I'll, now I'll tell you what. Oh, thank you, Doctor. It began in Vienna in 1889, many, many years before the insane house painter named Schickel Gruber had converted that gay city into a place of fear and oppression. And uh, what were you and Sherlock Holmes doing there, Doctor? Just... Uh, taking a trip? Mr. Foreman, in those early days of our association, we didn't have the time or the money for just uh, for taking trips. No, 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 we were in Vienna because Holmes had been engaged in certain highly important investigations. We were staying in a charming little pension 
inhabited by students and musicians. And on the night the story began, we'd finished dinner and had returned to our room. I was busy making some notes on the investigation we'd just concluded. And Holmes was scraping away at his beloved violin. What's wrong? Why can't I get it? Oh, it sounds, sounds very pretty to me. Pretty, really, old chap. Ah, mm-hmm. an amateur. Mm-hmm. A happy fingered one at that. Listen to this. Mm-hmm. Oh, sounds like a fiddler at an Irish wake. Oh, take it easy, Holmes. Take it easy. There's no need to fling the violin down like that. What's no, old chap? Why, with all your other excellent qualities, are you not a pianist? What's the piano got to do with it? In this case, everything. There's a piano in this room, and if you could play it, the Mozart sonata I'm struggling with might have some meaning. Come in. Oh, good evening, Fräulein. You wish to see me? You are Herr Sherlock Holmes. That is my name. Then, yeah, I wish to see you. I'm Leo Ullenstein. I live here in this pension. How do you do? Uh, this is my friend, Dr. Watson. How do you do, Herr Doctor? Oh, uh, glad to meet you, my dear. Fräulein Ullenstein, uh, may I pay my tribute to the brilliance of your piano playing? You have the exact precision of phrasing that Mozart demands. How do you know me? Well, Dr. Watson and I were at the command performance you gave at the Imperial Court a fortnight ago. I hate you, yes, I knew I'd seen you somewhere before. <laughs> uh, my friend was just expressing the need of a pianist as you walked in, young lady. Perhaps the... Oh, I'm sorry. Of you... I do not play with amateur. Amateur? Well, really? Well, I do not mean to be rude. It's just that my life is dedicated to my professional oh, career. I quite understand, well, Fräulein. And now please tell me, uh, what can I do to help you? I must presume you have come to see me in my professional best. Yeah, well, that is correct, Herr Holmes. Though I realize to a great detective like you, my problem must seem quite trivial. I... I'm being blackmailed by a man in this pension. <laughs> he is Shandor Orhardi, a Hungarian painter who lives in the studio upstairs. Shandor Orhardi? Yes, I think I've heard of him. Since two months now, ever since he know my secret, he's come to me for money, and today he tells me he must have 250 gulden. Or he will go to the police. I have not that much money. Herr Holmes, please to tell me what I shall do. Just what hold does he have over you? My brother, Carl, he got into some trouble here, and the police were looking for him. But he ran away to München, uh, as you say, Munich, and Thunder our party knew of this. He was a friend of mine, so I thought. When this trouble came on my brother, I turned to Shandor for help. He smuggled Carl to the country, and he turned on me for blackmail. He's a bad man. I wish he was dead. Most black is a coward at heart. I think Dr. Watson and I will call on the gentleman. By the way, does he have any written evidence of your brother's crime? Yeah, he has his address in Munich. I show Shandor a letter from him when he first go there, and he keep the letter. will not give it back to me. And if he gave the police your brother's address, they'd, uh, they'd arrest him, eh? They would, of course. Yes, of course. Here, Holmes, will you please to tell me what I should do? I cannot go on this way. My... My music now, is... Now, Pauline, simply... calm yourself. I shall be most happy to help you, and uh, if you will lead the way, we'll see how persuasive we can be with Shandor Apadi. That is the studio here, Holmes, at the end of the corridor. I see. Now, remember, young lady, you'd better let me do most of the talking. He must be out. That is possible. Ah, locked. I think bearing in mind our party's profession, we'll take the liberty of opening his door. That doesn't look a very complicated lock to me. No, I think this skeleton key will do the trick. It's very dangerous here, Holmes. If Shandor finds you... No, 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 no. Don't worry about that, Fraulein. We're perfectly capable of of taking care of ourselves. Uh Ah, there we are. Close the door behind you, will you, Watson? Can't see a thing. I'll strike a match. Oh, oh him. Quick, Scott, look at him. Thumped over his desk. Light the gas, will you, Watson? Light your home. There. Judging from his appearance, Fräulein Ullenstein, I think Sandor Pari had other enemies besides yourself. Less scrupulous enemies. He's been strangled. Look at the finger marks on his throat. Is he? Yes. 
body is still warm, though. I'm afraid he's dead. I am glad. He was a bad man. He deserved to die. Watson, do you notice that the fingers of the killer have broken the skin and drawn blood? Oh, yes, yes, yes. So they have. Should we not communicate with the police? Before we do that, Pauline, we must see if we can find your brother's letter. Help me move the body, will you, Watson? Lying across an open dispatch box that might contain the document in question. All right, John. Come on, Mother. Oh, that's... Ah. For ah. a painter, the late Mr. Apardi was an unusually methodical man. Everything filed here in alphabetical order. Here we are. Ooh, four line. They are Ullstein. Yeah. And the letter has the Munich postmark. Oh. I think this must be the doc in question. Will you examine it, please, Fraulein? Yeah. Yeah, this is the letter. Hey, Holmes, how can I thank you? There's very little thank me for. If the blackmail were still alive, I fear it uh, wouldn't have been so simple a matter. I wonder what other treasures this box contains. Hello. Hello. What is it, Holmes? Interesting. Extremely interesting. Look at this, old fellow. Good Lord. Information on the case that we've just been working on. Exactly. And from the names attached to the document, I think we may assume that the dead man did not confine his blackmailing to struggling young pianists. He was after big game, too. Yes, we'd better be careful, Holmes. I don't think that we should go for the police just yet. No. We'll start by having a little talk with the other residents of this pension. Fraulein, who lives in the room adjoining this one? I do, Herr Holmes. And the room across the landing? Lai Chong Fo, the great Chinese actor, he's... Forming here, Vienna. I see. Then I think we'll start by calling on him. Return to your room, Fraulein, and we will let you know later what we've found. In the meantime, say nothing to anyone of what has happened. You do everything you tell me, Herr Holmes. And please, once again, please let me thank you for what you've done for me. You know, Holmes, I'm not sure that girl didn't strangle a party or so. Pianist would have unusual strength in her fingers. And we know that she had the, the motive. And look how unnaturally calm she was when she realized the man was dead. I disagree with you, old fellow. Huh? I think what you refer to as unnatural calmness is really the cold detachment of the two artists. Well, I have a feeling that we should keep an eye on her, just the same. We will, Watson, we will. And now I suggest fair visit across the landing to the distinguished Chinese actor, Mr. Ling Tu Fo. <laughs> Yes, please. You wish to see me? If you could spare us a moment, sir. But of course, gentlemen. Uh, please to come in. My name is Sherlock Holmes. This is my colleague, Dr. Watson. Uh, how, how do you do, do, sir? How do you do? I am greatly flattered to meet you. Uh, you are not here to see me in your professional capacity, I hope, Mr. Holmes? Oh, no, not exactly. I just wanted to ask you a few questions. Uh, please, to ask me anything. Do you know Shandora Paddy, the painter who lives across the hall? I, uh, I uh, know him by sight. Uh, we now do each other on the stairs, not more. I see. Have you been in your room most of the evening, may I ask? But yes, I have been sitting here quietly for the past few hours, reading over the annex of Confucius. No, Confucius. Uh, may I ask, sir, whether you've heard any unusual noises this evening? Sounds of a struggle or a cry from the direction of Sandor Pardi's room, for instance? I, uh, I uh, do not think so. Wait, yes, yes. I think I did hear laced voices in there and the sound of a cry. About how long ago was this? Oh, an hour ago, perhaps more. Is uh, anything wrong? Has the trouble come to Shandor? Shandor? I thought you said you were uh, only a nodding acquaintance with the gentleman. He is uh, a well-known actor. It is only natural I should call him by his first name, Mr. Holmes, even though I do not know him. Uh, has something happened to him? I'm afraid so, but I can't tell you any more about it at the moment. Thank you for your cooperation. We shall see you again, no doubt. Good evening, sir. Good evening, gentlemen. Good, uh, good, evening. good evening, good evening, good evening. Uh, that fellow wasn't telling us the truth, you know, Holmes. He seemed to shift it to me. Well, where are we going now? Downstairs to the porter's desk. There's only one entrance to this house, you'll remember. The porter may be able to tell us of uh, any unusual comings and goings in the last hour or two. Come on, old chap, don't dawdle. There's a great deal of work ahead of us. Herr Holmes, what can I do for you? How long have you been on duty tonight? Uh, since five o'clock. Did you notice what people have come in or gone out since then? No one has gone out. Ah, splendid. And who came in? Fräulein Ullenstein came in just after six, oh, yes. and uh, Herr Appadi, the painter, came in a few minutes later. That is all. Ah. 
Who lives in the other ground floor apartments besides Dr. Watson and myself? There are only two other apartments. In the one to the right of the corridor lives uh, Madame Janssen. She's a Swedish lady, mm-hmm. a sculptor. And in the other? Signora Violetti, the Italian opera singer. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm much obliged to you. I'm happy to be of service here, home. Uh, where are we off now? Back, back to our room? Oh, we'll call on Madame Violetti if she's at home. Oh, it sounds as if she's very much at home. Oh, Signor Sherlock Holmes, that is a friend of a come to see me. Bravo, bravissimo. I have so much wish to make her acquaintance. Sit down, sit down. Oh, no, I'm afraid we can only stay for a moment, madam. My, my friend wanted to ask you a few questions. Yes, Signora. I just want to know... I know if... your question. Oh. You play the violin. I have heard you. Yes. You want to know whether the great Valeria will allow you to accompany her in a magnificent soprano aria, a so from a Mozart's Ile Flot Magico. <laughs> the Olatis answer to your question is a C.C. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, me, Signora, but uh, if you don't mind... <laughs> Uh, 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 but that was not one of my questions. It was not. But I will sting it with just this same. Flatter me, but um, at the moment there are other things on my mind. Signora Violetti, do you know Shandora Paddy? Mm, by his side, that is all. He may cry at me, but I know pay attention. I do not like Hungarian. You haven't seen him this evening? No. I've been alone reviewing the score at La Troviata. Uh, uh, yes. I am to sing it next week here in Vienna. Yes. I hope you will both be present. It would be a great treat yes, for I'm you. I'm sure it would be, Signora. Oh, now, you will excuse us. Oh, it is sad you must go so soon. But come and see me again, and I will sing for you both before you leave Vienna. <laughs> Great Scott, what a ghastly woman. She, she's not your murderess, I'm sure. And now I suppose we'll have to question this sculptress woman. And then we'll have talked to everyone in the house. No, I think before we visit her, we'll examine the dead man's room a little more closely. That black tin dispatch box may hold the key to this mystery. <laughs> Numbskull. Why didn't I go through these papers thoroughly at first? Uh, they, tell, they tell an interesting story. A party had obviously been blackmailing Madame Janssen, the, the sculptor. Yes, and also our friend, the Chinese actor, Lai Tung Fo. Then Lai Tung Fo was lying when he said that he didn't know a party. Obviously. By George, three of the four people living in this house in his power. Hello. Uh, uh, what's the matter? What have you found? Footprints in the cigar ash on the carpet. Prints of a small foot. Leading us to this closet. Somebody must have been hiding in there. Yes, possibly. Uh huh. Take a look at these, Watson. Strands of hair. Long black hair. Where were they? On a hook in the cupboard. Someone bracing themselves back so as to be out of sight could easily leave such evidence. I've got it, Holmes. I've got it. The long black hair, the long nails that caused the peculiar mark upon his throat, and the small footprint. It was a woman. Say, but which one? Fräulein Ullenstein and Signora Violetti both have hand hair, remember? And it must be that sculptor's woman. Not necessarily. Who else, not a woman, might have small feet, long nails, and long black hair? By Jove, the Chinese actress. Come on. I hope he's still there. Come on, let's go in. Holmes, look at him. He's praying. His head's in his hands. Oh, my dear fellow, I'm afraid prayers can do him no good now. He's been strangled. Strangled with his own cue. <laughs> Dr. Watson's story will continue in just a second. So I'm going to take that second for a fast question. I know you've probably tasted port wine, but have you ever tasted Petri California port? Have you? Because if you haven't tried Petri port, well, you can just tell yourself right now you don't know how good a port can be. 
Petri Port is rich, red, and hearty. But what you want to know is how does it taste? The answer to that is short and sweet. The taste is terrific. And say, Petri California Muscatel is on the terrific side, too. Petri Muscatel has the flavor and fragrance of real juicy muscat grape. Mm-hmm. Both wines are perfect after dinner or any time you're sitting around talking with your friend. Try them. They're great. They've got to be because they're Petri. <laughs> And now back to tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure. The famous pair are staying in Vienna, where they've become involved in the mysterious strangling of a notorious blackmailer. As we rejoin our story, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson are cross-questioning another of the suspects, a Swedish sculptress by the name of Madame Young. What do you want with me? Why have you come in here? Well, we just wanted to ask you a few questions, madam. To admire your figurines, may I ask if you always work in clay? Yeah, but what's that to you? Do you wish to buy some of my sculpture? Uh, no, but I assure you the question was pertinent. Tell me who you are and stop wasting my time. Uh, my friend is a private detective, madam. A detective? Who sent you here? No one sent me here. I'm conducting an investigation of the murder of Shandor Paddy. Shandor dead? Mm-hmm. Good. I'm glad. Yes, madam, but we happen to know that you had a motive for killing him. He'd been blackmailing you. Get out of here! What right have you to come here and question me? No, 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 no. Look here, madam. If you know what's good for you, you will answer our question. And if you know what's good for you, you'll get out of here, both of you. Come along, Watson. But, Holmes, you can't possibly... Forgive me, madam, for our intrusion. We meant no rudeness. You have been rude. Intolerably rude. Go away. Whatever made you back down like that, Holmes? Obviously, she's the killer. Rubbish. But her hair was jet black. Yes, but it was short hair. And didn't you notice the size of her feet anyway? She works in clay. If it had been marble, I might have suspected her. Pardon my soul, Holmes. I wish you'd tell me what you're driving at. The answer to these killings now, Watson. Hmm? But I'll have to prove it. I'm afraid I must work without you, old chap. Do you mind waiting for me in our room? No, no, no. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. That may be dangerous. Wait for me in Signora Violetti's room, if you don't mm-hmm. mind. I'll join you there as soon as my work is done. Pretend that you have returned because you were so enchanted with her voice. Oh, great Scott Holmes. You can't ask me to be alone with, with that dreadful woman. Please do as I say, Watson, and don't question me. There isn't a moment to be lost. Daria, my dear doctor. No, no, no madam, I'm afraid I don't. You've not heard about great Giuseppe Verdi? What's up, what's up, what's up? Oh, yes, I heard of him, of course, but uh, I can't identify his, his work. <laughs> that was from a Rigoletto, you silly man. Rigoletto? Tom, oh. tell me your favorite composer. I will sing a song of his just for you. I will turn the gas light down. No, 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 no. Turn the gas light down. And that will be so much more romantic. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Now, who is your favorite composer? Well, I don't know that I have any favorite. Uh, uh, what's his name? Va- Wagner's very fine, you know. Oh, Wagner is a hobby like a most of German composers. But oh. the Alatic and the Mastrim. Oh, Lord, here she goes again. Ah! <laughs> Great heavens, it's a Chinese actor. I am sorry to make commotion, but as we say in my country, those who turn from graves speak with double knowledge. Oh, you devil! You devil! I kill you once! I kill you once! I kill you again! Thank you for the confession, Senora Violetti. You can testify to it, Watson. Holmes! Oh, you don't, Senora. Your nails are too sharp for my liking. I will kill you to both of you! I will kill you! Watson, catch her! She's fainted, Holmes. Fainted, eh? What an undramatic exit for a most dramatic lady. Now that 
that you've turned Signora Violetti over to the police, perhaps you'd tell me what made you certain that she was a murderess. It was obvious from the beginning that Pari was strangled by someone with long fingernails. When Leitung Fo was killed, it ruled him out. Then who was the woman with a motive and long nails? Oh, Mr. Let me mention, my dear fellow, was the woman Fraulein Ullenstein? No. Being a concert pianist, her nails were naturally short. The sculptress who worked in clay, again, no. That would make it impossible for her to mould her delicate figurines. Therefore, Signora Violetti, by the process of elimination, was the only woman with long nails. But why did she strangle the Chinese actor, too? Undoubtedly, he witnessed the first killing. The long black hairs in the closet were from his cue. I presume that later he threatened Signora Violetti, and so he himself was strangled. I still don't understand why she strangled our party in the first place. Mr. Watson, I think you'll find that... Uh, been blackmailing her, too. Remember, he had documents incriminating everyone in the house except her. I think uh, we may assume she killed him and then removed her own papers from the dispatch box. But I'd no proof, and so, well, I had to frighten her into confession. So that's why you disguised yourself as Lai Tung Fu. Yes, I borrowed the robes from his room. Lucky that the lights were low as I entered. Yes. And it's also fortunate that to the average European, all Chinese look alike. Come in. Ah, oh, Fräulein Ulstein. We're coming in to see you in a few minutes. Oh, I've been waiting so anxiously. Is everything all right? Well, from your point of view, my, my dear young lady, yes. There's nothing more for you to worry about. Oh, I would like to repay you here, Holmes. I, uh, I've done very little for you, but if you really feel that you owe me something... Yeah? Well, perhaps just this once you wouldn't mind uh, accompanying an amateur. <laughs> it would be a pleasure. What did you wish me to play? A Mozart sonata. But of course. The Rondo from the E-flat, I suppose. Ah, that's huh? splendid. Please, Fräulein. You like Mozart here, Doctor? Oh, uh, very much, young lady, very much. Uh, in fact, uh, I uh, I might say he is my favorite composer. Charming. Perfectly charming. I only wish that, that all our adventures could end so melodiously. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is based on an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, A Case of Identity. Mr. Rathbone appears for the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce for the courtesy of Universal Pictures where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. This is Bill Foreman saying goodnight for the Pet family. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us about another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. Say, and I've got a little something to tell you myself. I want to tell you that if you haven't sent in for your free recipe calendar, I think we've still got enough on hand to take care of you if you hurry. The requests have been pouring in like mad, literally by the thousands. No wonder. It's really a terrific offer. It's a calendar for 1945 and 46. It's in full color, and it tells you all you have to know about cooking with Petri Wine. Write to Petri Wine, P-E-T-R-I, Petri Wine, San Francisco 26, California. San Francisco 26, California. But better hurry so we can get your recipe calendar to you immediately. <laughs> And now let's drop in on our good friend, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Mr. Foreman. Where are the puppies tonight? Well, I I found them playing with a dead seagull, so they've been sent up to bed in disgrace. (laughs) Well, you certainly look comfortable yourself, Doctor. Uh, What's that small blue book you're reading, the latest bestseller? No, 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 indeed not. This book was never a bestseller, my boy. It's entitled Practical Handbook of Bee Culture. With some observations on the segregation of the queen. Quite a catchy title. Who's the author? A fellow by the name of uh, Sherlock Holmes. He was engaged in writing it when the adventure I'm going to tell you 
about took place. Well, you told us last week, Doctor, that a pair of canaries played an important part in the story. That's quite right, Mr. Foreman. It was in the summer of 1908, I remember. And I had persuaded Holmes to leave his Sussex beef farm for a few weeks and to join me in a holiday at the little fishing village of Kingsgate in Kent. We were staying at a charming little inn called the Fisherman's Arms. And for the first few days, our holiday was a delightful one. And then... And then, I suppose, Doctor, strange things began to happen. They did indeed, Mr. Foreman, they did indeed. Very strange things. One afternoon, we'd just finished a late tea, I remember, and we're sitting outside on the lawn sunning ourselves and enjoying our pipe. Holmes lay back with his long, thin fingers clasped behind his head, gazing thoughtfully at the multicolored fishing boat, bobbing at anchor in the harbor. After a moment or two... He spoke to me. What's in your splendid companion? I can't think of anyone else who would let me smoke my pipe in silence for half an hour without asking me what I'm thinking about. That's not very surprising, Holmes, after all the years we've been together. Well, nevertheless, the gift is a rare one, chap, and I appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Willow. Uh, by the way, since the half hour's up, what have you been <laughs> thinking about? A lack of enterprise of a modern criminal. Audacity and romance seem to have passed forever from the criminal world. Read this note I received this morning, old fellow. See for yourself how low I have sunk. Oh, so look. Mr. Holmes, I am staying in the same inn as yourself, and as I have had a very frightening experience, this is me, I thought perhaps you would help me. Please do. It's signed Mary Victor. An exciting document, isn't it? Written on lavender note paper, reeking of perfume, and the handwriting is obviously that of an adolescent girl. You haven't bothered to answer, of course. Oh, yes, I have. I sent a message back by our good landlord that I would be glad to see her. Why, Holmes? You came down here to complete your handbook on bee farming. Oh. Confound it. Those two wretched canaries are getting their sunbath on the windowsill above us. Oh, I think it's rather jolly to hear those fellows chirping away up there. Oh, I find the sound most distracting. Let's go inside. You know, Holmes, those birds are owned by a charming couple, a Mr. and Mrs. Wainwright. I was chatting with them on the stairs this morning. I'm afraid their charm will escape me as long as their pets continue to tweet in that irritating manner. You've spoken of the peace and quiet of the country in, Watson, and yet I find that... Come in. Ah, Miss Mary Victor, I presume. Yes, Mr. Holmes. Please come in and close the door, won't you? Thank you. This is my old friend, Dr. Watson. You may speak quite freely in front of him. How do you do, Miss Victor? How do you do, Doctor? Now, sit down, young lady, and tell me what's troubling you. Mr. Holmes, I came down here from London to get away from someone, but I've been followed. I've been afraid to leave the inn, until last night I felt I couldn't stand being cooped up any longer. So I went for a walk on the seashore. Someone followed me, Mr. Holmes. I ran back here as fast as I could, but now he knows where I live, and I'm frightened. Please help me. My dear Miss Victor, I'm afraid you must be much more specific before I can help you. Who has followed you down here, and why are you afraid of him? I'll tell you the whole story. It'll sound strange to you, but I swear it. Oh, there is again down by the gate. I'm going to my room. No, 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 no. Don't you fight, Miss Victor. I'm sure we'll be... Oh, that's all. Sort of thing. I don't see anyone outside who might fight into There are two or three fishermen loitering about. Wait a minute. Here's a young fellow walking up the path. Come on, Watson. Out through the French windows again. Oh, gracious me. Here we go again. I think we'll take the liberty of accosting him. Excuse me, sir. Yes? Are you looking for Miss Mary Victor? Is she young and pretty? Yes, sir. She is extremely so. Then I'm looking for her. Where can I find her? I can see you're being facetious, sir. Well, there's no harm in that, is there? By the way, who are you, gentlemen, may I ask? My name is Holmes, and this is my friend, Dr. Watson. I'm Basil Carter. You're not Sherlock Holmes, are you? That is my name. I thought you seemed familiar. I know your brother, my brother. Oh, indeed. Then I presume you're connected with the foreign office. Yes, I'm in the consular service. Are you staying at the inn, young man? For a few days. It's funny that I run into the great Sherlock Holmes. I may I ask? I was planning a murder. Oh, really? Uh, but with murder? you gentlemen here, I see that I shall have to be very discreet. Uh, who is your intended victim, may I inquire? There are two of them. The two canaries in the room next to mine. <laughs> oh, canaries. <laughs> the moment I thought that you, you were really serious. But I am serious. The wretched creatures have been driving me mad. Yes, I quite sympathize with you, sir. I've been thinking of committing a slight case of mayhem on them myself. We can take one apiece, Mr. Holmes. Well, I'm glad to have met you both. I'll probably see you again. Oh, goodbye. goodbye. Well, goodbye, sir. Goodbye. <laughs> I don't like that fellow, Holmes. If you ask me, he's the man who's been fighting the poor girl that came to us. 
a peculiar look on his face when you asked me if he was looking for Mary Victor. Well, there's only one person who can settle the question, and that's the young lady herself. Come on, old fellow. Let's go back in. Oh, shh, shh. Here comes Wainwright, the owner canary. Uh, good evening, Mr. Wainwright. Good evening, gentlemen. Uh, this is uh, my friend, uh, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. I am honored to meet you, sir. How do you do, Mr. Wainwright? Beautiful evening, isn't it? I just took a stroll down to the store to get some more birdseed. By the way, Mr. Holmes, I hope our canaries don't bother you. Little fellows are such comfort to my wife and me. Oh, no, not at all, sir. I find that chirruping very soothing. Oh, I, I'm so glad. <laughs> good night, gentlemen. Oh, good night, good sir. Good night, Mr. Wilson. Not Wilson, Mr. Holmes. Wainwright. Oh, I beg your pardon. I'm so sorry. I thought you said Wilson. Good night. Well, not like you to mix up names, Holmes. I didn't mix them up, old fellow. I never forget a face. Mr. Wainwright is in reality Wilson, the notorious canary trainer, whom I had the pleasure of sending to prison for a seven-year stretch in 95. Some years later, he made one of the most spectacular escapes from prison in the history of crime, and has since managed to evade all efforts to recapture him. Great Scott, he seems such a sweet old fellow. Well, possibly he's reformed, but I doubt it. Our stage is set for an intriguing problem, old chap, and our cast is an interesting one. A frightened young girl, a diplomat of uncertain integrity, and a noted criminal, Watson... I have a feeling that once again the game's afoot. Holmes, why are we strolling along the pier instead of staying at the inn? I thought you said that you were expecting trouble. I am, old chap, and I'm sure it will find us out. You know, Holmes, I'm still completely mystified by the behavior of that girl, Mary Victor. I knocked at her door last evening again this morning. I couldn't get any answer. And the landlord told me that she was not seen at dinner last night, nor at breakfast this morning. And yet her room had not been vacated. Curious. Hello, there's the village constable, sunning himself at the end of the pier. Yeah. Good morning, Sergeant Blake. Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson. How are you, gentlemen? Yes, thank you, Sergeant. And very appreciative of the weather that you've provided for us. Oh, think nothing of it, sir. We always arrange that for our really distinguished visitors. Oh. <laughs> By the way, Mr. Holmes... I was reading one of your friend's stories about you last night. The one called The Adventure of Mysteria Lodge. That was, uh, Wisteria Lodge, you, you foolish fellow. Well, maybe it was. <laughs> anyway, I was reading it aloud to me, old woman. And if you don't mind my saying so, Mr. Holmes, we both thought you made a bad mistake. Oh, really? Though, of course, you come out all right in the oh, end. Dear me, Sergeant, I stand reproved. Uh, excuse me, Sergeant. Holmes, Holmes, look. Look at that figure standing by itself right at the end of the pier. <laughs> Our friend Wilson, the canary trainer. He's got a revolver. Here, here, we don't want any of these going on in Kingsgate. Come on. Here, you. What are you doing waving that revolver about? Keep back, the three of you. I'm the law here. Don't tell me what to do. Keep back, I say. I'm not afraid to fire. Don't do as he says, Sergeant. You don't want to trifle with. Just exactly what are you up to, Wilson? You caught up with me once again, Sherlock Holmes. But this time you're not going to send me back to a prison again. And maybe the gallows... If I can't escape you, then I'll take my own way out with this revolver. Wilson, what in thunder are you talking about? The murder at the inn last night. I did it. Murder? I'm confessing in front of the three of you. Oh, you leave my wife alone. She didn't know anything about it. Now, I hope you're satisfied, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. He's pointing the revolver as he has. Wilson, you fool, stop it. Strike me pink. He done it. Over the pier and into the sea. Get help, Sergeant. It's possible he isn't dead. Right, sir. Come on, Watson. Going back to the inn, I suppose. Of course we are. We've just heard a murder confession, but we don't know who has been murdered. Holmes. Holmes, what was the telegram that you, you sent off just now? A message to my brother, Mycroft. The innkeeper informed me that Basil Carter, the young diplomat we met yesterday, he and rather hurriedly in the early hours of this morning. Come on, let's go upstairs. Well, we'll have to break the news to Miss Wainwright, I suppose. Before we do that, I think we'll see if Miss Victor's in her room. Which one is it? Here, oh. top of the stairs. Hmm. We'll take the liberty of looking in. Miss Victor has been seen since last night. Uh-huh. Unlocked. Lord, what a mess. That was strewn all over the place. Open suitcases. Yes, it Look looks at this. as if the young lady had been planning an immediate departure. Where can't you be? No one's seen her since last night. Oh, Mary. Oh. Oh. Oh, 
I beg your pardon, gentlemen. I thought I heard Mary Victor come in. I'm Mrs. Wainwright. Mrs. Wainwright, I'm uh, afraid we have some rather, rather bad news for you. Your husband shot himself a quarter of an hour ago at the end of the pier and his body fell into the sea. Is he dead? We must presume so, madam. I left the police sergeant there searching for him. Sergeant Blake should be back here at any moment now. So he did it. After all. You don't seem very surprised, madam. Well, he threatened to do it. Mrs. Wainwright, before your husband shot himself, he confessed to committing a murder in this inn last night. A murder? Whose murder? At the moment, we're not quite sure. Oh, he must have been out of his mind. Mrs. Wainwright, I'm afraid I must ask you some rather painful questions. Are you aware that your husband was a criminal, that he served a prison sentence under the name of Wilson? Yes, I knew that. He told me when we were married two years ago. But he said that he'd gone straight ever since he'd come out of prison. That's why he changed his name. He was trying to make a fresh start. You know no reason for his planning to kill anyone at this inn? None. And unless you find someone murdered, I wouldn't give too much thought to it. Yes, if you'll forgive my saying so, madam, you seem remarkably unmoved by your husband's tragedy. Why should I pretend? We were very happy together. This might be the best way out of it for both of us. Oh, my, soul. my husband carried quite a large amount of life insurance. In the event of suicide, would that be terrible? Depends on the policy, madam. But I must say that uh, from your attitude, I begin to doubt whether your husband is dead. What do you mean? I mean that if Mr. Wilson, or if you prefer it, Mr. Wainwright, wished to disappear in spectacular style, what could be simpler than to pretend to shoot himself, drop into the Mr. sea... Mr. Mr. I'm up here, Sergeant. Ah, did you find him? Yes, Mr. Am. We fished him out right away. Dead is a doornail. Shot himself to the head, he did. Well, that disposes of your last theory, Holmes. Did you find the revolver, Sergeant? Yes, ma'am. Got it right here with me. One bullet missing. Have you found out if anyone here has been murdered, Mr. Holmes? I found out very little as yet. Wait a moment. Listen. I don't hear anything. Exactly. You hear nothing. Yet we're within a few feet of the Wainwright's room. What do you mean, Mr. Holmes? I mean that... Uh, there is one sound we should be hearing very clearly at the moment. Why didn't I think of it before? The sound of your canaries chirruping. You heard little else for days. Come on, Watson. Where are you going? To your room, madam. I'm afraid I must uh, dispense with asking your permission. You're already in my room. It seems a little late even to mention the subject. Here's the bird cage. The window's up. Oh, he... Where's the gun? No, old chap. If you look more closely, you'll see them on the bottom of the cage. Let me open this door and get one of them out. Oh, Joe Holmes. They're dead. And yet when we entered the inn a few minutes ago, they were still chirping. But who on earth would want to kill a couple of birds? That, my dear fellow, is one of the things we have to find out. So far, I must admit, I'm puzzled. We have a self-confessed murderer, and the nearest thing we can find to a corpse is a pair of dead canaries. <laughs> We'll bring you the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just a second. A second I'll take, if you don't mind, to ask you if you've ever had a glass of Petri California Sherry. Because if you haven't, boy, you want to remedy that situation pronto. Try that Petri Sherry before dinner some evening. Look at its clear amber color. Smell the fragrance of those luscious grapes. And get a sample of that Petri flavor. Mmm, mmm. That Petri Sherry can turn the usual before dinner low into a main event. And say, if you like your sherry dry, as I do, wait till you taste Petri Pale Dry Sherry. Is that ever good? But after all, when it's a Petri wine, it's always a good one. And now, back to tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure. Strange events are taking place in the Kentish fishing village of Kingsgate. A self-confessed murderer has committed suicide, but his victim cannot be found. As we rejoin our story, the great detective and his old friend, Dr. Watson, are once again examining the room of Mary Victor, one of the missing guests. You know, Holmes, the murder that Wilson confessed to before he committed suicide might be in the, the killing of those two canaries. I think not, old chap. Wilson obviously loved the creatures and kept them in spite of the fact that they were dangerously apt to identify him with his criminal past. Uh-huh. Interesting. Very Interesting. Huh? What do you find? This note lying on Miss Victor's dressing table. Yeah. Let's have a look. You think 
You can hide from me, Mary, but you can't. Wherever I go, I shall follow you. So why not get wise to yourself and stop running away? <laughs> Sounds as if the poor girl was in danger, all right. Possibly, but the writer of that note was certainly obliging. Though the letter is unsigned, he at least gives us a clue to his identity. Oh, what else? The phrase, get wise to yourself, is very un-English. It's American. Come on, old chap. Well, where are we going now? The envelope to this letter has the Kingsgate postmark on it. I should be surprised if that fount of all knowledge, the village postmistress, can't help us find an American visitor. Yes, I know the young man you must be looking for, gentlemen. His name's Walter C. Bunker. He's been in here to send telegrams, and his accent's so strong you could cut it with a knife. It's just like one of the Red Indian fellows you read about, uh, you know. Can you tell me where he lives, uh, madam? Well, then again, sir, uh, he's been rooming at Mrs. Bell's house. Uh, 15 Laburnum Grove, uh, down behind the gas station. 15 it? Laburnum Grove, Mrs. Bell. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very much obliged to you. Are you Mrs. Bell? Yes, sir. What can I do for you, gentlemen? Well, we understand that uh, Mr. Walter Bunker has been staying with you, madam. Yes, he has. A nice young American gentleman. Is he at home, may I ask? No, sir. And I'm worried about him. This morning, when he goes out, he asks me where the nearest cemetery is. Cemetery? Gracious me. Huh? I tell him, and then he gives a queer kind of laugh. I'm not sure I'll see you anymore, he says. And then he walks off, and I haven't seen him since. I tell you, I'm worried about him, gentlemen. And where is the nearest cemetery, Mrs. Bell, the one you directed him to? About three miles from here. Mm -hmm. Just this side of Branson Wood. Thank you, madam. Come on, Watson. The cemetery seems deserted. Shh, shh. music comes from the church. Oh, Lord, it's a funeral. Or a wedding. Come on. By Jove, it is a way home. I'm afraid we're on the false trail, but we'd better make sure. Shh. Quiet, gentlemen, please. The ceremony is just ending. Just one question. Can you tell me the names of the couple just been married? Miss Mary Victor from the inn, and a young American by the name of Bunker. Thank you. Yes, we have been following a false trail, confound it. The frightened young lady was merely frightened by her persistent American fiancé. Threatening letter that he sent her. Ambiguously worded, when you come to think of it. Anyway, we can cease to worry about Miss Victor. As she is now Mrs. Bunker, I think we can assume that she's out of all danger. Well, we've got to start all over again. Oh, no, no, my dear fellow. The field is narrowing. We'll head back for the inn now, and I have a feeling that we're on the last lap of our strange adventure. <laughs> Here's another suspect eliminated. This telegram is from my brother, Mycroft. I telegraphed him earlier on today to check on the movements of uh, Basil Carter, the young man who left the inn so mysteriously in the early hours of this morning. His answer informs me that the gentleman in question was recalled to the foreign office suddenly and arrived quite safely a few hours ago. Well, now I'm completely puzzled. And I, old fellow, at last see daylight. Wish I did, Mr. Earl. Start and go upstairs and get that man's widow and bring her to my room, please. Uh, and then I think I can give you the solution to this problem. You with me, Mr. Holmes. Yes, it, madam. You and Sergeant Blake make yourselves comfortable. Now, in the first place, the murder occurred this morning and not last night. I know what you're hinting at. The canaries. I admit I killed them. But you can't do anything to me for that. Why did you kill those birds? I hated them. As much as my husband loved them. And when I knew he was dead, their singing drove me mad. And so I killed them. But they must have been already dead when we told you of your husband's suicide. True, Watson, but the lady was fully aware that her husband was dead when we informed her of the fact. You see, uh, she murdered him. You're talking rubbish. Yes, Mr. Holm. How could she have murdered him? We saw him shoot himself before our eyes. Because when Wilson raised that revolver to his head, he was convinced that it contained blank cartridges. Unfortunately for him, his wife had deliberately replaced the... Blanks with live cartridges. Oh, great heavens. Why? How? Let me reconstruct the case for you. Wilson, with the connive of his wife here, had contrived a disappearance plot. 
He knew that I had spotted his real identity, and so he planned this rather dramatic exit. Confessed to a non-existent murder, and then, well, had his plan materialized, he was to shoot himself with a bank. All from the pier and apparent suicide. What a fantastic scheme, but how did he plan to get away? Well, he would have swum under the water, safe distance, and so made his escape. Oh, his plan couldn't have worked possibly. Oh, probably not, probably huh? not. But at least it was ingenious. He would have destroyed his true identity. And have had his revenge on me by making me search for a murder that had never been committed. Unfortunately for him, his wife was his accomplice and saw in the scheme an excellent way of killing her husband. You think you're so very clever, Mr. Holmes. But if it were true, how could you prove it? Observe this revolver, Mrs. Wilson. It's the one your husband shot himself with. What can you prove from that? Ever hear of fingerprint tests? I've heard of them. But that revolver's been underwater. True, quite true. But uh, thanks to the research of my excellent friend, Dr. John Thorndike, an infallible test has been discovered for recording fingerprints even after immersion in seawater. I applied the test to the prints on the revolver and the bullets and compared them with some that we found on the water glass in your room. They are the same, Mrs. Wilson. Now, does a man let his wife load his suicide weapon? Sergeant Blake, I think it's obvious that the time has come for you to take over the case. All right. All right, so I did change the bullets. I hated him. I'm glad he's dead. And what's more, I do it again. Mr. Holmes. Yes, Sergeant Blake? Well, now that I've taken Mrs. Wilson to the station, booked her on a murder charge, I wonder if you'd mind answering a question. Which uh, This uh, fingerprint ah. test. I'd like to know about that. <laughs> I've I never heard of, of being able to take prints after a revolver has been handled two or three times and soaked in salt water. Yes, Holmes, and I'd like to know when you performed the test and took the prints off the glass in her room. I, I thought that I was with you all the time. <laughs> you were, my dear fellow. Well, then I... I can give you the answer in one word. Bluff. What? There is no such test, my dear Watson. It would be almost impossible to expect clear prints <laughs> after so much handling and totally impossible <laughs> after submersion. Fortunately for us, though, Mrs. Wilson was double enough to believe me and... Uh, Give me a confession. And there's no such person as Dr. John Thorndike? Oh, yes, yes, indeed there is. A great success last year in the case of the Red Tark. You didn't tell me about that case, Holmes? No, no, I didn't. It was deliberate, old chap. With your taste for uh, writing sensational stories, I was afraid you might publish the affair. Huh? Would it have mattered if I had? Oh, yes, it would. Huh? Uh, you'd have given away, uh, what shall I say, professional secrets? You'd have provided the public, and in particular the criminal public, with a complete education on fingerprints. And when that happens, my dear Watson... We shall have no tricks left. That will be a sad day for detectives. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is based on an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventure of Wisteria Lodge. Mr. Rathbone appears to the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, and Mr. Bruce, the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invites you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us about another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective Sherlock Holmes. It began on a, on a, on a summer evening in 1906. I'd been for a long walk in the park. I remember when I returned to Baker Street and entered our rooms. Holmes looked up at me with a twinkle and uh, and spoke. You look positively glowing with health, Watson. Well, I had a splendid walk, my dear fellow. You should have come with me. The park was looking particularly beautiful. Well, well chap, during our absence, I've decided to write another monograph. Oh, well, what's the subject this time? Occupational liability to murder. For instance... The mortality rate is naturally high among policemen and detectives. Physicians are murdered with fair regularity, but the murder of a dentist is rare. And who ever heard of a murdered veterinary surgeon? That's quite true, but what's the occasion for this little homily? I've been browsing over my newspaper clippings. Yeah? 
You recall ever hearing of a murdered tobacconist, Watson? No, no, I can't say that I do. Oh, why? And yet my clippings inform me that no less than three tobacconists have been murdered in the past six months, and all the murders have occurred in the same small shop at the East End of London. <laughs> now, why do you suppose three tobacconists would be murdered in the same shop? Come now, old fellow. Give me a logical solution to the problem, will you? Well, uh, let me see. You say that the shop's in the in the East End? Yes. Is it near the river? As it happens, it's on the water's edge. Then supposing the tobacconist shop was the headquarters of a smuggling ring. Perhaps boxes of cigars were unloaded from the dock and mm -hmm. brought to the shop. Cigars containing pearls or opium or something. Watson, my dear fellow, you're doing splendidly. Oh, you must walk in the park more frequently. You're positively scintillating. Oh, no, no you're... You're making fun of me. I assure you I'm not. You're expecting anyone home? No, no, probably a visitor from Mrs. Hudson. Go on with your fascinating theory. Now, why are three tobacconists murdered? Well, because they they know too much. Perhaps they demand a share in the profits, so the head of the ring decides to kill them. Plausible enough, Watson. I really must congratulate you. Oh, I can well, see that I'm very lucky in having a biographer with such a lively oh, imagination. Thanks very much. Come in. That's very nice, you. Imagination. Oh, Oh, hello, Stroud. Stroud, I'm glad to see you. Uh, I hope I'm not intruding. Not sir. at all, my dear fellow. Come along, sit down. Uh, thank you, Mr. Holmes. Anything uh, remarkable on hand? No, no, Mr. Holmes. Nothing very uh, particular. Ah, then tell me all about it, Mr. Stroud. <laughs> Can't hide anything from you, can I, sir? Yes, there is something on my mind and no mistake. And it concerns the three murdered tobacconists, I see. Splendid. Now, how the blazes did you know that? Yes, Holmes, that's pure magic. Not at all, my dear Watson. It's simple deduction. deduction. Observe the five mm. cigars peering out of Lestrade's breast mm. pocket. They are of a far superior quality to his usual brand. Obviously, the scene of his latest investigation has profit certain, well, should we say, uh, professional perquisites. Am I right, Lestrade? <laughs> of course you are. Careful one, Mr. Holmes. Thank you, though. I'll stick to my pipe. Well, how about you, Doctor? Oh, thank you, Lestrade. Thank you. Coronas. And now, Inspector... Tell me about the murdered tobacconists. Well, how much do you know about the case? Oh, just what I've read in the papers. Well, curiously enough, we were discussing the affair as you walked in, Lestrade. Eh, it's a strange business, gentlemen. I only got hold of the old story today when I had a long talk to young Jack Longworth. Now, he's the owner of the show. Well, in relation to what? Gerald Longworth, the taller member of Parliament who battled so successfully against the slum clearance bill? His son, Mr. Holmes. Oh, what's a nice young fellow, too. Uh, when his father died, he inherited this shop along with a lot of other property in the East End. Well, uh, how big a shop is it, Mr. Oh, just a hole in the wall, Doctor. Like all the other shops in that part of London. A young Mr. Longworth tells me he first rents it to a man by the name of George Grillet. He lives there with his daughter, Lily, and made it quite a nice go out of the shop. Six months ago, when Jack Longworth was abroad, George Grillet has a stroke and nearly kicks the bucket. He kicks the, uh, kicks the bucket? He nearly dies, Doctor. Oh, it kicks a bucket. That's very good. I don't remember that. And then what happened to Stroud? <laughs> well, while he's in the hospital, his daughter gives up the lease on the shop. A few days later, an Italian takes it over, and a couple of weeks later, he's found with his throat cut. Did you investigate that first murder yourself? No, Mr. Holmes. It seemed like any of a dozen killings we get in that part of London. A shopkeeper cut up, his till emptied, no clues. Well, who was the next tenant? A Scotchman. bloke by the name of Macintosh. A few weeks after he moved in, the same thing happened to him. That time, I did go down there. But I couldn't find out nothing. Was robbery again the apparent motive? Yes, sir. But the killing wasn't the same. He was strangled with a silk scarf. Silk scarf, eh? And who was the third tenant? The man who was murdered yesterday? A Hindu fella. A man by the name of Mukherjee. He takes it over a week last Friday, and yesterday we find him knife through the back and his money gone. Of course, I was down there eh, before you could say Crystal Palace. But once again, I didn't find out nothing. No knife, no fingerprints on the till, no footprints. Just a very dead Hindu. Was young Mr. Longworth a landlord in England when these murders occurred? Yeah, that's the funny thing about it, Mr. Holmes. He docked at Tilbury yesterday morning. He didn't know nothing about what had been going on. Well, I imagine he'd have difficulty in renting the shop after three murders. Well, that's just it, Doctor. That's why he comes to me at the yard. George Grillet, his first tenant of the shop, moved back there today with his daughter, Liddy. And young Mr. Longworth's worried about them. <laughs> well, if you ask me, he's more worried about the daughter than he is about old man Grillet. So the original tenants of the shop are back in residence again, eh? And, uh, what do you want me to do? 
Well, I thought perhaps you'd be interested enough to come along with me and look at the shop, Mr. Evans. I should be very glad to, my dear fellow. It's coat and hat, Watson. Oh, that's your... Oh, dear, that wretched instrument. I'll answer it. Hello? Mike Craft, how are you? What? Yes. Yes, he... He's here now. Why, of course. I'll do everything I can, certainly. Let's have dinner together soon, shall we? Splendid idea. All right, goodbye. Well, is that your brother, Holmes? Yes. To start, I do think you might have told me the whole truth. Well, how do you mean, sir? I thought your visit was prompted by a need for friendly assistance. I didn't realize that you came here virtually on a government order. Well, it wasn't just quite like that, Mr. Holmes. What's the government got to do with the case? And how does your brother Mycroft fit into the picture? Not eh? sure yet. But of one thing we may be certain, there's obviously a great deal more in this case than Lestrade would have us believe. Why do you say that, Holmes? You must bear in mind, old fellow, that occasionally Mycroft is the British government. Yeah. Nice part of London to take a walk in on a foggy night, ain't it, gentlemen? <laughs> All our policemen work down here in pairs, you know. Yes, I don't blame them. It's a vile neighborhood. Uh, there's the shop just ahead of us, with a sign hanging out. Hello, hello, there he is again. Oh. See that bearded Hindu skulking off around the corner there? Oh, yes. He's been haunting the place ever since I came down here. Hmm. So a bearded Hindu haunts the place, eh? Yes, and yesterday, Holmes, the Hindu proprietor of the shop was murdered. Exactly. Well, here we are. I'll go in first. Depressing looking place, huh? I'll be out in Jiffy. That's Lily, George Grillet's daughter. Helps him with the shop. Sorry to keep you wet. Oh. Oh, it's you, Inspector Lestrade. Yes, Miss Lee. Uh, I brought some gentlemen to see your father. Uh, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Pleased to meet you, I'm sure. How do you do, Miss Grillet? Uh, how do you do, young lady? Is your dad home? No, Inspector. He won't be in till after dinner. Went down at the docks, he did, to see about some cigar shipments. Mr. Longwax here. If you want to see him, we were just having some tea in the back room. Yes, oh, I'd like these gentlemen to meet him. Jack, come out in the shop, Jack. What is it, Lily? Oh, Inspector Lestrade. And this must be Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, I'm sure. How do you do, sir? How are you, Mr. Longworth? I'm very glad the inspector was able to persuade you to come down here, Mr. Holmes. I'm dreadfully worried about this business, particularly since Lily's father insisted on coming back here. I'm afraid they're in great danger, but I can't make Mr. Grillet see it. Young lady, I wonder if I might ask you a few questions. Well, of course, Mr. Holmes. Before your father had his stroke, did he receive any threats concerning his occupancy of the shop? Well, if he did, he never told me about him. But it wouldn't surprise me. I often told him his biggest enemy is himself, if you know what I mean. Yes, I think I do, Miss Grillet. When your father had his illness, who decided to give up the lease on the shop? I did. No money was coming in, and, well, it looked like Dad might be an invalid for life. Mm. Of course, I couldn't run the shop by myself. Anyhow, I never did like this part of London. It wasn't the right business for Father. Uh, what was his reaction when you told him... Uh... To given up the lease. No, oh, he was awful angry with me. Said I'd no right to do it without asking him. Uh, by the way, uh, we saw that bearded Hindu again as we walked up just now. He's been hanging around ever since we came back here, Inspector. Well, has he actually come into the shop, Miss Willett? Mm, no, but he keeps walking by and looking in the window. I'm sure if we both went into the back room or left the shop for a little while, well, he'd come right in. Then I suggest we give him the opportunity he's seeking. Miss Grillet, I wonder if you and Mr. Longworth would mind leaving the shop for a while. Of course not, Mr. Holmes. Make your departure rather ostentatious, shall we say, so that he can't help noticing it. Give us half an hour or so and then come back. Perhaps you wouldn't mind going with him, Mr. Holmes. Mr. Holmes, this is my case. I know, I know, but um, in a situation like this, Watson and I work much better alone. We may have to go a little outside the law, and your presence might embarrass us. <laughs> You'd never think I was a detective, too, would you? Anyway, we'll be back Mr. in half an hour. <laughs> poor, poor old Lestrade. He gets very touchy as the years roll by. Yeah, I blame him. I'm leaving him completely in the dark. Come on, Watson. Behind the counter. No, 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 my oh. dear fellow. Not oh. under it. Not under it, old chap. We lift the flap. Oh, good. So. Ah, now it's just to be crouched down behind here. Come on. That's it. 
Have you got your revolver, Watson? Yes, it's in my pocket. Good. In the meantime, make yourself as comfortable as these cramped quarters will permit. We may have uh, quite a wait ahead of us. Look, look, Holmes. There's the Hindu now, peering through the window. Yes, yes, sir. Here, here he comes. All right, Watson. Put your hands up. I got you covered with this revolver. Now, my man, what are you doing here? Who? Who are you? Never mind who I am. Just answer my question. I do not speak very good English. Do you mean to about in sector? Ah, sector high. Iko tum ida aya. Dek me koasti. Tumara bai hum ko hukam diya. Tumara bai. Tum jani sector. Both acha. Salah. No, 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 you don't, my man. Just you stay where you are. It's all right, Watson. Let him go. He's on our side. Wish you'd tell me what in thunder's going on, who that man was, and why you let him go. He's an investigator from the foreign office, old chap. Given his instructions by my brother, Mycroft. Mycroft? Yes, old fellow. When my brother fails to tell me all the facts concerning this case, I begin to think these triple murders have far greater ramifications than we ever dreamed of. <laughs> Dr. Watson's story will continue in just a second. Just about time enough for me to mention that any meal becomes a better meal when you serve it with Petri wine. And say, you'll find that Petri California Burgundy and Petri California Sauterne are just made to go with food. That Petri Burgundy is a rich red wine that's bosom pals with any meat or meat dish. Boy, what a flavor. And that Petri Sauterne is the delicate white wine that's just perfect with chicken or with fish. Yes, sir, with food, you just can't beat a good Petri wine. And now back to tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure. A puzzling case is occupying the attentions of Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Three murders have taken place in a small tobacconist shop in the east end of London. As we rejoin our story, it's late at night... And Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, accompanied by Inspector Lestrade, are once again walking toward the ill-fated shop. Well, I don't see that you've accomplished much, Mr. Holmes, except that you've just bought me a nice dinner. Oh, I'm making progress, Lestrade. It's only by the elimination of obvious suspects. But there's a pattern to this case that should give us a clue. Well, how do you mean, Holmes? My dear fellow, consider the obvious motive of these murders and particularly observe the results they've obtained. Well, the motive was the same in all three killings. Robbery. Oh, no, Lestrade. Don't let the theft of a few pounds from the till blind you to the real motive. Look, 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 look. Here's Miss Credit now. He's coming out of the shop. Good evening, Miss Credit. Hello, Mr. Holmes. Is your father home yet? Yes, he is, Mr. Holmes. Well, I can't tell you how anxious I am for you to talk to him. I'm going to meet Mr. Longwear. He's taken me to the music hall. I should be home just after ten. I hope you'll be able to stay with Dad until then. Well, don't you worry, Miss Grit. We'll keep an eye on him. Oh, thanks ever so much. Oh, um... Oh, Mr. Holmes. Yes, Miss Grillard? Please don't go into our rooms in the back, will you? I've left things in a frightful mess. I quite understand, Miss Grillard. Well, ta-ta. See you later. Hmm. Let's go into the shop. Who is that? Oh, oh, it's you, Inspector. Yeah, these gentlemen are uh, Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Oh, good, good evening, sir. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, good evening. Did you meet young Lily just now? Yes, she uh, told us she was going out to the music hall with Mr. Longworth. Yes. I'm afraid we had quite a set to about that. A uh, very strong-willed girl, Lily. Very strong-willed. Might have assumed that uh, you disapprove of your daughter's association with Mr. Longworth? Uh, of course I do. He's a top. He's got lots of money. Lily's so blind she can't see that he's up to no good. Hmm. I'm pretty sure he's afraid I might find out what's really at the back of these here murders. And what is your theory, sir? Well, I'll tell you this in confidence. Got nothing to back it up now, you understand. There's been talk of widening the docks around here. That'd make property values go up, you see, of course. Well, young Longworth's been trying to buy up all the other shops along the waterfront here, but they wouldn't sell. 
If you ask me, he's had these murders done just to frighten people away so that they, he could buy cheap. Now, I'm not saying that he did the murders himself, you understand, but he planned them. Why, in these parts, it's easy enough any night to get a throat cut for a couple of quid. Yeah. That's why I'm glad you're here, gents. You see, I, uh, I just got another warning. Warning? What do you mean, it's a warning? Found this note slipped under that door there not three quarters of an hour ago. Let me see, please. Huh. What does it say, Holmes? I shall call on you at 8.30 tonight. You know what's good for you. You'll be waiting for me alone. If you try any funny tricks, you'll go where I sent the rest of them. Well, that's obviously from the killer. Possibly. What's the time now? Mm, look, it's, uh, twenty past eight. I was hoping you gentlemen would wait in our rooms back of the shop. You can hear what's going on in here, and if he tries any rough stuff, you can pop in and nab him. Just what I was about to suggest myself, Mr. Grillis. Either way, will you? Oh, yes. Just step behind the counter, gents. Ah, through here. Ah, here we are. Ain't exactly Buckingham Palace back here. But you can make yourselves comfortable, can't you, gents? Oh, don't you worry about us, Grillis. Oh, i better turn up the gas. If this bloke spots a light under the door in here, he might smell a rat. Huh? Now, as soon as I see him coming in the shop, I'll knock twice on the door. Like this. And that'll give you the signal that he's here. Is that right? Right, you are, Grit. All right, now keep your ears open, gents. I may need your help. Where are you, Holmes? I can't see a thing. Over here, Watson. You know, I've, I've got another theory why Jack Longworth might be at the back of all this. You listening, Holmes? Yes, I'm listening, old fellow. What is your theory? Longworth knows that Grillet doesn't approve of his having anything to do with Lily. So when he goes abroad, he leaves instructions to murder the tobacconist. The assassins don't know about Grillet having a stroke, of course, so they keep murdering the, uh, the wrong fuller. Well, that makes very good sense, Doctor. What do you say, Mr. Holmes? Holmes. Holmes. Where are you? That's my silly. No, I haven't. I was just exploring. Shh. That's the signal. There goes the front door. Somebody's come in. We've got to go in. I thought you'd listen. We've got to get in there at once. Open the door. Well, it's locked. Never mind that. It's just hold us into it. Come on, come on, help me. Come on, one more. Poor devil. He's been slashed with a knife. Do it. Do it. What, the killer got away? I'm going to... Now, child can save your energy. Your murderer lies there. But that's grilly. Of course it is. Search his pockets, Watson. I think you'll find a bloodstained knife. Uh, Let's have a look. Uh, good Lord. He has a razor in his pocket. It's covered with blood. You mean to say that he slashed himself? Let's slip oh, the handcuffs uh, on him, Mr. I. While he's still play-acting, he may be more difficult to handle when he realizes the game's up. Take your hands off of me. Come on, quick. Come on, quick. Uh, come on here. Hey. Come on. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah. Very neat, Lestrade. Yeah. Well... Now that I've knocked a wounded man out cold, perhaps you'll tell me what's going on, Mr. Holmes. Yes, I'm completely in the dark, too. Oh, it's very simple, really. Willett has just staged a fake attack on himself. Fool us into believing that someone else is the murderer. Yeah, but the threatening note he received... Composed by himself for the occasion. Yes, but we heard voices. We heard the shop door open. We heard Grillet talking to himself. And as for the shop door, that's how he gave himself away. Well, how do you mean, Mr. Holmes? Whenever the shop door opens, there's a bell that jangles. You will notice, uh... So, yeah, that's right, there is. There was no bell jangle when we were in the back room. Grillet got us in there, locked the door on us unobtrusively, and staged his little drama. Yes, but we heard the door creak open and close, Mr. O. The creak of this flap in the counter would sound exactly the same, my dear fellow. Now listen. Yes, but why, Holmes? How did you spot that Grillet was a man? It was obvious from the beginning that since nothing had changed about the shop except the ownership, that the attackers were directed against any tobacconist who was not Grillet himself. Of course, his daughter, Lily, obviously knew what was going on. Well, I don't see how you figure that one out, Mr. Holmes. Every remark that she made showed that although she loved her father, she knew his failings. In any case, she gave me the final clue. Well, what clue was that? 
and very pointedly asking me not to go into the back room of the shop. Of course, she meant the reverse of what she said. I followed her advice when you were explaining your theory to Miss Card. Well, what did you find, Mr. Holmes? Miss Grillet had obligingly left a secret door open, a door leading to a passageway that seemed uh, to go down to the waterfront. We'll examine it more thoroughly in a minute. Yes, but I still don't understand Grillet's motive, Holmes. Neither do I, old chap. No, I suspect that from uh, the interest of the foreign office in the case, this shop has been the headquarters of a of an espionage ring. I'm afraid the final answer to that question will have to be given by someone else. Oh, who, Holmes? By my uh, elder brother, Mycroft. Humiliating, isn't it, Watson? And what was the final answer to the question, Dr. Watson? Well, uh, Holmes was right as usual, Mr. Foreman. The shop had been the headquarters of a spy ring operated by Grillet. And many international criminals had been smuggled in England or foreign ships moored up the river. And did Mr. Grillet hang for his crime? No, 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 he didn't, my boy. Before the, he came to trial, he, he had another stroke and he died. Probably just as well for his daughter's sake. Oh, his daughter. <laughs> a lovely girl. Did she marry Longworth? <laughs> Indeed she did. As a matter of fact, I, I danced at her wedding. It was a very wonderful wedding reception. <laughs> See, you would have been there yourself, Mr. Foreman. In fact, you'd have liked it very much. They, they served a Pretty good wine. <laughs> was it a Petri wine by any chance? Hmm? Oh, well, it was so good it easily might have been. <laughs> <laughs> you mean because Petri wine is the kind of a wine you can't forget. That's exactly what I do well, mean. Well, that's because the Petri that's family really mean. knows all there is to know about the fine art of turning luscious, sun-ripened grapes into fragrant, delicious wine. You see, the Petri family's been making wine ever since they started the Petri business way back in the 1800s. And they've been able to hand on down in the family from father to son... From father to son, every bit of their skill and experience. That's why Petri wine is so good today. Because Petri took time to bring you good wine. And say, don't forget to take a moment yourself and send for your free recipe calendar. Remember, send to Petri wine. Petri wine, San Francisco 26, San Francisco 26, California. This offer is intended to apply only in those states and other localities where its acceptance is permissible by law and regulation. And now, Doctor, do you feel like giving us a hint about next week's story? Yes, I do. Next week, Mr. Foreman, I'm going to tell you a strange adventure that happened to Holmes and me in the West End of London. It concerns the death of a famous actor who was portraying the part of an equally famous man, Sherlock Holmes. Thank you, Doctor. See you next week. And say, from the news we've had so far today, maybe by next week at this time we'll hear some really good news from Europe. I certainly hope so, Mr. Foreman. But let us remember the war won't be over when Germany quits. You've still got to lick Japan. That's going to take a long time. So instead of celebrating when VE Day comes along, let's just strengthen our resolve to support the war more than ever here at home. Keep that war job. Don't leave it till you're released. Keep on buying more and more and more war bonds and, and keep them. Don't turn them in. Help all you can with all home front activities and observe all our wartime regulations such as price ceiling. That's the real way to celebrate a victory in Europe, by working harder to end the war in the Pacific. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is based on an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventure of the Six Napoleons. Mr. Rathbone appears with the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce with the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Meanwhile, don't forget to take advantage of our offer of a free recipe calendar. Oh, the Petri family took the time to bring you such good wine. So when you eat and when you cook, remember Petri wine. To make good food taste better, remember... Pet, pet, Petri. This is Bill Foreman saying goodnight for the Petri family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell about another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective Sherlock Holmes. I suppose your dinner is well over by now, so now's the perfect time to get out a bottle of that swell Petri California port. You know, Petri port just made for a time like this, after dinner when you're just taking things easy. If you've ever tasted Petri port, you know what I mean. It's a hearty, full-bodied wine with a deep red color and a flavor that's just about out of this world. I think that if you had only one wine to choose and the whole world to choose from, chances are you'd pick port. Petri port. That's how good I think it is. That's saying plenty, I know, but I think Petri port will easily live up to all I say about it. Try it and see. And share it with your friends. You can serve Petri port proudly... Because the name Petri is the proudest name in the history of American wines. And now let's visit our old friend, Dr. Watson. I'm up here on the patio, Mr. Foreman. Come on out and join me. Admiring the sunset, eh, Doctor? Yes, my boy. It's a particularly beautiful one. Well, where are the puppies this evening? Uh, asleep on a, a favorite treat coat of mine. It's just come back from the cleaning. <laughs> and you hadn't the heart to move them, I suppose. No, no, I hadn't. The little fellows looked so comfortable. In fact, I sometimes wonder if these... Uh, could you have come here to listen to a dissertation on the behavior of dogs? Well, it is getting near story time, Doctor. Yes, of course it is. Well, just let me... Uh, Get my pipe properly lighted. Ah, that's it. The story I'm going to tell you tonight began in 1909. I received a telegram from my old friend telling me that he was leaving his Sussex bee farm and coming to London for a few days. I hadn't seen the great man for several months, though naturally I went to Victoria Station to meet him. As the train drew to a stop, the door of a first-class carriage swung open and Sherlock Holmes, hand outstretched, jumped down onto the platform to greet him. Watson, my dear fellow, how are you? Oh, Holmes, my dear fellow, it's good to see you again. I've missed you. And are you, old chap? Can you bake, sir? Uh, yes, Porter, and get us a handsome cab, will you? Right, you are, Governor. I wish I'd got a spare room for you. Don't worry, Watson, I shall be very comfortable at the Diogenes Club. By the way, I trust you're free this evening. Yes, naturally. What are your plans? I thought we'd go to the theatre. The theatre? Oh, what play do you want to see? Well, I thought we'd go to the Savoy Theatre and see the Sherlock Holmes play. I hear it's enormously successful. Yes, I know it is, but I've avoided it. I'm told that Sir Claude Horton takes great liberties with your character, and as for the actor portraying me, my friends tell me it's a travesty. He makes me nothing but a uh, bumbling old fool. <laughs> Therefore, a visit to the play might be a salutary experience for both of us. In any case, my trip to London is in response to a urgent telegram from Sir Claude himself. Seems to need my help rather badly. Oh, what's his trouble? <clears throat> well, he wasn't specific in his telegram. He suggested, however, that we attend tonight's performance and discuss the matter with him afterwards. I see. Well, I, I suppose if you can sit through it, I can. Of course you can, old fellow. In any case... You yourself are partly responsible for the play's existence. How do you mean, Holmes? <laughs> Those sensational stories you wrote of my modest problems, I I should have seen where they would eventually lead to. In time, no doubt, it will uh, be portrayed on the cinematograph as well. Nonsense, Holmes. That newfangled thing's only a toy. I think not, Watson. We're on the edge of a strange new mechanical world. In fact, I begin to feel a certain concern about the rumored developments in wireless telegraphy. But enough of these predictions. Here comes our porter with a cab. We'll tell the driver to take us straight to the Savoy Theatre. Just look at that line of people at the at the uh, box office home. Very flapping, old chap. Well, possibly, but I hope it doesn't mean that we've got to wait our turn and... Uh, Excuse me, gentlemen. You're Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, aren't you? Yes, yes, I yes. thought I couldn't be mistaken. My name is Frank Ferrer. How do you do, Mr. Ferrer? I'm glad to meet you. Sir Claude has a box reserved for you. He asked me to see that you are quite comfortable. I consider it him. Will you follow me, please? Thank you. Um, neither of you have seen the play before, I understand. Uh, no, Mr. Ferrer, we haven't. <laughs> I imagine it'll be a strange experience seeing yourselves portrayed on the stage. By the way, uh, I'm playing the part of an old friend of yours, Professor Moriarty. Oh, indeed. I'm <laughs> looking forward to a 
very entertaining evening. I presume that you escape our clutches, as usual? <laughs> yes, I do, Mr. Holmes. <laughs> and I've done it nightly now for 137 performances. Oh, a record that I'm sure Professor, uh, Professor Mariotti himself would envy. Had it not been for his memorable demise at the Reichenbach Falls... Ah, here we are, gentlemen. This is the box reserved for you. And now, if you'll excuse me, I'll go back to my dressing room. Oh, oh, I nearly forgot, Mr. Holmes. Sir Claude asked me to give you this note. Thank you. Oh, not at all. Well, I'll see you later. Huh. Very nice fellow for an actor. Don't be a snob, Watson. Well, what does the Claude note say? I'll read it to you. Dear Holmes, since I telegraphed you yesterday, there have been strange developments. In fact, I've been doing some detective work offstage as well as on. Watch the performance tonight and watch the audience too, particularly the occupant of the box opposite yours. Please come to my dressing room as soon as the last curtain has fallen. Oh, he's being very mysterious and the box opposite ours is empty. No, no, no. Look, Watson, look. Someone has just entered. Confound it, the house lights are going out. The first act's beginning, Holmes. The first act, yes. Well, sit back and relax, old fellow. Let's see what they've done to us. Well, what did you think of the first act, Holmes? Huh? Oh, the first act, yes, yes. I was um, examining the occupant of the box opposite ours. An attractive young lady, alone and unusually preoccupied in her program. In fact, one might assume that she was trying to hide her face. Yes, but the play, don't you think it's ridiculous? Just imagine a crown jewel being stolen from the Tower of London. Why not? It's been attempted many times. Anyhow, you must admit that the actor who's portraying me behaves like a, like a blithering idiot. <laughs> and Sir Claude's interpretation of you is uh, pretty far-fetched. Far-fetched, but flattering, Watson. What poise, what suavity, and what a voice. I find myself fully entertained. You're a strange chap, Holmes. No accounting for your tastes. Look, Watson, look. <laughs> The back of the box over there. Good Lord, I could have sworn a man dodged behind the curtain. I don't think the girl saw him, though. Looked like a foreigner. Huh. I think as the young lady's alone, we'll take the liberty of joining her. Oh, dash it, there go the lights again. The second act starting now. And sit down, old fellow. We don't want to attract attention. We'll join her during the next intermission. <laughs> What do you want with me? Uh, my name is Sherlock Holmes, and this is my colleague, Dr. Watson. Well, how do you do, young lady? I hope you'll forgive this intrusion, but Sir Claude requested that I keep an eye on you during the play tonight. Please come in and sit down, won't you? Thank you. Oh, this is very kind of you. You must forgive my abruptness just now. When I've just been watching Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson being impersonated on the stage, it's, it's rather startling to have the real couple walk into my box. <laughs> yes, I quite understand. By the way... Just before the curtain went up on the second act, I thought I noticed man come into the back of this box and then disappear again. Were you aware of his presence? No, no, I didn't see him. But I know who it is. He's been following me for weeks now. Perhaps you'd like to tell us about it, Miss... Uh... Henshaw. Alicia Henshaw. Yes, I would. As a matter of fact, that's why I'm here tonight. Sir Claude Horton's an old friend of my father's. I went to ask his advice. He did some investigating himself for a few days, and then he found himself a little out of his depth, so he decided to telegraph for you, Mr. Holmes. We were going to meet in his dressing room after the performance tonight. Splendid, and now, Miss Henshaw, what is your story? It's a strange one, Mr. Holmes, though I didn't realize just how strange until I first saw this play a few nights ago. You see, my story concerns a stolen ruby. Good Lord, and tonight's play revolves around the same thing. Exactly. I might as well tell you how it all started. My brother is an officer in the British Army stationed in Egypt. Early this year, he saved the life of a very important native personage in some uprising in Cairo and was rewarded with a magnificent ruby. This jewel he sent to my Uncle Timothy and me. Oh, we're the last of the Henshaws, you see. Did your brother tell you the name of this personage? He didn't know it, Mr. Holmes. Apparently, the whole affair was hushed up. I see. Please continue. Well, the trouble began shortly after Uncle Timothy and I received the ruby. A description of it was published in the papers, and a few days later a message came to us from Egyptian Mohammed Ali, laying claim to the stone as one stolen from his family years ago. He sent an expert to our house who examined the ruby under a lens, Mr. Holmes, and then tapped it with a hammer. It fell to pieces. It was a fraud. Oh, gracious me, an amazing thing. I'm sure that's not the end of the story, Miss Henshaw. Oh, no, Mr. Holmes. 
I wrote and told my brother what had happened. He became very suspicious and suggested that I investigate the credentials of the expert that examined the stone. I think I can finish the story for you. The supposed expert was a jewel thief who substituted a paste ruby for the real one. Destroyed the imitation and walked off with the treasure. It's no trick. Of course, you haven't been able to find any trace of the supposed expert. Well, that's the funny part of it, Mr. Holmes. Uncle Timothy and I gave a description to the police, but oh, it was a very vague one, I'm afraid. All the time, Uncle said the man reminded him of a colleague of his many years ago at the university, a professor of mathematics. He couldn't think of his name, but when we first saw the play a few nights ago, he was reminded of it. The name was Moriarty. Moriarty? But Moriarty's dead. Miss Henshaw, you say you uh, have been shadowed for some weeks. Yes, an Egyptian. You've stolen the ruby, Mr. Holmes. Why don't they leave me alone? That, Miss Henshaw, represents a, a very fascinating problem and one that I should be most happy to help you solve. Oh, thank you so much, Mr. Holmes. Oh, there go the lights again. The last act. Yes, the last act of this little play, but not, I fear, of Miss Henshaw's problems. Uh, let's meet after the act in Sir Claude's dressing room, shall we? <laughs> Well, Holmes, how did you enjoy the play? Very much, Sir Claude. May I introduce my old friend, Dr. Watson? How do you do, Sir Claude? How are you, Doctor? I see you've already made the acquaintance of Miss Henshaw. She, no doubt, has told you her troubles, eh? Yes, Sir Claude. And Mr. Holmes has promised to help me. Splendid. Uh, tell me, Watson, how did you like the play? It was uh, very interesting, Sir Claude. Not quite accurate, of course. Well, you, you have to allow us a little dramatic license, you know. Uh, what did you think of Rodney, the man who was playing you, Doctor? Well, since you mention it, I think the fellow needs to study diction. He, he mumbles so much, I couldn't understand a word he said. <laughs> oh, come now, old fellow. I, I think there are times when you're a little hard to understand yourself. Oh, rubbish. Sir Claude, I oh, hope so you'll uh, meet us at the Diogenes Club, and then we can go out and have some supper. Excellent idea. I'll join you there after I've taken off my makeup. Splendid. I think I should be going home now, Sir Claude. I gave my address to Mr. Holmes so he knows where to get in touch with me. Very well, Miss Henshaw, and don't worry. I shall give your problem my undivided attention. I'll take you to your cab, my dear. Oh, well, there's no need to, Sir Claude. Nonsense, I insist. Goodbye. I'll be back in a moment. Good night, Miss Henshaw. Well, good night, good night. Strange business, Holmes. What, what do you make of it all? Very little as yet, but it's a fascinating problem. Sir Claude really seems to uh, have identified himself with the character of Sherlock Holmes. He gave me the impression that he feels quite capable of, of solving the case by himself. Oh, hello. Claude hasn't left, has he? Oh, no, Mr. Fellows. He's coming back in a moment. Uh -huh. <clears throat> How'd you like to play, gentlemen? Very much. Your own performance as Moriarty was most convincing. Yes, yes, indeed, sir. Congratulations, congratulations. A couple of times there, I had a strange feeling that you, you really were Moriarty. Well, that's very flattering, Doctor. Oh, Hello. Well, it sounds as if there's some trouble at the stage door. Hey, excuse me. Come on, Watson, let's follow him. Right. Hello, it's Sir Claude. He seems upset about something. Yes. What's happened, Sir Claude? Oh, there you are, Holmes. I, I just seen Miss Henshaw off in her cab when a foreign-looking fellow came out of a doorway and got into another cab. I heard him tell the driver to follow her. I, I tried to stop him, but... He got away. Must be the same man that we saw in our box during the play. Mr. Uh, Claude, uh, we have our address. I think we'll drive there at once and see that she's arrived safely. We'll join you later at the Diogenes Club. Well, Holmes, here we go. Off on another adventure? Yes, and one they may give us an opportunity of crossing swords with Moriarty once more. Oh, Moriarty's dead. He was killed when you and he fell over the precipice in 91. He was supposed to have been killed, just as I was, but his body was never found. It's impossible, or rather possible, that he returned to pour into the ears of Colonel Moran a story as unlikely and as true as the one I related to you on that April evening in 1894. One can never be sure of death, old chap, until one has touched the cold skin of a corpse. Dr. Watson's story will continue in just a few seconds. Hardly time for me to tell you about a really great Petri wine. Petri California Muscatel. Did you ever walk through a vineyard early in the morning and pick a big, juicy muscat grape right off the vine? Mm -mm. If you've ever done that, then you know what to expect when you taste Petri Muscatel. 
Petri Muscatel is the color of golden sunshine with a flavor to match. Serve Petri Muscatel after dinner some evening or serve it any time friends drop in. It's a wonderful way to express your hospitality with a wonderful wine, a Petri wine. <laughs> And now back to tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure. The famous pair have become involved in a strange mystery concerning a stolen ruby, a frightened girl, and an Egyptian who appears to be shadowing her. As we rejoin our story, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson are standing in a darkened alleyway adjoining the girl's house. Holmes, Holmes, look, look, look. That Egyptian fellow. He's pacing up and down in front of the house. Yes, therefore we may assume she's safely inside. Uh-huh. Seems to be giving up. He's, he's coming this way. Flatten yourself against the wall. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Who are you, please? We are friends of Miss Hanshaw, and we're very curious to know why you've been following her. I'm sorry, but I cannot answer your <clears> question, <throat> sir. Now, look here, my man. You're talking to, to Sherlock Holmes. You are Mr. Sherlock Holmes? I'm greatly honored to meet you, sir. All my life I have known of you. All my life I have admired you. Then in that case, perhaps you'll answer my questions. Uh, why have you been following Miss Hanshaw? Because it is my duty. What do you mean, your duty? Perhaps I should have said my destiny, Mr. Holmes. For two generations now, the family of Arabi, of which I am a humble member, have dedicated their lives to finding the stolen treasure of Ashut. What on earth has that got to do with Miss Hanshaw? Hmm? The treasure of Ashut is a giant ruby. It was stolen many years ago from the family of Muhammad Ali. A few months ago, Miss Hanshaw received a mysterious ruby. I have found out many things, Mr. Holmes. I have many sources of information. Then I must regard you in the light of a, a rival detective in this case. I heartily call myself a detective, Mr. Holmes. My life is dedicated to only one problem. Miss Hanshaw now says the jewel was stolen from her. I do not believe it. That is why I watch her. If I am wrong this time, and I do not think I am wrong, then my quest must go on. Always it will go on. Permit me to wish you the best luck, sir. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. Good night, gentlemen. Oh, good night, good night. Sure, we shall meet again. Oh, why did you let him go, Holmes? Why not? He's frightening Miss Hanshaw. But not molesting her, old chap. In fact, it might be a good thing if someone is keeping an eye on her. And meanwhile, Watson, let's see if we can find a cab and get back to the Diogenes Club. I don't want to keep Claude waiting. <laughs> Has the Claude Horton arrived yet? Yes, Mr. Holmes. He and another gentleman came in about five minutes ago. They went up to the library. The other gentleman has just left. I see. Thank you. This way, Watson. I'm sorry, Sir Claude. We've kept you waiting. We took a little longer, but... Sir Claude! Great heaven! What's the matter with him? Holmes! I... I... I found the answer. Too late. It's... It's... No, 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 sir. Don't try and stand up. You're, you're ill. What are you trying to tell me? The ruby. The ruby. Moriarty. The answer. The answer's in the book. In the book. Mr. Claude. Holmes. He's been stabbed. He's dead. Just as he was trying to give me a message. He was muttering something about the ruby and Moriarty. And twice he said, it's in the book. Yes, there's a book still in his hand. It's a copy of the tales of Edgar Allan Poe. His thumbs mark the page. It's the story of the purloined letter. Thank you, Sir Claude. You delivered your message. Come on, Watson. If we want to catch a murderer and a thief. We must go back to the Savoy Theatre as quickly as we can. <laughs> Why do you suppose Sir Claude was murdered? Because I was too curious. Been investigating the problem of the stolen ruby and found out something. Something that he promised to tell me at supper, you remember? And so he was killed by a man who came with him to the club tonight. Fortunately, he gave me a clue by indicating Poe's story of a purloined letter. But I still don't see that how that helps you. Well, it leads us to the ruby. The premise of Poe's story is that the most obvious hiding place is the safest. Now, what uh, a physical object was most prominent on the stage in tonight's play? By Jove. Uh, a ruby. Exactly. 
How better can you hide a stolen ruby than by exhibiting it night after night as a stolen ruby before the eyes of thousands? Well, you mean you expect to find it in the in the property room backstage? Precisely. That and a murderer. Wait, Polisky. Come on, Watson. Do you have your revolver, old chap? Yeah, yes, I do. Well, keep it handy. Our uh, visit may not be unexpected. I'm locked. That's good. Come on. Look, Holmes. Look. The doorkeeper. He's slumped over his desk. Hmm. He's been given chloroform. We'll take the liberty of borrowing his lantern. Oh, an eerie atmosphere. About a dark and empty theater. In the home. Now, where were the stage properties we kept, I wonder? Hold the lantern a little higher, will you, old fellow? Yeah. That's it. Ah, look over there. A large cabinet. It's marked. Property department. And it's unlocked. Oh, this is frighteningly easy. Let's look out for a trap. Now, let's see. Look, look. There's a ruby lying on that tray. Yes. Hold it up under the lantern, Watson. Exactly. It's as I thought. This is no paste stage property. It's a genuine ruby. In the light of this lantern, it's very hard to... Down, Watson, quick! He nearly got us. Smashed our lantern. Yes, he's got an air rifle, a powerful one, too, confront. There's no flash to indicate where he's firing from. Of course, he's baited his trap so neatly that he knows exactly where we are. I'm going to take a shot at him. I can't see anything, but at least it'll let him know we're armed. Now move your position quickly, Watson. Just missed me, Holmes. This is hopeless shooting in the dark. Yes. I've got to switch the stage lights on. Keep him occupied, old fellow, will you? While I try to find the light switches. I got him. But he can still shoot, confound it. Yes, well, I found the light switch. Keep your eyes skinned, Watson. I'm turning it on. There he is, Holmes. Up in that box. Getting away. After him, Watson. We can jump over the footlights into the box. Ah! I'm afraid the bird has flown, Watson. I should have remembered that theater exit doors always open from the inside. No, no, he didn't get away, Holmes. Look on the floor. It's that Egyptian fellow. I hope you haven't wounded him too badly, no, old I chap. I don't care if I have. He was trying to kill us. No, it's only a shoulder wound. He's fainted, infernal scoundrel. No, he's a very gallant man. Undoubtedly, he was trying to save us as you shot him just now. Holmes, what on earth are you talking about? Obviously, Moriarty. No, Watson, Moriarty just escaped through the door you heard clang a few moments ago. Then what's this man doing here? As a good detective, undoubtedly, he followed us. Perhaps he preceded us. When Moriarty started shooting, this man tried to capture him and got wounded by you pains. Then who is Moriarty? He must be someone connected with this theater. It's obvious. Moriarty is Moriarty. What? You mean Frank Ferrers, the fellow that played the part on the stage? Again, remember Poe's story of a purloined letter. But why didn't, didn't you recognize him? Oh. Remember, I haven't seen him for 20 years, and you haven't forgotten his genius for disguise, have you? What incredible audacity. How bad could Moriarty conceal himself than by announcing nightly to the theatre-going public that he was Professor Moriarty? Then he killed Sir Claude. Of course he did. Sir Claude must have persuaded Moriarty to go to the club with him. Probably he hoped to expose him in front of me, but Moriarty found out that uh, Sir Claude knew too much. Yes. So he stabbed him. Rush back here to bait his trap for us. Yes, 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 yes. But, but how did he know that we'd uh, we'd walk into it? Well, he knew that if Sir Claude had guessed his secret, then I said would, and so he was waiting for us. Ah, oh, oh. hello. He's coming too. How are you feeling, my man? The, the ruby. The ruby. Did you find the ruby? Yes. Here it is, sir. Tell me, is it the ruby of? Muhammad Ali? No. No. It is a fine stone, but it is not the one for which I have searched all my life. And so my endless quest must go on and on and on. He's fainted again. Ah, poor boy. And miss, I made it this case, Watson. Oh, I don't know. You recovered the ruby? Yes, look at it, old fellow. Before I turn it over to Miss Hanshaw, look at it well. Probably its every facet stands for a bloody deed. It's a beautiful stone. And yet this lovely bauble costs Sir Claude his life. And that devil Moriarty still goes free. But one day, Watson, and may the day come soon, I shall meet Moriarty again. 
And when that happens and I finally bring him to justice, then and only then, can you write Finney to the character of Sherlock Holmes? Well, Doctor, that was kind of an exciting story. Tell me, did the Egyptian recover from his bullet wound? Yes, indeed he did, and rather quickly, too, Mr. Foreman. I felt very badly about shooting him, but of course, uh, I couldn't help it. Of course not. Uh, but you know, if I had to shoot someone accidentally, I, I wish it had been the, the actor who portrayed me on the stage. Wretched fellow mumbled all, all over the place. <laughs> oh, don't worry about that. After all, you did recover the ruby. Yes, and a beautiful stone it was. The color of, uh, well, uh, the color of a fine glass of port when the light shines through it. By a fine port, I take it you're talking about a Petri port? Is there any other kind? <laughs> well, all kidding aside, <laughs> Doctor, Petri port, like all Petri wines, is good wine. And I can tell you why very simply. Petri took time to bring you good wine. You see, the Petri family has been making wine for a good many generations, since way back in the 1800s. And because the Petri business has always been family-owned, everything the family has ever learned about the art of making wine, they've been able to hand down from father to son. From father to son. That adds up to a lot of skill and a lot of experience when it comes to turning plump, juice-filled California grapes into clear, fragrant, delicious wine. So when you want a wine for any occasion, obviously you can't go wrong with a Petri wine. Because Petri took time to bring you good wine. And now, Dr. Watson, what story do you have lined up for us next week? Oh, uh, now let me see. Next week, Mr. Foreman, I'm going to tell you a most unusual adventure that occurred to Sherlock Holmes and me early in the last World War. It took place in Flanders and concerned a famous British general, uh, an actress, and a German firing squad. Boy, that sounds like a real thriller. Well, see you here next week. No, no, no. Uh, not here, Mr. Foreman, remember? Oh, of course. Next week, we're going to be at the Paramount Theater in Hollywood for the 7th War Loan Drive. That's quite right. Ladies and gentlemen, I can't invite you all to my home for one of our broadcasts, but we can get together next week at the Paramount Theater in Hollywood. You can get a free ticket for our broadcast by buying a war bond. And I sincerely hope that you will do this so that we can see you next week at this time. <laughs> Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is based on an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventure of the Second Stain. Mr. Rathbone appears to the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce to the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. From the stage of the Paramount Theater in Hollywood, Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us about another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. You know something? If right now it were possible for me to ask every one of you what you had for dinner this evening... I'll bet a good many of you would say chicken. Chicken is an all-American favorite. But boy, you just haven't tasted chicken till you've tried it together with a glass of well-chilled Petri California Sauterne. Petri Sauterne is a perfect mealtime wine, just made to go with chicken. That Petri Sauterne is a white wine, delicate in color, and mmm, mmm, what a flavor. A flavor that comes right from the heart of luscious, sun-ripened grapes. You can just taste those wonderful grapes. And I'll tell you something... That Petri Sauterne is pretty much on the terrific side when served with fish or any kind of seafood, too, and that's a fact. But say, whenever you serve that Petri Sauterne, remember you can serve it proudly 
because the name Petri is the proudest name in the history of American wines. And now for our weekly doctor's appointment. Let's knock on his library door and see if... There's no point in doing that, Mr. Slattery. I'm right behind you. Oh, hello, Dr. Watson. Don't tell me you've been stalking me. <laughs> no, my boy. I was on the patio and I heard your footsteps, so I thought that I'd, I'd come in and fetch you. Let's go back and sit out there, shall we? It's, it's a beautiful evening. That's fine with me, Doctor. Ah, here we are. Now settle yourself down in a chair and, and light a cigarette, if you have one. I'll get on with my story. Well, last week you told us it concerned an adventure that you and Sherlock Holmes had in Flanders during the First World War. That's right, Mr. Slattery, did. I thought that you and the great man had retired at that period. We had, my boy, but it was only natural that as soon as the war broke out, we both offered our services in any capacity that might help our country. Of course, and how did tonight's story begin, Doctor? It was in the winter of that first year. Things weren't going very well for the Allies. The Germans were advancing on Paris, and the picture was looking very black. It was just 24 hours before the famous Battle of the Marne began, the battle that changed the early course of the war, when Holmes told me that we had to go up to the front lines on a secret mission. We'd been in Paris for several weeks, where Holmes had just solved the case of the missing aide de I was anxious to get back to England and my work in the war hospitals, but of course this new summons was in the nature of a command. And so... Late on a rainy September afternoon, Holmes and I, with the boom of gunfire in our ears, found ourselves in the front seat of a staff car, slushing and jolting its way towards the battlefield. I'm driving too fast for you, gentlemen. No, Sergeant, not at all. No, no, you're doing a splendid job. Oh, my man, look out, considering the state of the road. Thank you, sir. Uh, hello. The gunfire's getting nearer, Holmes. Yes, old fellow. I imagine we haven't much further to go, have we, Sergeant? No, sir, we're nearly there. Did you notice the two civilians in the, in the back seat, Holmes? Yes. Handsome woman and a distinguished-looking man, several years her senior. I wonder who they are. I'll tell you. He's a Shakespearean actor of some note, oh. though he never achieved the fame to which he thinks he's entitled. I shouldn't be at all surprised if he feels that he's been slighted and not receiving a knighthood. But Holmes, um, that's amazing. How can you possibly deduce all that from just looking at the man as we got into the car? Elementary, my dear fellow, I didn't deduce it. We saw him twice last year in the London theatre, if you remember. What? His name is Maitland Morris. As for his biography, he's a friend of my brother, Mike Crofts. He told me about him. Well, what do you suppose he's doing up here near the front line? His brother is General Sir Stanley Morris was in command of this particular front, and it would seem reasonable to presume that his brother has come up here to give a performance for the front-line troops. Ah, I suppose this hut is as far as we can drive, Sergeant. I'm afraid so, sir. We are four miles from the front line now. You'll have to clear your papers here. Uh, see that ruined farmhouse there, sir? Yes, Sergeant. Is that the General's headquarters? Yes, sir. Come on, Watson. Good Lord, it's pelting with rain. Yeah, let's make a dash for it. Oh, who goes there? Friend. Give the password. St. Crispin. Pass friends and show your papers. How did you know the password, Holmes? I was given it before we left Paris, old chap. Oh, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, isn't it? Yes, Captain. I'm Captain Maxwell, uh, General Morris's aide de camp. He asked me to escort you up to his headquarters. Uh, by the way, weren't Maitland Morris and his wife in the car with you? Yes, they're just behind us. Oh, splendid. I'm afraid I'll have to ask to see your papers. Yes, of course. Here's, uh, here's my permit, Captain mm -hmm. Maxwell. Thank you. I know you both, of course, but we can't afford to take any chances when they're this close to the enemy lines. Let's see. Oh, yeah, yes, that's fine, Doctor. Everything's in order. All right. Uh, good. Yours, please, Mr. Holmes. Uh, here you are. Thanks. Oh. Who goes there? Friend. There's the rescue the party now. Word? Oh, good. Well, this is quite an oh, order, Mr. Holmes. Show your papers. Oh, oh, there you are, Captain Maxwell. Oh, hello, sir. Hello, Mrs. Murray. How are you, Captain Maxwell? Well, you both met Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, I suppose? Well, no, we haven't, even though we drove up in the same car. Natural reserve of us Britishers, I suppose. How are you, Mr. Holmes? How do you do, sir? I know your brother Mycroft very well. Uh, how are you, Doctor? I'm glad to meet you, Mr. Morris. I saw you a couple of times in the theatre last year and enjoyed your performances very much. Well, thank you, sir. 
Well, then you must know my wife, my leading lady. How do you do, gentlemen? How do you do, Mr. Mr. Morris? Uh, can I see your papers, Mr. Morris? Uh, just a matter of form. You oh, understand? Yes, 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 of course, of course. Uh, Mrs. Morris, I presume you and your husband are going to give a performance tonight for the men going up the front line. Yes, Doctor. We're very flattered. They've asked us to do some Shakespearean things. Oh, yes. Although I should have thought something a little lighter would have been more appropriate. The general, he's Maitland's brother, you know, seemed to think differently. Well, my dear, show Captain Maxwell your papers. Then we can all go along and see my brother Stanley. Very well, Maitland. Mr. Morris, I shall look forward to hearing your reading of Shakespeare's St. Crispin speech from Henry V tonight. Well, bless my soul, Holmes. How did you know I was planning to do it? Well, the setting is so perfect and the time so appropriate, I can't conceive an English actor who could resist the temptation. Oh. I, I noticed that your brother appreciated the fact in naming today's password. Yes, it's amazingly appropriate. You know, it's almost 500 years ago to the day that the Battle of Agincourt took place. Well, let's hope that the results of the forthcoming battle will be equally successful for England. Yes, indeed. Oh, by the way, Holmes, this will probably seem rather silly to you, but I'm an inveterate autograph collector... And I have my book here with me. I, I wonder if you'd mind signing it. I should be very glad to, Mr. Morris. Give me a pen, will you, Watson? Uh, uh, here we are, Holmes. You'll find yourself among quite distinguished company in that <laughs> book, sir. So I see. And a little patty. Crown Prince of Norway. Hello. Field Marshal von Tocknitz. Oh, yes. He was one of my admirers when I played in Munich before the war. I suppose now that our countries are fighting, I should tear that page out. You know, I cannot help but feel that art and the appreciation of art are independent of national hatred. Quite so, sir. I myself still have a medal presented to me by the University of Leipzig for some trifling services. There you are, Mr. Morris. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Holmes. A notable addition to my collection. Uh, I shall be very glad to sign your book for you, Mr. Morris, if you'd like me to. Uh, that's very kind of you, Doctor. Oh, Captain Maxwell, oh, 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 if our uh, permits are all in order, don't you think we should be moving along? Uh, just what I was going to suggest myself. Uh, I'll take you all straight, though, to General Morris's headquarters. General Morris, uh, may I introduce Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson? How do you do, sir? How are you, General? Uh, how do you do? Uh, know a lot about you. Uh, long way from Baker Street, isn't it? Yes, indeed, sir. Uh, where's that brother of mine? Oh, there you are, Maitland. Uh, Cynthia, uh, how nice to see you both. Oh, it's good to see you again, Stanley. Hello there, Stanley. Hmm, the men will be glad you arrived. They're looking forward to your show tonight. <laughs> We're very flattered that they want to hear us do some Shakespeare. Oh, rubbish, old boy. With you and Cynthia up there on the platform, you could read the telephone book and they'd love you. Oh, very kind. <laughs> By the way, you'll find the stage very primitive. Just a few trestles and a large tent and a curtain made of army blankets. And your dressing room will be even worse. Oh, don't worry <laughs> about our comfort, Stanley. As long as we cheer the boys up, that's the important thing. Yes, of course. By the way, what program do you have mapped out for us? Well, I thought we'd have two shows. Uh, the tent's not large enough to hold everybody at once. Anybody, anyway, uh, uh, we have to keep up an alert all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, think you can manage two uh, separate shows? Oh, of course I can, Stanley. I may look old, but I don't feel it. <laughs> you don't even look at your scoundrel. <laughs> Thank you. Perhaps we could take a look at the stage and equipment, eh? Oh, certainly. Uh, Captain Maxwell, uh, take them over to the tent and show them what the facilities are, will you? Right, sir. Will you follow me? Oh, yes, of course. See you later, Stanley. Come along, my dear. All right. I'm glad you're here, Holmes. I'm sure I can speak quite freely in front of Dr. Watson. Oh, yes, with perfect freedom, sir. He's my colleague, and he's an old army man himself. Really? What regiment, Doctor? The 5th Northumberland Fusilier, sir. Later attached to the Berkshires in Afghanistan and, and wounded in, in the Battle of Mainwan. Really? <laughs> then I'm sure I can speak freely in front oh, of well, um, <laughs> Holmes, uh... You know why you're up here so near the front line, don't you? I have a very shrewd suspicion, sir. Yeah, I thought you had. That's why I asked for you to be sent here. You asked for me to be sent here, General. Yes, I, I think I understand. Well, I wish I did. Uh, you will, Doctor, in due time. In the meanwhile, gentlemen, I'll have an orderly show you to your quarters. Thank you, sir. And, uh, Holmes, uh, take a look around, will you, and keep your ears open. Uh, where... Comparatively a little distance from the German front lines, and yet there's a very puzzling silence just now. Yes, I noticed that, sir, and half an hour ago on our way up, there was, there was quite a lot of shilling. Exactly. It's unnatural and rather frightening at a time like this. You see, we're attacking at dawn. The enemy might be trying to infiltrate spies, and the whole success of this battle depends on a surprise attack. I quite understand, sir. Come on, Watson. <laughs> Holmes, Holmes, the 
The first performance starts in a few minutes, you know. They're all there waiting here. Well, why are we tramping about out here in the, in the mud and the rain? I've got a pipe or two in the open air would clear our brains. Yes, a <clears> pipe <throat> in the open air is one thing, but a pipe in a downpour of rain is another. Was it raining? Oh, didn't even notice it. I was listening to the silence. What do you mean? Thousands upon thousands of Germans. Armed Germans. Full of a blind fanatical hatred and desire to kill. Are crouched in trenches only a mile or two from here. Surrounding us are an equal number of English boys, also armed. And with the will, if not the desire, to fight. Because they know their cause is the cause of freedom and justice. All these thousands poised, ready to pounce on each other and fight to the death. And yet, beyond that patter of rain, there isn't a, isn't a sound to break the stillness of a September evening. Huh. Strange world we live in, old chap. You're being unusually rhetorical, Holmes. Yes, I am, aren't I? Let's be a little more practical, shall we? I wonder what is wrong with the actors tonight. Act? Oh, why do you ask that? Well, a little while ago, I noticed Mrs. Morris in a great state of excitement going towards the farmhouse where the general is. Then she went back to her own quarters, and now she seems to be headed in our direction. Is there anything wrong, Mrs. Morris? It's Maitland. What's wrong with the madam? He's disappeared. Disappeared? What's happened? We were in the tent together, making up for our performance. When an orderly came in with a message. Maitland said it was from his brother. Slipped on a raincoat and went out, saying he'd be back in a few moments. I waited and waited. And after a while, I got worried and I went over to see the general myself. He said that he'd sent no message. And that he hadn't seen any sign of Maitland. Good Lord, what could have happened to him? I don't know, Doctor, but I'm frightened. What shall I do, Mr. Holmes? You're a brave woman, Mrs. Morris. Brave? I don't know, Mr. Holmes. Why? Because the show must go on. I shall take your husband's place. Sir Holmes, something's happened to Matron Morris. He's in danger. He might yeah, true, be... Watson, true. Huh? But a thousand men inside that tent are in mortal danger, too. Tomorrow morning, many of them may be corpses on the fields of Flanders. But tonight, they've been promised a show. Do you think that you can do it, Holmes? Oh, I think I can, with the help of Mrs. Morris. I can't do it, Mr. Holmes. You can, Mrs. Morris, and you will. If only to uphold that great tradition of the theatre that the show must go on. <laughs> We'll hear the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just a few seconds. Tom, I'd like to take to tell you that if you've got a butcher who has meat and you've got the points to get that meat, don't forget to bring home a bottle of Petri California Burgundy. Tell you why. That Petri Burgundy is a rich red mealtime wine that's wonderful with any meat or meat dish. That's a fact. Petri Burgundy can make a banquet out of a hamburger. And boy, Petri Burgundy and old-fashioned Irish stew are bosom companions. Just get yourself some Petri Burgundy and share it with your family. Petri Burgundy is the best friend a good meal ever had. And now, back to tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure. It is just before the Battle of the Marne in the First World War, and Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson are at headquarters a few miles behind the front-line trenches. A famous Shakespearean actor who was to give a performance for the troops has mysteriously disappeared, and the great detective has taken his place at the last minute. As we rejoin our story, Sherlock Holmes, alone on the improvised stage, is delivering a Shakespearean speech before a spellbound audience. This happy breed of men, this little world, this precious stone set in a silver sea, which serves it in the office of a wall or as a moat defensive to a house against the envy of less happier lands. This blessed plot, this earth, this realm, this England. Holmes, that shot, are you all right? Yes, old chap. Fortunately, I started to leave the stage as the shot was fired. The bullet just missed me. I heard it splinter some wood nearby. But who on earth would want to shoot you? That's what we've got to find out, though I think it more likely that the shot was intended... For me, it was not intended for me, but for Maitland Morris, the man for whom I'm substituting. Well, even so, who'd want to shoot him? Oh, don't ask me so many questions, old fellow. Let's see what clues we can find. Now, the shock was fired from outside the tent from behind me. Yes, look there. See the hole in the tent there? By Jove, yes. The footlights would outline your shadow on the back of the tent. Whoever it must have, must have, must have fired at your silhouette. The question is, where did the bullet embed itself? Aha. Uh -huh. Look here, Watson. Have you got a pen knife? Yeah, wait a minute. Here, yeah, Holmes. This shouldn't be hard to extract. Look at this splintered tent pole. 
A minute. There. There we are. Excellent. Huh. Very interesting. Well, what's so interesting about it? Just a revolver bullet, isn't it? Oh, no, it isn't, Watson. What? It's far from just a revolver bullet. This bullet was fired from a German Luger pistol. A German pistol? There must have been a spy here behind our lines. That's a reasonable enough assumption, as we may be sure that no English soldier would carry such a weapon and face inspection. Come on, I want to talk to Mrs. Morris. <laughs> Mrs. Morris, I want you to be very frank with me. But of course, Mr. Holmes. You know why your husband's missing, don't you? No, no, I don't. Have you found out anything? Come, come, madam. Why keep up this pretense any longer? I know that your husband is a spy, or at least a, a great sympathizer with the German cause. The general's brother a spy? Good Lord. How dare you say that? Because it's true. Foreign office have been suspicious of his sympathies for some time. His own brother knew it. That's why he asked to have me sent up here to keep an eye on him during his visit. It is true. Why should I keep up the pretense any longer? You see, Maitland was a disciple of Stuart Houston Chamberlain. Oh, who was this Stuart Houston Chamberlain? An Englishman who married one of Richard Wagner's daughters and became a German citizen and an arch enemy of England. I tried to dissuade Maitland. I implored him to consider his British heritage, his brother's name and mine. But Maitland was a strange man. His life was one of frustration and envy. Envy of his brother, I suppose. Yes. When Stanley was knighted, it, it hurt Maitland terribly. He said it was typical that the English would knight a soldier and yet leave a great artist like himself unrecognized. That in Berlin, they really understood and rewarded the artist. Well, if the authorities knew that, it's amazing they allowed him to come so close to the front lines at a time like this. Oh, it was at the general's request. He wanted to plead with my husband to warn him that his secret was known. And now Maitland's gone over to the German lines. Oh, it's terrible. It's worse than that. It's, it's disastrous. He can give them information as to the strength of our, our troops here. He knows the password. He might even know the hour of the attack is time to start. How did your husband expect to enter the German lines in safety, Mrs. Morris? He speaks fluent German, Mr. Holmes. I fancy the autograph book he was carrying containing the signature of Field Marshal von Tocknitz was in reality his pass through the German lines. You told the general that his brother was gone, of course. I haven't been able to. He moved up to the front line position immediately after the first performance. Though I had warned him what I thought Maitland was planning to do. I think he intended to give his performance first, then cross the lines immediately afterwards. But something must have made him change his mind. Perhaps he suspected I'd warned the general. Anyhow, as you know, when I got back to our quarters, he'd gone. Uh, did he leave any note, madam? Yes, he did. Here it is. Thank you. I have gone, my dear. Try and understand and forgive if you can. You wouldn't come with me, and so I'm taking what is left of my heart and my hopes where they belong, among the friends that understand and appreciate me. It is something stronger than love and blood and country that makes me do this. It is something dearer to me than life itself. Hmm. Dearer to me than life itself. Oh, how could he? How could he? The shame of this will kill poor Stanley. Mr. Holmes, will you break the news to him? I know it's cowardly of me, but I just can't tell him myself. Don't worry, Mrs. Morris. I'll tell him. Dr. Watson and I will ask Cap Captain Maxwell to escort us to the General's frontline headquarters. In the meantime, try and keep calm. We'll tell him. If you will wait in the dugout, Mr. Holmes, I'll tell the general that you're here. Thank you, and be sure to let him know the urgency of the matter. Yes, sir. Holmes, this is a dreadful visit. Yes, it is, Watson. Though if my plans work out correctly, I think the success of tomorrow's battle may not be imperiled. What plan? Listen. You know, Holmes, a strange silence from the German lines since we came here might be accounted for by the fact that they knew Maitland was making his getaway. They wouldn't want to risk wounding such a valuable spy. Quite possibly. What I still don't understand is who shot at you with a German pistol and why. You're well, being very dense, old fellow. Surely it's obvious that... Here comes General Morris now. Poor devil. This is going to be a dreadful shock to him. Hello, Holmes. Uh, Dr. Watson? General Morris, I'm afraid that I have bad news for you. Your brother has gone over to the German lines. Maitland did go there. 
I should have put him under an armed guard as soon as he came here, but, but I thought I could reason with him, appeal to his sense of honor. Instead of which you tried to shoot him, sir, but uh, fortunately for me, you missed. You see, I took his place at the first performance. But that shot was fired from a German pistol. True. That was when I first knew the general had fired the shot. But I still don't see how you could now. Only a high-ranking officer, not subject to inspection, could carry a non-regulation firearm. You're an old army man, you should know that. In any case, you'll observe that the general carries a luger at his waist. Great heavens, Holmes. Uh, I thought I was firing at Maitland. Uh, I had no idea that, that it was you. You intended to kill your own brother, sir? Yes. And I'm sorry I failed. Uh, I'd rather see my brother dead than alive and a traitor to mm. his country. But now he, he's safely in the German lines. Heaven knows what secrets he may be imparting. Uh, one thing we can be certain of. Uh, our chance of a surprise attack in the morning is gone. Possibly not, sir. Oh, what do you mean? You see, I took the liberty of altering your brother's credentials quite extensively. How, Holmes? I knew of his German sympathies. Mycroft had given me a great deal of information about him, and so I took it on myself to decide that it was unsafe to allow him so near the enemy lines with his own identification on him. Well, what did you do, Holmes? I took the liberty, sir, of stealing his autograph book, the one containing the magical signature of Field Marshal von Tocknitz. I have it in my pocket now. I think we shall find within its pages a code concealed in the various autographs, giving valuable information to the enemy. Good Lord. I also switched uh, military permits on him. I felt that in the event that he did go over to the German lines, his welcome might be less cordial if they were under the impression that they'd uh, captured Sherlock Holmes. To make that identification doubly sure, I also slipped in his pocket a slight souvenir of my own. Why, Joe Holmes, you mean that medal that was presented to you by the University of Leipzig? Exactly, old fellow. I no longer wish to uh, own a decoration given me by a country of barbarians, and it seemed a rather neat and effective way of returning it to them. So the Germans will think they've captured Sherlock Holmes? Yes, sir, and unless I'm much mistaken, he'll receive very short shrift of their hands. Yes, they hate you. There's your answer, sir. I'm sorry. Well, don't be sorry, Holmes. It's better that way. Now his secret can die with him. Excuse me, sir. Uh, uh, yes, Maxwell, what is it? Would it be in order for me to return to headquarters now, sir? It's very nearly time for the second performance, and I've still been unable to trace the whereabouts of your brother. Well, my brother will not be acting tonight, I'm afraid. Holmes, I wonder if I might ask you to take his place once again. If you want me to, General. I do. Maitland had planned to do the St. Crispin speech from Henry V. Uh, he knew how much I loved him. I realize that, sir. Well, I was told the password up here. Well, can you remember the speech, Holmes? Oh, I think so. At any rate, I can try. Then do it for me, my dear fellow, will you? For me. I'll be very proud to do it, General. Goodbye and good luck. Thank you, Holmes. Captain Maxwell, uh, take them back to headquarters, will you? Uh, the men will be waiting for the performance. <laughs> And Crispian shall ne'er go by from this day to the ending of the world, but we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers, for he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. Be he ne'er so vile, this day shall gentle his condition. And gentlemen in England now abed shall think themselves accursed they were not here, and all their manhoods cheap, while any speaks that fought with us upon St. Crispian's Day. <laughs> Well, Doctor, that was a bit of an exciting adventure you Oh, no, I, I can still remember that awful feeling I had when I heard the shot in the tent and realized someone had tried to kill Holmes. He did have a narrow escape, didn't he? Well, Holmes always said there was no such thing as a narrow escape. He said you either escaped or you didn't. If you did, well, why worry? And if you didn't, uh, you couldn't worry. So what? <laughs> Quite a philosophy. I'd uh, like to discuss it with you further. Uh, over uh, a, a bottle of wine? Uh, how else? Uh, what kind of wine? Uh, naturally. Uh, uh naturally. Uh, you couldn't ask for a more delicious wine than Petri. That's because the Petri family knows how to make good wine. They ought to. They've been making fine wine ever since they started the Petri business way back in the 1800s. And because the business has always been family-owned and operated, well, they've been able to hand on from father to son, from father to son, all they've ever learned about the art of turning luscious grapes into fragrant, delicious wine. That's why no matter what type Petri wine you buy for any occasion, you can be sure it's good wine because Petri took time to bring you good wine. And now, Dr. Watson, how's about giving us a clue to next week's Sherlock Holmes well, adventure? Well, next week, Mr. Clatter, I'm going to tell you in a most unusual adventure in which Holmes and I are trapped in an airtight metal chamber. 
Our only companion being a murdered scientist. Well, sounds like a story we don't want to miss, Doctor. See you next week. Yes. Oh, just a second, Miss Nettie. Before we go, I, I just want to tell our listeners that tonight we're broadcasting from the stage of the Paramount Theatre here in Hollywood on behalf of the 7th Wall Owned Drive. The ticket of admission to the theatre was a war bond. I'm mentioning this to remind you, our friends, that you have an important part to play in making the 7th Wall Owned a success. Buy more and buy bigger bonds than ever before. They're needed to pay for new super forts, new jet-propelled fighters, newer and bigger weapons to lick Japan. Remember, in spite of the magnificent achievements of our forces in the Pacific, the Japanese war has just begun. So let's go all out for the mighty seventh war loan. <laughs> Tonight, Sherlock Holmes' adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is based on an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventures of the Blanched Soldier. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Oh, the Petri family took the time to bring you such good wine. So when you eat and when you cook, remember Petri wine. To make good food taste better, remember... Pet, pet, Petri This is Jack Slattery saying good night for the Petri family. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rabin and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine. I invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell about another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. Of course, I can't be as entertaining as Dr. Watson, but I can tell you something that's really worth knowing. Simply this. The best beginning a good meal ever had is a glass of Petri California Sherry. Petri Sherry is the perfect before-dinner wine. While you're waiting for dinner to be put on the table, pour yourself a glass of that clear, amber-colored Petri Sherry. Now, just sit back and sip it slowly. Take your time so you can thoroughly enjoy every single drop of that wonderful Petri flavor. And what a flavor that sherry has. Comes from the sun-ripened heart of wonderful California grapes. Now, you may be a real wine expert and know all about sherry wine, but believe me, until you've tried Petri sherry, you're really missing something, and no kidding. Serve Petri sherry alone, or serve it with canopies or appetizers. And by all means, serve it proudly. You can, because the letters P-E-T-R-I... Spell the proudest name in the history of American wines. Petri. And now for our weekly visit with the good Dr. Watson. Let's see if he's expecting us. Come in, come in, come in. Ah, good evening, Doctor. Uh, Good evening, Mr. Campbell. It's about time you got here. Draw up a chair and make yourself comfortable. Oh, thanks. Well, you have the old black dispatch box out again, I see. I suppose you've been going over your notes on tonight's venture. <laughs> That's right, my boy. And this may interest you. Mrs. Watson figured prominently in the story. She did? Yes, in fact, if it hadn't been for some remarkably quick thinking on her part, Holmes and I might have... Uh, <laughs> well, there I go again, telling you the end of the story before I forget it. Well, uh, how did it begin, Doctor? On a winter evening in 1887... I'd been married some months, and in consequence, I hadn't seen much of my old friend Sherlock Holmes. Oh, he was still living at Baker Street, I suppose. Yes, my boy, but we couldn't persuade him to come round and see us. From time to time, I'd heard some vague accounts of his doings, of his summons to Odessa, in the case of the Trepoff murder, and of his clearing up the singular tragedy of the Atkinson brothers. But to, uh, to get back to tonight's story, my wife and I had just finished an excellent dinner. I remember had set ourselves down for an evening of pleasant domesticity. She was stitching away on a piece of extra petit point, and I was at my desk balancing figures in the family account book. After a few moments, 
My wife looked up to me and said... John, dear, don't look so troubled. Oh? Was I looking troubled? Well, you've been scowling at that account book for ten minutes now. What's the matter, dear? Don't the figures add up correctly? Oh, yes, yes, they add up correctly. In fact, they tell a very pretty story. After buying my practice and setting up all my outstanding accounts, I find that we have nearly a hundred and fifty pounds left of the diary that Mr. Sholto settled upon you. A hundred and sixty, isn't it, dear? I was doing the same sum this morning. Oh, well, 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 but that's still 160. In any case, Mary, dear, the point I was going to make is that we, we don't need the money just now. My practice is picking up splendidly, and I was thinking that we might, uh, might invest it in something really sound, of course. Who's been talking to you, John? Dr. Wilson again. Well, uh, as it happens, I did bump into him at the hospital today. He can put us onto something very good in Peruvian silver. Uh, what do you think of the idea? Well, John, the, the fact is, I'd almost decided to make a business investment with it myself. I thought I'd surprise you. Well, uh, now, now uh, let me tell uh, you about it, John. Oh. Yesterday, when you were out on your rounds, yes. a most charming man called here. Oh, and yes. it's Ted Barber. He introduced himself as a friend of Mrs. Seth Forrester's. Well. He said he was certain we'd be interested in his new company. And he talked so convincingly that, well, uh, I'm afraid I almost promised him I'd buy some stock in the company. Oh, did you really? What, what uh... What sort of company is it? Well, I didn't quite understand that part of it. But it sounds wonderful. He left a prospectus. It's in the right-hand drawer of the desk. It's uh, something to do with a wonderful new metal that's been discovered by an American chemist. For Paradel or Paradis or something. Oh, well, let's have a look at what it says. A company formed to exploit the amazing new metal discovered by Dr. Paradis. Paradol preferred stock. The potentialities of this new alloy are measurable. The fourth dimension has been conquered. What? Spital dislocation is an accomplished fact. Oh, gracious me, my dear child. This prospectus is absolute poppycock. And now, John, you mustn't be stubborn. Well, I think at least we should investigate well, 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 well. The man said that if we went to the laboratories, Dr. Paradis would give us a demonstration himself. But, but Mary, dear, Mary, dear, the fourth dimension, I mean to say... Obviously, fraud. That's what everyone says when a new invention comes out. But this might be an opportunity for to make a lot of money, John. Mary, I do wish to it... please me, dear. Well, I can't argue with you for very long, Mary. All right, all right. I'll take you to the laboratory in the morning, but I warn you, I'll show this Dr. Paradis up for the charlatan that he is. <laughs> Dr. Paradis will be with you both in a moment. Well, thank you, my man. She's just concluding an experiment. She? Dr. Paradis is a woman, then? Oh, yes, madam, and a very brilliant one. Oh, excuse me. Oh, it's the last straw. The whole thing sounded like an obvious fraud, and now we get here and there are woman doctors at the back of it all. Just because she's a woman, it doesn't mean to say that... Uh... How do you do? I'm Dr. Paradis. Oh, how do you do, madam? I'm Dr. Watson, and this is my wife, Mrs. Watson. Oh, yes. Come into the laboratory, won't you? Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Paradis. Well, we're just wasting your time. We're not really interested in this at all, you know. John, feel... don't mutter. Well, Mr. Please. Barber told me that he had called on you, Mrs. Watson, and that you were very interested in my invention. Oh, yes, I am. That's why I persuaded my husband to come down with me and see a demonstration. I'll be most happy to show you everything I can. Here's a practical example of the application of my work. The chamber you see in front of you is made completely of my new alloy. Well, what's the thing do? It's just a great metal box with a lot of dials and switches and things. Why is it so big? Do, <laughs> do people get inside it? They can. What? Though if they do, they're liable to find themselves transported many miles from here. Yes, Come yes. inside, won't you? <laughs> oh, what a lot of nonsense. Now, John. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I give you a demonstration. Good. I want you both to see that there is no exit from inside this chamber. No trap doors or anything. The only exit is the door we just came through. Yes, it's just like an airtight metal room. Stuffy in here, isn't it? Now let's go outside again. I'll show you how the machine operates. Albert! Uh, yes, Dr. Paradis. I'm going to demonstrate the Paradol chamber to Dr. and Mrs. Watson. Oh, very well. Uh, the usual time? Yes, please, Albert. Now, my assistant goes inside the chamber. I close this metal door on him, so... What are you going to do with him? Within a matter of seconds, he will be seven miles from here. Oh, gracious me, really, madam, you Please, can't Dr. expect Watson, us to believe... you're a scientific man. <laughs> At least give me the opportunity of demonstrating my work. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Now, I adjust these dials. 
Turn on the electrical generator and... Good Lord, what an amazing business. Now open the door, Dr. Watson, and look inside, please. Great Scott, he's gone. I don't believe it. Dr. Paradise, will you explain this to me? Gladly. My metal paradol is an unnatural alloy. What? It causes a dislocation in the warp of space and enables us to enter the fourth dimension. <laughs> you see, time <laughs> is a dimension. Any uh -huh. object in the past, present, or future can be described precisely in three dimensions of space and one of time. Yes, but this machine of yours... Um... The alloy of paradol, combined with the great forces of electricity, has created a new force. Uh -huh. This element is controlled by these dials, and uh -huh. it is possible to move in four dimensions at once. Thus, bodies or other objects can be transported great distances away, all in the twinkling of an eye. Yes, I coined the word to describe the process. Teleportation, I call it. Teleportation? Well, I'm completely confused. All my scientific training tells me this is impossible, and yet, uh, uh, I wonder if you'd give us another demonstration. Certainly. Perhaps you yourself would like to be teleported somewhere. Certainly not. Good gracious, we uh, know. No, we no, I, I think anyway. John would be very unhappy in the fourth dimension. He wouldn't belong. Yes, you, you said that any objects could be moved. How about that brown paper parcel on the table over there? Certainly. It only contains some company circulars. I suggest you write your initials on it so that you identify it later. Oh, very well. J-H-W. There you are. Where do you want it dispatched to? Send it to my house. I'll give you the address. That won't be necessary. Mary, this is, this is an amazing business. Isn't it, John? Exciting, too. There we are. Now I adjust the dials once more and... <laughs> The parcel is already at your house. Oh, it's impossible. Come along, Mary. Let's get a cab and race back there as fast as we can. Well, yes, goodbye, yes. Doctor. Good, goodbye, Doctor. Goodbye. Goodbye. Now, dear, John, you must admit you're just as excited as I am. Well, I confess that I'm enormously intrigued. Let me just get my, my latch front door key up. Here we are. It's Dr. Paradis, a devilishly clever woman. Even so, my intelligence tells me... It's impossible for the package to have reached here before us. Ah, here we are. Ah, there you are, Master. Mum, just in time for lunch. Tell me, Annie, did the package arrive for us? Oh, yes, it did, Mum. I put it on our table. Great what? Scott. Uh, how was it delivered, Annie? Well, now, that's the funny thing about it, sir. I don't know. I went out to polish the bra on the door knocker a few minutes ago, and there was the parson lying on the doorstep. No one had rung the bell or anything. I didn't know how it got there. <laughs> Thank you, Annie. You, you can go now. Yes, ma'am. Well, John, what do you see now? There's a miracle has been performed. I don't believe my eyes. Look, there are my initials on the package. Mary, I think that if you don't mind, after lunch, I'll... You'll go around to Baker Street and tell Sherlock Holmes about this. Oh, do you mind, dear? Of course not, dear. Good. It'll be nice to see Holmes again anyway. <laughs> Dr. Watson, how nice to see you again. Hello, dear. Mrs. Hudson. How are you, my dear? Oh, I'm just fine. Now you're looking grand, sir. Marriage agrees with you, oh, if you don't mind my saying so. Oh, thank you, <laughs> Mrs. Hudson. Is, uh, is Mr. Holmes in? Aye, sir. And I'm very glad you're seeing him. He's no been acting like himself lately. Oh, really? Locking his door. And only unlocking it for me when I give him a, a, a password. And he's hardly touched his food for the last three days. Tell you the truth, Dr. Watson, I'm awful worried about him. Well, well, I'll go up to him. He'll be glad to see you, I'm sure. Yes? Who is it? It's me, Watson. Watson? Oh, possibly. I'm not taking any chances. Holmes, this is ridiculous. Surely you know my voice after all these years? John H. Watson. Tell me what your middle initial stand for, and I'll let you in. It stands for Hamish. What, my dear fellow? How are you? I am fine and delighted to see you again, Holmes. Uh, incidentally, why all this rigmarole about locked doors and passwords? Well, uh, Professor Mariotti has decided that it's high time to settle his score with me. There have been several attempts on my life lately. Twice I've been attacked in the streets, and only today a shot was fired at me. Through the uh, window you see broken there. Lord Holmes, you must be careful. I am being very careful. That's why I indulged what you refer to as all this rigmarole. But, uh, well, enough of my problems. 
What's on your mind? There's a sparkle in your eye and an air of excitement that tells me that you've uh, some news to impart. Well, I, I must say there is something. Of course there is, my dear fellow. Come on, tell me about it. You ever hear of a new metal called Paradol and its inventor, Dr. Paradis? Oh, yes, yes, indeed I have. I received a prospectus concerning it the other day. Well, uh, what, uh, what do you think of the idea? Oh, obviously it's rubbish designed to fool a gullible public into buying shares. Don't tell me that, uh, you were taking me advice. Oh, no, 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 of course not, Holmes. Naturally, as a scientific man, I knew it was rubbish. My, uh, my wife, however, had become a little involved in the concern. And so today, to prove to her that the whole thing was a fraud, we went down to the laboratory and met this Dr. Paradis. Oh, did you indeed? In the first place, let me tell you, this Dr. Paradis <laughs> is a woman. Oh, a woman? As you can imagine, I didn't have any difficulty in discrediting <laughs> her theories. In fact, I'm afraid I... I made her seem rather stupid. <laughs> However, we did stay there long enough for her to, to give us a demonstration. And that's the way that it was, Holmes. When we got back to our house, the initial package was there, waiting for us. Oh, childish trick. Obviously, the paradox here contains an ingeniously hidden trap door through which the assistant disappeared and later the package. A fast cab then took it to your home before you could get there. Oh, yes, oh, really? Well, uh, yes, yes, of course, that's exactly how I explained the thing to Mary. Was she impressed with the thing? Yes, she was. Uh, but you know how women are. I tried to tell her the whole thing was a fraud. She's uh, very obstinate. I was hoping perhaps that you will help me expose the concern. Oh, hardly seem necessary, old fellow. Such an obvious fraud. However, for your sake, I'll be glad to do anything I can. Well, I thought we might go down to the laboratory late tonight when nobody's there. And take a look at that paradol chamber a little more closely. Yes, that's a good idea. After being cooped up here for three days, it'll be a pleasure to get some night air and indulge in a little simple burglarizing. Well, shall I call for you here? No, no, wait a minute, dear fellow. It's much too dangerous. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll be in a handsome cab outside your house about 11.30 tonight. How's that? Splendid. Quite like old times, isn't it, Holmes? Yes, it is, old chap, though I think that uh, this time, for Mrs. Watson's sake, I must try and keep you out of trouble. Midnight, Holmes. Yes, Watson. I'm the only concerned old bachelors like myself should be wandering the streets of London. Oh, rubbish, Holmes. You talk as if Mary was a tyrant. Now, don't get angry with oh, old job. I was only being suspicious. Was... Is this, um, hmm? Dr. Paradis' laboratory? Yes. Yeah. I'd like to be seen. I don't imagine it'll be very hard to break in, though. Strike a match, will you? I took the precaution of bringing this lantern. There you are. Thanks, old fellow. Is the, is the door locked? Yes, but I think the skeleton key will do the trick. Hold this lantern for a second, will you? Here you are. Oh, oh this is Hans' place so far. Come on. Yeah. There's the, the paradox chamber over there. Uh-huh. Give me the lantern again, old chap, will you? Thanks. Mm-hmm. Quite an elaborate connection. The door's been left open. Let's go in and take a look at the inside of it. Ah, not both of us, Watson. If this is the only entrance and... Uh, the two of us walked in. It'd be too easy to slam the door shut on us. Yeah, I suppose so. You go in and I'll keep watch out here. All right. Oh, I uh, trust that in a few minutes I won't find myself lying on your doorstep. Holmes, there are times when your sense of humor is a little strained. Holmes! Holmes, you all right? Watson! What is it, Holmes? The body of a dead woman. She's been shot. Yes, I'm much mistaken. Let me come and look. A thousand to one is Dr. Paradis. Yes, yes, it is. Watson, get out of here, don't you? The... Good Lord, somebody slammed the door, the door shut on us. Yes, my dear fellow. We walked into a trap very neatly. I'm afraid that we're imprisoned in what appears to be an airtight metal chamber, and the only person who can help us to get out of it again is a corpse. <laughs> Dr. Watson's story will continue in just a few seconds. It's time for me to remind you that good food always tastes better when served together with good wine. Did you know that Petri makes two wonderful mealtime wines? Wines are specially made to go with food? Well, they do. Petri California Burgundy and Petri California Sauterne. You want a rich, hearty red wine, wine that's great with a meat or meat dish, you just try Petri Burgundy. And if you want a wine that's perfect with chicken or fish, try a delicate golden-colored Petri Sauterne. 
Petri Burgundy if you want a red wine, Petri Sauterne if you want white. But always a Petri wine if you want a good wine. Now back to tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure. It is in the early hours of a winter's morning in 1887... The famous pair, while investigating the mysteries of a scientific laboratory in the east end of London, have been trapped in an airtight metal cabinet, their only companion being the dead body of a woman scientist. As we rejoin our story, Sherlock Holmes and his old friend Dr. Watson are listening intently as footsteps approach what appears to be their metal coffin. There's someone outside. They're sliding back to the mental panel. Good evening, gentlemen. That voice. It's Dr. Paddy's assistant. Let us out of here. Or should I be more precise, Mr. Holmes, and say good morning? <laughs> Hello, Moriarty. Moriarty, you scoundrel. I can just get my hands on him. Dr. Watson, I wish you could get over your dislike for me. For my own part, I'm genuinely sorry that my trap had to catch you, too. I've often felt unhappy that you're not on my side. Such slavish admiration of you, given your friend Sherlock Holmes, must be highly gratifying. There's never mind about all that. What you're up to? It's obvious, my dear Watson. The whole scheme was a plan to lure me out of my safe hiding by presenting an intriguing problem and one that victimized the wife of my old friend. You knew it would get back to my ears, didn't you, Moriarty? Yes, exactly. But why did you murder this Paradise woman? That's equally obvious, my dear Watson. It served her purpose in presenting a most convincing scientific front. As soon as the fact was baited, it was a liability. She might tell tales and so she was killed. Like so many other of your accomplices, my dear professor. Ah, Precisely. Now, my dear fellows, I'm afraid that I must close this panel and say goodbye. Quite sorry to have to kill you, but you're becoming dreadfully in my way. And how do you plan to kill us, my auntie? By doing nothing more than closing this panel. Oh, I could be frightfully dramatic and release deadly gases into the chamber, or poisonous snakes, or something equally colorful. But quite frankly, it seems so much simpler just to shut you in. Your oxygen supply won't last very long, you know. And for your benefit, Dr. Watson, I may tell you that Paradol, whatever its other shortcomings as a metal, is bulletproof. Goodbye, you meddling fool! Oh. There seems nothing for us to do but look around and ascertain our chances of escape. Holmes, I don't like this. We're in a very nasty situation. My dear Watson, sometimes you're a master of understatement. Aha. Uh-huh. Just as I thought. What have you found, Holmes? A sliding panel. Just behind the dead woman. It leads to a passageway. A passageway that has been bricked up only within the last few hours. But long enough, I'm afraid, to make it impossible. No, there's no escape here. Hold the lantern a little higher, will you, Walter? Yeah. That's it. Well, what are we going to do now? I was just estimating the cubic capacity of this chamber. The air supply should last comfortably for at least another eight hours. I recommend... A brief sleep to refresh us and also to conserve our oxygen supply. Sleep? Who could sleep at a time like this? I can and you can, old chap, if you discipline yourself. Well, I'll try, Holmes, but I know perfectly well I shan't close my eyes. Wake up, Watson, wake up. Uh, yes, my dear. Uh, oh, 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 is it you? Oh, we're still in this infernal trap. I'm afraid so, old chap. Uh, what time is it? Just after seven in the morning. Uh, how long did you estimate our oxygen supply would last? Probably about another hour. Well, it's just possible that some worker will come to the laboratory early and let us out. I shouldn't count too much on that if I were you. No, I suppose not. I say, Holmes, I'm, I'm famished. Yes, I thought you would be, my dear chap. So I saved you a, this half of a bar of chocolate. I ate my own share just before you were wakened. Oh, thanks, my dear fellow. Uh, did, did you sleep too, Holmes? No, I didn't, Watson. I employed my time in conducting a minute examination of this chamber. I was trying to find some possible way of getting out. Then you failed, eh? I'm afraid so. Holmes, this looks like the end, doesn't it? Well, if it is my time to die, I'm glad that we're together again. Although I blame myself entirely for, for letting you into oh, the dark. come now, my dear fellow. Don't take it as badly as that. But you admitted you're defeated and that there's no possible way out of this desk. I meant that there's no way out from the inside. So my plan worked. Good gracious me. What on earth? The stride. The stride. There you are. Mary. Mary, you dear little... You, you must have been frightened to death. Hello, John. Oh, 
poor dear, you must have spent a miserable night. Well, 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 well. Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson have been getting themselves in trouble again, eh? Sir, this is no time for your heavy-handed badinage. There's the body of a murdered woman inside that chamber. She was killed by Professor Moriarty. Professor Moriarty? Yes, you did my message sooner. Your message? Oh, bless myself, Holmes. I wish you'd tell me how you got your message to the Scotland Yard. Well, ever since these recent attacks on my life, I've had, uh... My delightful band of ragamuffins, in the Baker Street Irregulars, watching my house fixed watches, two at a time. I gave the boys instructions to follow me whenever I went out. And if ever I did not reappear within three hours, they were to report to our friend Lestrade at Scotland Yard. Holmes, you're amazing. You, you, you think of everything. Just a minute, gentlemen, just a minute. I didn't get no message from any of your Baker Street Irregulars. Oh, you didn't? No, sir. Though I did find a couple of the boys tied up when we came in here just but now. if you didn't get a message from them, how did you come here so opportunely? <laughs> That's an easy one. Because Mrs. Watson here came and fetched me. You did, Mary, but how on earth? <laughs> Go on, Mom. Well, tell them. Well, it's really very simple. When John came back from seeing you yesterday, Mr. Holmes, he was over elaborately casual in his references to the Peridol chamber. So, of course, I knew at once the two of you were going to investigate the matter. I also caught him oiling his revolver after dinner. I didn't know that you slipped out last night, John. But as soon as I woke up this morning, I realized what had happened. So I went straight to Scotland Yard for Inspector Lestrade and brought him here with me. Why, Mary, you clever little thing. Isn't she a clever darling, Holmes? Uh, Mrs. Watson, this has been a, a salutary experience. Uh, will you allow me to congratulate you on your deductive ability? Well, that's very nice of you, Mr. Holmes, but I really don't deserve any compliments. If you don't mind my saying so, it was elementary, my dear Mr. Holmes. Elementary. This is Bob Campbell saying good night for the Petrie family. This program comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is the Mutual Broadcasting Center. Petrie Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another of his fascinating stories about his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. You know we're really happy to be back with you once again. And we're looking forward to getting together at this time every week from here on out. And I hope you won't mind if every once in a while I sort of get a word in edgewise about Petri wines. You know, and I really mean this, Petri wines are wonderful wines. For instance, right now, I wish I could give you a glass of Petri California port. You could hold that Petri port up to the light and look at its clear, deep red color. You could smell that luscious grape aroma. And best of all, you could taste that Petri port. What a flavor. That Petri port just sort of rolls around on your tongue, and oh boy, is that ever good. Try Petri port after dinner some evening, or try it when some friends drop in. You can serve it proudly, because after all, the name Petri is the proudest name in the history of American wines. <laughs> And now let's look in on our good friend, Dr. Watson, and see if he's expecting us. Oh, come in. Come in, Mr. Bartell. You're just the man I've been expecting. How are you, Dr. Watson? It's good to see you again. Oh, thank you, my boy. It's very nice to see you again, too. I've missed our Monday night visits during the last three months. Sit yourself down. Uh, would you care to join me in a, in a glass of port? Well, thanks, Doctor. That'd be nice. You know, it seems to me, after our summer vacation, a toast to the great Sherlock Holmes would be in order. That's an excellent idea. Here you are, young lad. Thanks. You propose the toast, Doctor. To Sherlock Holmes, master detective and loyal friend, whose adventures have brought considerable, shall we say, fame to a certain retired doctor now living in Northern California. I'll drink to that. Well, now, suppose I might as well get on with tonight's story. Which particular adventure have you selected, Doctor? One that I call the Limping Ghost. Sounds exciting. And, as usual, you find me saying, how did it begin? In Baker Street on a windy December evening at the turn of the century. A young, white-faced boy sat in front of our blazing fire. And as he told us his strange story, the flickering firelight danced weird patterns on the walls. 
The young man was Alexander McMorris, the seventh Earl of Loch Nair. The Earl of Loch Nair? Say, uh, didn't I read in the papers the other day that the eighth Earl of Loch Nair had been killed in an airplane accident? Quite right, my boy. Even in this day and age, the tragic history of violent death seems to dog the footsteps of the Loch Nair family. But to return to my story. On that December night in 1900, we heard the whole history of the limping ghost of Loch Nair. The first Earl had lost a foot at the Battle of Flodden Field in 1513. In spite of this terrible handicap, he fought on valiantly until he died on the battlefield from loss of blood. From then on, right until the time this story begins, the limping ghost, clad in a suit of armor, always appeared at Loch Nair Castle before and after the death of the current Earl. Yes, Mr. Bartell, it was a strange story that Sherlock Holmes and I listened to that night. A story of death and horror over the centuries, punctuated by the limping clank of ghostly armor. Milady, I have terrible news for you. Your husband, the Earl, was killed in the explosion, destroyed Lord Darnley. Milady, the Guy Fawkes plan to blow up the House of Parliament has failed. Your husband is in the Tower of London. They say he's to be hanged, drawn and quartered. <laughs> Madam, I regret to inform you that your husband, on my instructions, has been arrested for murder. I have no doubt that he will hang. And that's the story of the Loch Nairs, Mr. Holmes. You were instrumental in sending my great uncle to the gallows, a fate which he richly deserved, I'm told. So it seemed only natural to come here to Baker Street and consult you now that I'm in trouble. I shall be most happy to do anything I can to help you, sir. I don't remember anything about your sending the Earl of Loch Nair to the scaffold, Holmes. Huh? Well, he did, Dr. Watson. Mm -hmm. And the servants have always sworn the ghost really did walk at midnight on the day that he was hanged. Indeed. Now, sir, I suggest that you tell us what problem brought you here. The ghost is walking again, Mr. Holmes. You know what that means. According to the legend that the present Earl will die. Exactly. And as I'm the present Earl, <laughs> you can see why I'm rather worried. Might I understand that you've actually seen this ghost yourself? Yes, Mr. Holmes. The night before last, Betty, well, that is, Miss Nolan and I, were sitting in the dining hall in front of the fire when we heard a strange sound up in the musician's gallery. We looked up and in the moonlight saw a ghostly figure in armor limping towards the staircase. Oh, gracious me. Uh, my dear sir, you're certain that you really saw it? Moonlight can play strange tricks, you know. There wasn't any doubt about it, Doctor. We both mm -hmm. saw and heard it. What did you do? I started to go towards the stairs, but as I did so, Betty screamed and then tumbled to the floor in a heap. Mm. Fainted, I suppose. Yes. While I was reviving her, the, the ghost disappeared. Who's staying with you at Loch Nair Castle at the moment? Well, there's Betty Nolan. She's the sister of James Nolan. He looks after my estate. Uh, Betty and I are engaged to be married. Oh, this is, uh, Thank you. Uh, yes, indeed. Anyone else staying with you? Yes, a distant cousin of mine, Jerry K. McMorris, an American. He turned up in England a couple of months ago with his son, Walter. They're both with me at the present. A distant cousin. That's right, Mr. Holmes. Actually, they're descendants of a more than usually black sheep branch of the family. I, uh, I don't know how long the old man's going to be with us, though. You ask me, he's a dying man. Why do you say that, sir? As far as I can gather, he's been wasting away for years. It's only a question of time before his strength fails him entirely. I uh, <clears throat> was hoping perhaps you could take a look at him, Dr. Watson. That is, uh, <clears throat> if I could persuade you and Mr. Holmes to come and stay at the castle for a few days. Well, what about it, Holmes? It's an intriguing problem, Watson. The current Earl of Loch Nair would seem to be in danger. A cousin of his is dying of an obscure disease, and the ghost of Loch Nair Castle is walking again. Yes, it's an irresistible invitation. I see no reason why we can't leave on the Scotch Express tonight. It's been quite a heavy fall of snow here in your absence, young man. Quite so. And judging from the color of the sky, there's more to come. Uh, very angry looking. Hmm. Oh, well, now as we round this bend, you'll be able to see the castle. Ah, yes. 
There you are, gentlemen. Huh. Magnificent. Yes, it's a fine place, all right, Doctor, though it costs me a great deal in upkeep. As a matter of fact, I only have one wing open. It's always been something of a problem to get servants to come and live here. See, the local villagers have a great respect for the Loch Nair ghost, you know. What servants do you have at the castle at present? A cook housekeeper, Mrs. McClintock, fine old lady who's been with me for six years now. And then there's old Tamas. He served my family for as long as I can remember. Well, as a matter of fact, he is now. Hello, Tamas. I'm glad to see you back, my lord, and that's a fact. Oh, thank you, Tamas. Oh, these gentlemen are Mr. Sherlock Holmes, Dr. Watson. Good day to you, gentlemen. Good day, Thomas. Good day. I've brought the trap round to the stables. I may as well break the news to you. Yes, what's happened, Thomas? It's your cousin, my lord. Poor old Mr. McMorris. He's dead. What? Died early this morning. God rest his soul. He's dead. Well, I'm very sorry that I arrived too late to be of any help. Well, thank you for telling me, Thomas. Or oh, you may take the trap round now. Aye, sir. I'll bring baggage. So he's dead. Well, I can't say it's unexpected, but it is a shock, nevertheless. I'm sure that it must be, particularly as you yourself told us you saw the ghost of Loch Nair the night before last. In which case... In which case, Watson, I think we may reasonably expect another visitation. Perhaps before the night is over. Shall we go in? This is Miss Nolan, my fiancée, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, and Dr. Watson. I'm very glad to meet you. How are you, Miss Nolan? And uh, this is her brother, James Nolan, the manager of my estate. How do you do, sir? How are you, Mr. Nolan? Much better for seeing you both up here. I'm sure it won't take you long to lay this ghost business by the heels. Oh, well, I trust you don't overestimate our abilities, Mr. Nolan. Alec, you've, you've heard about your cousin, of course. Oh, yes, my dear. Tamas told us as we drove up. Where is Walter? He went into the village with the doctor and... The body of his father. Oh. He should be back soon. How's he taking it? Very quietly. Too quietly, if you ask me. Those Americans are pretty demonstrative people, you know. And Walter's been no exception. But he behaved very strangely this morning. When the doctor told him his father was dead, he just said, now things will start to happen and then shut up like an oyster. I can't make head or tail of the fellow. Uh, yes, quite so, quite so. Uh, Mr. Holmes, I expect you and Dr. Watson would like to go to your room? Yes, I must go. I think first I'd like to take a look at the um, musician's gallery, if you don't mind. Oh, yes, of course. Would you excuse us, darling? Well, all right, Alec. It's uh, in the dining hall here. <laughs> they must have been very hospitable people in those days. Fifty or sixty people could eat at that table. <laughs> yes, Doctor. Needless to remark, we hardly ever use the room nowadays. There's the musician's gallery, Mr. Holmes. Oh, yes, yes, I see. How do we get up there? I'll show you. See, there's a stone staircase behind this tapestry here. Follow me. Watch your step. It's quite narrow, rather dark. Watch your head, Watson, old chap. Oh, don't worry about me, Holmes. I'm perfect. Oh, I see. Must have built these stairs for pygmies. Oh, yes. Here we are, gentlemen. This is the musician's gallery. By Joe. It must have made a pretty picture in the days gone by. A little string orchestra fiddling away up here and tumble the Scottish nobility bobbing and floating round in the intricacies of a Highland chatiche or a stately gavotte or something. Where does that door lead to? To the bedroom wing. And that's where the ghost appeared from the other night, I suppose. Yes, Mr. Holmes. Uh-huh. The door's jar. Do you generally keep this door unlocked, sir? Why, no. But the key mysteriously disappeared about a week ago. James is having a new one made. So I must remind him about that. Alec! Alec, uh, where are you? Oh, we're up here, Walter. We're coming down. That's Walter McMorris. My dead cousin's son. Oh, fellow, this must be a dreadful day for him. Yes, I, I'm afraid this is going to be a rather painful interview. Oh, hello, Walter. This is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watts. How do you do, sir? How do you do? Sherlock Holmes, sir. I've heard about you and your friend, Dr. Watson. Walter, old man, I'm dreadfully sorry about your father. Are you now? Isn't that nice of you? Well, you'll be sorry enough when you hear that I'm going to take you to court and prove that I'm the real Earl of Loch Nair. Oh, Walter, you're out of your mind. Am I? No. Father was out of his because he kept quiet all these years. But I'm going to have my rights. 
I've looked up the records. I've had genealogists working for months. And I've got all the facts that prove you're an imposter. Oh, man, what are you talking about? You know well enough. When Sherlock Holmes here sent your great uncle to the gallows 20 years ago, the title and estate should have come to my father. When I leave here tomorrow, I'm going straight to the finest lawyer in London. And then, if you believe this, why have you said anything about it till now? Because I'm smart. I found out a thing or two since I've been staying here. And one of the things I found out is that your precious fiancé and her brother wouldn't look twice at you if it weren't for your money and the title. Shut up. You'll find out. She's a smart little filly, and she knows what kind of a track she's running Why, on. you got... My compliment, sir. A very professional uppercut. Yes, and a very well-deserved one. Hi. Offensive scoundrel. Sorry about this. Uh, please don't say anything in front of Betty. Don't really upset her. I quite understand. Come along, Watson. Let's go and find our rooms. Holmes, it's nearly dinner time. Why are we wandering about here in the dark instead of having a glass of sherry with the others in the library? I'm a genius practitioner, Watson. I like to earn my fees. It, uh... It occurred to me that a further examination of this dining hall might prove profitable. Well, personally, Holmes, I think you're wasting your time on this case. <laughs> what makes you think that, old chap? It's perfectly obvious that young American fellow was impersonating the ghost a few nights ago. He knew his father was going to die, and he wanted to build up the legend so as to make his own claim seem more believable. Well, that's very sound reasoning, Watson. Though to be logical in his deception, he should repeat the performance. Now that his father is dead... Well, ghosts only walk at midnight. So why don't we go and have a glass of sherry? Shh. Hmm? What is it, Holmes? Someone's coming in from the library. The lighted candle. Yes? Who is it? It's me, Mrs. McClintock. The oh, you gracious me. You, you gave me quite a start. I heard voices and I knew the candles were not alight in here, so I came in to see who it was. You're watching for the ghost, I suppose. Well, you'll no be disappointed, gentlemen. Though you may see more than you bargain for. Those that meddle with ghostly things they do not comprehend are playing with something much more dangerous than fire. Fire burns. But the shades on dead people... Holmes, Holmes! Look up there, the gallery! The door's opening. It's the ghost! Aye, here he comes, the poor buddy. See the armor on him? And the way he's dragging one leg behind him. Yes, it's really quite an effective impersonation. And the twilight provides most appropriate light for his play acting, too. You mean it's a young American? Of course. Ah! Look, look behind him. There's another figure. Yes. Dressed in the same kind of armor and carrying a sword. Things afoot, Watson. The ghost has seen him. He's turning. The second figure's raising his sword. Look out! <laughs> Great heavens! He's knocked him through the railings. That must be a 20-foot fall. Come on, old fellow. Help me open his visor. Just a minute. Uh, yes. It's Walter McMorris, the American. Though from the angle of his head, I would suggest that it might be the late Walter McMorris. Eh, Watson? He's dead all right, Holmes. Huh? Neck broken. Meanwhile, the second figure has been able to slip back through that one escape us. Come on, he was dressed in armor. He can't go very fast. Perhaps we can overtake him. Dr. Watson's story will continue in just a few seconds, which is all the time I need to tell you about Petri California Muscatel. Ever try Petri Muscatel? It's a wine that looks like sheer gold, and it's made from big, plump, juicy muscat grapes. Boy, pop one of those muscat grapes into your mouth and you know you've got something delicious. You know that. And you get the same flavor in Petri Muscatel. It's a perfect wine to serve a lady. Women love it. And that best time to serve it is after dinner or on a Sunday afternoon. You know, times like that. But just make sure it's Petri Muscatel because that's the way to make sure it's going to be good. Remember, Petri. <laughs> And now back to tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure and the story of the limping ghost of Loch Nair. Couldn't find it, Holmes. 
There's no trace of the ghost in the distance gallery. We gave him too much of a start, I'm afraid. <laughs> of course you didn't find him. You'll never find him because he's not mortal. Mrs. McClintock, is the original suit of armor the one worn by the first Earl of Loch Ness still in the castle? Aye, sir. It's in the library through that door there. I'll take you to it. Don't bother, thank you. We'll find it. Come on, Watson. Bring that candle with you. All right, Joe. If you know what's good for you, you'll stop dabbling in it as your dinner really can. Holmes, what do you make of the second girl? Imposter, obviously. But who could it have been? That's what we have to find out, old chap. Undoubtedly, someone knew that the American Walter McMorris was impersonating the ghost and used this macabre method to kill him. But why kill him? Possibly his claims to the title and estate were valid. Or perhaps some fanatic was so devoted to the Loch Nair legend that he assumed the role of ghost and killed him for his sacrilege. Hold the candle a little higher, will you, old chap? Here you are. Hello. Here's a suit of armor, Holmes. Lying in a heap on the floor. Well, on the floor, eh? But I say it obviously belongs on that stand over there. It's perfectly clear what's happened. The second figure used this armor and slipped it back in here while we were examining the dead man. Possibly, Watson, possibly. At least this armor gives us a definite clue, but it limits the field of possible suspects. How do you mean, Holmes? Well, it's an interesting fact that the human race has grown definitely larger in the past 400 years. Very few modern men can wear authentic ancient armor like this. For example, take the first item on the top of the heap lying on the floor here. These gauntlets of chain mail. Start them on. Well, that's too small for exactly. me. Either you nor I could have worn this suit. No, no, no nor could young and the estate agent. Whereas his sister could have done. Yes, so could Thomas Sabatra. He's a small fellow. And it becomes a bat, Watson. Our distinguished client, the young Earl of Loch Nair, is himself a small man. Right, so he is. And he might easily have had a motive. Young McMorris had disputed his right to the title earlier in the day. But we mustn't jump to conclusions. Nevertheless, you see what valuable evidence this arm has become. Hello, hello. It sounds as if the rest of the party are on the scene. Yes, I suggest that we join them without making any reference to this suit of armor. Remember, old chap, one of them in there is a murderer. And we may have to set a trap to catch him. Uh, are you sure he's dead, Dr. Watson? There's no doubt about it. His neck was broken instantly by the fall. Oh, it's dreadful. Father and son both dying on the same day. And you see the real ghost came up behind him, Mr. Holmes, and struck him so they crashed through the railing up there. I said another figure dressed in our... and killed him, Mr. Nolan. It was a real ghost. I saw him with my own two eyes. He killed that man for trying to bring shame on the name of Loch Nair. Shouldn't we get in touch with the police? How can I get a message to them tonight? Have you looked outside? We're almost completely sewed in. Snowed in. Oh, Alec, I'm frightened. Now, hush, darling. There's nothing to be afraid of anymore. No, at least we have the assurance that the ghost will not limp again. Why? Well, the murderer has no further motive for impersonating the ghost. To walk now would be to support the dead American's claims. No... We shall spend a quiet night, and tomorrow I shall communicate with the proper authorities as to my quite definite notions regarding the murderer's identity. Uh, but if the ghost should walk again, Mr. Holmes... Well, then, sir, I shall know that at last I've encountered a truly supernatural crime and shall retire from the practice of, um, of detection. <laughs> It's nearly two o'clock. You still over there at the window, puffing away that pipe of yours? Oh, you know, I can't help being that young McMorris knows a great deal more than he told us. A great deal more. The shifty look about him I don't like. Never did trust a fellow could look you squarely in the eye. Don't you feel the same way, Holmes? Holmes. Holmes, where are you? Holmes! Shh, Black Watson. Where have you been? I thought you were over there by the window. I've uh, been, been talking to myself. Never mind that, old chap. Get us on in the dressing gown. We're on the last lap of this strange eventful tragedy. Oh, thank the Lord for that. Perhaps I can get some sleep. Holmes, where have you been? I went to the musician's gallery and baited the trap. Now it's ready to spring. Don't dawdle, Watson. Come I'm on, come on. I'm not dawdling. I'm not dawdling. What do you mean, you, you baited a trap? You'll see for yourself in a few moments. 
As a matter of fact, I really baited it when I said downstairs that if real ghosts should walk again, I would retire from the practice of detection. I didn't understand your saying that myself. Well, I was tempting the murderer to show his hand once more. Come on, come on, please. Where are we going? To wait behind the curtain at the foot of the stairs leading to the musician's gallery. And I hope we don't have to wait very long. <laughs> Holmes, I'm getting a crick in my neck trying to peer through this wretched curtain. How much longer do we have to wait? Until our murderer arrives. Are you, are you certain you'll come? Not certain, but hopeful. Extremely hopeful. You know who it is, don't you? Yes. But my proof is too thin for a court of law. I must catch him in the act. Here he comes. Splendid. Let's go up and have him. No, 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 no. They walk into my trap. He's coming towards the head of stairs. Oh! Great Scott! Exactly. A simple piece of wire stretched across the gallery is remarkably effective. Even with ghosts. Come on, son. Help me off with this visor. There we are. Good oh. Lord, it's... Oh. It's James Nolan. Exactly. Well, what happened? You walked into a simple trap, my friend. I'm afraid the next trap will be more lethal. For it undoubtedly proved to be the one beneath the gallows. Well, now that we're headed back for London, Holmes, perhaps you'll settle one or two points in the case... That are bothering me quite a oh. bit. Oh, with pleasure, my dear chap. What are they? I still don't see what Nolan's motive was in murdering the American. Oh, that should be obvious. He wanted to ensure that his sister's fiance would enjoy undisputed title to the name of the States. Well, how did you know it was Nolan? When I examined the authentic suit of armor. You see, it was um, obvious it had never been worn. But I still don't quite oh, understand. Oh, come now, old chap. Huh? The suit of armor was in a heap on the floor. Yeah? And if it had been hastily discarded and get, um, well, the gauntlets were on top of the pile, you remember? Well, that's right, they were. If the suit had really been worn, the gauntlets would have been the first things to have been taken off, and so would have been um, underneath the pile. Hmm? Obviously, therefore, the armor had been disarranged in order to make people believe the real ghost had walked. Yes, yes. After the American's death, the suspects were four. Miss Nolan, her brother, Thomas, the butler, and... The Earl himself. Well, I ruled out Mrs. McClintock because you remember she was standing behind us at the time of the murder. Well, I'm beginning to understand. All the suspects except Nolan were small enough to have worn the armor. That's right. Therefore, only he could have pretended to use it. Pretended? But he, he did use it. Oh, no, my dear fellow. Undoubtedly, he procured a similar one of modern manufacture. An amazing case, Holmes. An interesting one at any rate. And once again, old fellow, I'm possibly reminded of an old Scottish litany. Scottish litany? Which one's that? Oh, you remember it. From ghoulies and ghosties and long-legged beasties and things that go bump in the night. <laughs> Good Lord, deliver us. Well, Doctor, that's really a swell story. You know, for a while there, I was beginning to believe in ghosts. Well, I'm ashamed to admit it, but at the time, so was I. <laughs> you know, this sounds silly, but I bet it would be fun to be one of those legendary English ghosts. You know, go around sticking your nose into everybody's business, and playing practical jokes like mad, and nobody able to figure out who did it. That would really be fun in a way. Well, you can go around scaring people all you want to, but not for me. I think a ghost leads a terrible life. So, for instance, a ghost can't have the pleasure of eating a nice Juicy steak. Yeah, or drinking a glass of really good wine. Ah, now you're talking, young fellow, my lad. Petri wine. You're yeah, still talking, young You see, lad. when I say good wine, I always mean Petri wine because you can depend on Petri. I know, I know. Why, the Petri family has been making wine for generations. Handing on down from father to son, from father to son, all their skill and knowledge and experience. When you realize they started the Petri business way back in the 1800s, well, common sense tells you the Petri family knows practically all there is to know about the fine art of turning luscious grapes into clear, fragrant wine. Yeah, whether you're looking for a swell wine to serve before dinner or with dinner or after dinner, for any occasion, you just can't go wrong with a Petri wine because Petri took time 
to bring you good wine. Now, Doctor, what story are you going to tell us this week? Well, now, next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you a strange adventure that Holmes and I had in the English countryside. It concerns the apparent madness of a certain Colonel Warburton and the puzzling mystery of two dead dogs. <laughs> Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is based on an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Crooked Man. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Met Goldwyn Mayer and Mr. Boost through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. Once again, it's time to walk down Baker Street with its swirling fog, its passing hansom cabs, and bustling London life. Hello, this is Ben Wright, welcoming you to two more new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce. At the end of each broadcast, the announcer says, Tonight's episode was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher. Both men, although they are no longer with us, were married. Dennis Green's widow, Mary Green, lives in New York and is still active in theatre and dance. And Phyllis White, Anthony Boucher's widow, lives in San Francisco and makes numerous guest appearances at Mystery Club gatherings and at the meetings of the Baker Street Irregulars. Well, tonight it is my pleasure to present Phyllis White, who will tell you a little about what her husband and Dennis Green did for the Sherlock Holmes radio series. Phyllis? I've been asked to give an account how it happened that my husband got involved with the Sherlock Holmes show. The way his career developed was not according to any underlying plan. Whenever he turned a corner and moved into a new field, it was brought about by chance. And this was a good example of that. He was at the time a mystery reviewer for the San Francisco Chronicle. Well, this time he went over to the book department office, got his books and his mail, and found among the mail an invitation to a cocktail party. It was in honor of Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce, who had come to San Francisco to do a war bond promotion. The party was going on right then, so he could quite easily have learned about it too late. But he trotted right over, and aside from meeting Rathbone and Bruce, there were other people who had come along from the radio program. There was Glenn Hall Taylor, who was the producer, and there was Dennis Green, who was one of the writers. He was writing in collaboration with Leslie Charteris. Well, as it turned out, the Greens were staying on a little longer in the Bay Area. My husband invited them to come over to Berkeley and have dinner with us and see his Sherlock Holmes collection. Well, they they went back to Hollywood, and not long after, it turned out that the program was in need of a new writer. Dennis suggested Boucher. Well, it turned out that it... uh, mesh just beautifully as a collaboration. Here was a a noble project working with gifted colleagues, something that they could all feel affection for and respect and a lot of fun along the way, too. Thank you, Phyllis. And now, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson in Colonel Warburton's Madness. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invites you to listen to Dr. Watson as he tells us about another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. 
And you know what I wish I could share with you sometime? A bottle of Petri California Sherry. Have you ever tasted Petri Sherry? It's just perfect before dinner. Why, that Petri Sherry can change the usual before dinner lull into a special event, and that's a fact. Just look at the clear color of Petri Sherry. It's a deep, rich amber, clear and cheerful looking. And wait till you taste it. That's when you find out for sure just how good a wine can be. That's when you find out just what I mean when I say that the flavor of Petri Sherry comes right from the heart of the grape. Try Petri Sherry by itself. Or with hors d'oeuvres or canopies or whatever you call those little cocktail sandwiches. And say, if you like your sherry dry, well then Petri California Pale Dry Sherry is the sherry for you. Just be sure the label says Petri, the proudest name in the history of American wines. <laughs> And now let's look in on our old friend, Dr. Watson. Doctor? I'm out here on the patio, Mr. Bartell. Come out and join me. <laughs> Quiet, Winnie. Quiet, down, down, Monty. <laughs> I see the welcoming committee's here. <laughs> this little scoundrel. They begin to think they own this patio. Scoop them off the chair, Mr. Bartell, and, and settle yourself down. All right, off you go, boy. Off you go. Go on, off you go. That's it, my boy. As a matter of fact, it's rather appropriate that the puppies should be here tonight. As in the story that I'm going to tell you, a dog played a most prominent part. A dog? What kind of a dog, Doctor? Now, 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 my boy, don't get me anticipating my story. For once, I'm going to start at the beginning. Which was? On a summer morning in 1890, not long after my marriage. I'd gone back to my private practice, you know, and Sherlock Holmes was living alone in our old Baker Street rooms. Well, you still saw him, I suppose. Indeed I did, Mr. Bartell. In fact, occasionally I even persuaded him to forego his bohemian habits so far as to visit my wife and me. But to get back to my story, I'd been exceptionally busy that summer, and consequence was feeling rather, shall we say, nervy and, and run down. So much so that Mary, oh, <laughs> Mrs. Watson, persuaded me to take a fortnight's holiday. We went down to the charming little village of Taplow on the lower reaches of the River Thames. But, as so often happens, the best laid schemes of mice and men gang after glag. I guess the holiday backfired on you, Doctor, and you found yourself involved in a mystery. Maybe a mystery calling for the aid of your old friend Sherlock Holmes? Quite correct, Mr. Bartell. We'd only been down there a couple of days when the trouble began. In fact, the whole thing became so involved that I thought the best thing to do was to put the whole strange story in a letter to Sherlock Holmes. This I did. And I can imagine how he chuckled when he read my name. Dear old Watson, seems to be a little out of his depth. My dear Holmes, I need your help, or at least your advice. Two days down here and I've become involved in a most unusual problem. It began this morning when Mary and I were out for an after-breakfast stroll. The sun was shining, the birds were singing, and there seemed every indication of it being a happy and careful. You know, Mary, I've always thought up to now that Barney was rather a silly word. <laughs> I still do, John, dear. Nevertheless, it's the only possible word that describes a day like this adequately. Very well, dear, it's Barney. Personally, I'm so happy to see you relaxing that I don't care what the weather's like. You've been working much too hard. Yes, it's been a busy year. Yes, and last year Sherlock Holmes monopolized most of your time. At least I've got you to myself for once. <laughs> you dear little thing, you... Always been rather jealous of my association with Holmes, haven't you? Not jealous, dear, but I must confess his influence on you wasn't entirely for the good. He had a habit of keeping you out all night. Well, you should be used to that, dear. After all, it happens often enough in my practice. True, John, but on those occasions I know where you are and don't worry about you. And again, you've copied so many of Mr. Holmes' eccentricities. Hmm? Keeping your tobacco in a Persian slipper, for instance. <laughs> and, uh, oh, John, look down. Do you see that woman walking across the field towards us? Yes, well, what's the matter? Do you know her? I'm not sure, but I think it's Ellen Warburton. I believe she does live somewhere near here. And who is Ellen Warburton? An old friend of mine. She's frightfully clever and advanced. She's interested in women's suffrage and all sorts of things. Oh, sounds dreadful. Imagine giving women the right to vote. Their place is in the home. It is Ellen. 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 Ellen Warburton. Oh, how are you? How very nice to see you again. I'm Mary Watson now. This is my husband. How do you do, Miss Robinson? How do you do? Uh, how do you do? Mary, I'd heard that you'd married. 
Aren't you a medical detective or something, Mr. Watson? <laughs> Not quite, dear. Uh, I see... hold the degree of Doctor of Medicine from the University of London, madam. But he's helped the great Sherlock Holmes on many of his cases. That's how I've heard of him, then. Do you mind if I walk with you a little way? Of course not, Ellen. Come along. Uh, do you live near here, Miss Wilburton? About four miles away, Doctor, at Chevy mm. Grange. I'm a glorified housekeeper for my uncle, Colonel Warburton. Oh, dear, that sounds rather dull for you. As a matter of fact, the state of my uncle's health at the present moment makes it anything but dull for me. That's why I asked if I might walk with you for a way. Well, what's the matter with him, Ellen? He's going mad. Before my eyes. And I can do nothing to help him. Mad? Come now, Mr. Warburton, surely you... Doctor, I'm not an hysterical girl. In fact, I regard myself as something of a scientist. I studied physics for a number of years at Bristol University. And I tell you that my uncle is going insane. What are the symptoms? Most of the time, he's perfectly normal. But when these attacks are on him, he gets in the most frightful rages and says the strangest things. He's even complained of hearing a shrill, piping whistle that comes out of nowhere. I can't hear it, nor can anyone else. But Uncle gets into the most dreadful state. I wonder, would you have a look at him for me, Dr. Watson? Well, I don't... Of course, feel... John will do everything he can. Thank you so much. Then supposing you both come over for... So, my dear Holmes, at seven o'clock this evening, we found ourselves approaching Chevy Grange. It was rather a forbidding-looking place, covering a little more than an acre, I should say. As we stood waiting for admittance, I must confess that I was not entirely... Oh. Gloomy-looking place, isn't it, Mary? It is a little forbidding, John, dear. Oh, dear. What's that? Sounds like a tom-tom. Someone singing a weird chant. Seems to be coming from the direction of that barn over there. It doesn't seem quite appropriate, dear, does it? I mean, not in the heart of Buckinghamshire. Why not knock on the door again, John? Yes, it's all right, I will. Perhaps they didn't hear us. Oh, oh they did. Who is it? Oh, it's guests. It's Dr. and Mrs. Watson, my good man. Acker's the name, sir. Come in, please. The colonel's expecting you, sir. He's in the study. This way, sir. By the way, Hacker, as we were waiting outside the front door, we heard a strange chant, and it sounded as if someone was beating a, a tom-tom. Oh, that's a, That was Miss Narder. Hearing more of her. Promising beginning. Let's see what happened next. This uh, very unpleasant fellow hacker showed us into the study where we met Colonel Warburton. First, it was hard to believe that he was a sick man. He looked well enough, and his conversation was sprightly. Spent most of his army life in Africa as military governor in a Zulu district. And the African spears and other trophies that lined his study walls bore mute evidence to his past life. He encouraged me to tell him some of my own army experiences. Oh, dear. Poor fellow. It was really rather clever. There I was, Colonel Warburton, on the howler of this wretched elephant. The river was a raging torrent, and I couldn't get the confounded animal to budge. Well, <laughs> I'm a pretty strong swimmer, you know. Won several cups of swimming, as a matter of fact. Of course, I was a much younger man then. Uh, and John, I... dear. Yes, ma'am? You interrupted Colonel Warburton's story, oh, dear. Oh, sorry. I thought this little incident would be interesting, sir. Uh, do go on, Colonel. Yes, sir, Your story was so interesting. Right. You were telling us that you were intercepted by an African drum code message. Oh, yes, yes. Well, I, I don't want to sound conceited, but I, I doubt if there was another Englishman in the world who could have told you what those particular drum beats meant. Oh, I don't doubt that, Colonel Warburton. Well, I'd spent a good number of years studying the native customs. I spotted the code right away. It meant that an uprising was planned to start throughout the whole province at noon the next day. Of course, I... Uh, there it is again. A devilish whistle. And you hear it, Dr. Watson? Mrs. Watson? I can hear nothing, sir. Nor can I. Of course not. No one could hear it but me. Now, 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 Colonel Warburton, don't get so excited, it's sir. It's black magic, that's what it is. Oh, really, sir, oh, black you magic. You must realize that the powers of jungle witchcraft are completely unknown in this country, Dr. Watson. But I know of them. And I can think of many people who might wish to employ them against me. <laughs> come in, come in. Oh. But it's you, Nada. Great Scott, she, she's... She's very beautiful. Nada, I want you to meet some friends of Ellen's. Dr. and Mrs. Watson. I am very pleased to meet both of you. How 
What do you do? How do you do, Miss uh, Nada? Nada's father was a Chaga jeweler, one of the greatest Zulu chieftains I ever had the privilege of knowing. He did me the rare honor to swear blood brotherhood. So when the missionary sent Nada to England to complete her education, I insisted that she spend her first few months here under my wing. I... Listen. What is it, Colonel? That whistle again. For heaven's sake, say that you heard it this time. Please say that you did. I didn't hear a thing, sir. Well, I did. And I know where that sound came from. Now, now, put down that spear at once, will you, Colonel Warburton? The devils are trying to kill me. I'll kill them first. No, no, no. Don't throw it, sir. Don't throw it. Someone's opening the door. Uncle. It's Ellen. Great Scott. The spear missed her by an inch. Uncle, what is it? Whistle. I heard it again, Ellen. And I'm going to find where it came from. I'm... Poor Uncle. Of course, you heard no sound. Nothing, Ellen. What can we do to help him, Dr. Watson? Well, it's hard to say, Miss Warden. I'm not sure that medical help is what she needs. Uh, he seems perfectly sane and lucid, except for these strange outbursts. But we must do something. I propose to, madam. As soon as I get back to the inn, I think I'll write to my old friend Sherlock Holmes and ask his advice. There's a problem. I can't feel that the man should be committed to an asylum, and yet, obviously, when these attacks are on him, he's as mad as a hatter. Oh, well, fascinating problem and one that calls for speedy action. I think a telegram to my friend Watson might help to clarify some aspects of the case. Yes. You see, uh, Dr. John H. Watson, Red Lion Inn, Taplow Bucks. I suggest that you ascertain one important fact. one important fact. Does the Warburton household have a dog? <laughs> Telegraph reply, Holmes. Oh, my soul, Mary. That's a cryptic answer to my letter. Yes, dear, it is. I'm afraid Ellen will be disappointed. He's coming over to join us for lunch to see if you have any news. Well, what on earth can dogs have to do with the case? I can't possibly... Ma Here's Helen now. Good morning, Ellen. Hello, Mary. Good morning, Doctor. Good morning, good morning. I suppose it's too early to have received any reply from Mr. Holmes. Well, as a matter of fact, I, I just got this telegram from him. You can read it if you like. I can't see it. It makes much sense, Miss so. But that's extraordinary. I did have a little dog. He was killed a week ago. But it didn't occur to me to tell you about it yesterday. Oh, that's amazing. How could Mr. Holmes have known about uh, it? There's very little that Holmes doesn't know, my dear. How was your dog killed, Miss Warburton? I found him in the grounds with his head smashed in by a stone. Oh, how dreadful. Who do you think did it? It might have been a poacher. And then again, it might have been... Your uncle? It's possible. When he's in those rages, I don't think he knows what he's doing. That's very important. I think I shall go and send Holmes a telegram at once. Don't wait lunch for me. Why did we have to walk over to the station, John, dear? To see if there was an answer at the station telegraph office to the wire that I sent home. Oh, it's only 4.30, dear. It's hardly possible for him to have answered as quickly as that. In any case, they delivered the telegram to the hotel, you know. Well, it was a nice walk, my dear. Hello, there's a, a train in the station now. I wonder where it's from. Why don't you ask that porter, dear? That's not a bad idea. Uh, porter, eh? what train is this? Oh, it's the London train, sir. Right on time. Next stop, ready... Not many people getting off here, are there? Great Scott, <laughs> look who's here. Oh, dear, it's Mr. Holmes. And he's got a dog on a leash. Oh, Watson, my dear fellow, how are you? This is Watson. How nice to see you again. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Oh, I'm Holmes. I'm delighted you're here, old fellow. We walked over to the station to see if you'd answered my telegram, and <laughs> here you are in person. <laughs> it occurred to me that I could be down here in the same time that it would take a telegram to reach you. And I decided that a day or two in the country would make a person change. Apart from the fact that Colonel Warburton's problem interests me enormously. Why on earth you bring a dog? I felt that this was a case in which a dog would be of invaluable assistance. Oh, oh be careful, John. Yes, look out, old chap. I, uh, I think it would be safer not to pat him. I picked him up in the Mile End Road for a couple of florins, and I fear he's a dog that should have remained in London. A singularly unattractive nature seems to have been entirely ruined by an honest train ride. Unpleasant brute, isn't he? By the way, Holmes, what do you make of the case from my letters? Well, I should prefer to reserve my judgment until I've met the colonel. However, I will about say one opinion. Oh, what's that? To paraphrase a proverb, don't disbelieve all you don't hear. <laughs> I can't 
can't think why someone doesn't answer. They can't all be out. Now, while we're waiting, I think I'll tie the dog up to this tree here. I don't want my arrival to too much commotion. Quiet! Quiet! Don't you think perhaps we could try the door, John? Yes, certainly. It's a good idea. Hello, hello. It's unlocked. Then let's go in, old fellow. Let's go in. Colonel Warburton? Colonel Warburton? Ellen? Oh, Ellen? What was the name of that, that butler fella? Hacker. Yes, of course, that's it, Hacker. Uh, Hacker! Hacker! We appear to be in an empty house. <laughs> the dog! Oh, fool that I am, I shouldn't have left him here. Come on! Ah. Oh. We're too late. Oh, the poor dog. He's been killed. Yes, poor brute. Stabbed to death by one of the Colonel's spears. That proves it, Holmes. The man is mad. I think not, Watson. I think it proves that Colonel Warburton is a great deal more sane than some of the members of his household. You'll hear the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just a few seconds. Time for me to remind you that there's one secret every smart woman knows. Simply, good wine makes good food taste better. And by good wine... Naturally, I mean Petri wine. Try a Petri wine with your dinner. If you want a wonderful red wine, try Petri California Burgundy. If you want a perfect white wine, try Petri California Sauterne. In fact, try them both. You'll agree, I'm sure, that next to your good cooking, nothing can do more for a meal than a glass of good wine. A glass of Petri wine. <laughs> And now back to tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure, the story of Colonel Warburton's madness. Holmes, why are we heading for this barn? Seems to me we should be back in the house. Why, old chap? Found the house empty. Besides, I thought I heard. Shh, shh, shh. What is it? Listen. It's the same sound that Mary and I heard yesterday. Once more, it's coming from the barn. Come on, Watson. But quietly. We can see through this window here. It's that Zulu girl, Nada. She's beating a drum and chanting. Who's the man with her? It's Colonel Warburton. No, it isn't. It's that servant fellow, Hacker. What in thunder is he doing here? Apparently assisting Miss Nada in some of her uh, African mysticism. It's black magic they're dabbling with, just as the colonel said. Let's go in and catch him red handed. No, no, no. Stay quiet. We'll talk to them soon enough. The moment I feel it's uh, much more urgent that we find Colonel Warburton. Come on. <laughs> There's the colonel pacing up and down in front of the house with Mary and his, and his niece, Miss Warburton. We shouldn't have left the women alone with him, you know. The man's dangerous. I don't think the women have been in any danger, Watson. John, dear, where have you been? Oh, well, Holmes and I decided we'd do uh, take a little walk. It proved very interesting. Uh, Miss Warburton, uh, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes. How do you do, Mr. Holmes? I'm so glad you're here. How do you do, Miss Warburton? And this is Colonel Warburton, Mr. Sherlock, Sherlock Holmes. Holmes, eh? I suppose you think I killed your wretched dog. Well, I might have done it. When I hear that whistle, something seems to snap in my brain. I might have killed it. Why doesn't your doctor friend certify me as insane? Send me where I belong before I do any worse, Nemi. Poor man. Isn't there anything you can do for him, Mr. Holmes? I most certainly will try to, Miss Warburton. What's no fellow? I wonder if you'd follow the colonel and give him a sedative. I'm afraid he has quite an ordeal before mm-hmm. him. Of course I will, Holmes. Miss Warburton, where were you when my dog was killed? Down in the greenhouse. As soon as I heard the poor animal yelping, I ran up to the house. I see. Mr. Holmes, you are going to be able to help the colonel, aren't you? I'm convinced of it, Mrs. Watson. That is why I brought a dog with me from London. But now that he's dead, I I must obtain another one before I can proceed further with the case. Now, I wonder where on earth I can find a dog. Well, look, look. Huh? Down by the gate, there's a little girl walking with the dog. That's Sarah Entwistle, the daughter of our neighbors. Sarah, eh? Oh, excuse me, will you? Just a moment. Sarah! Sarah! Oh, 
Oh, Sarah. Sarah, my dear. What a, uh, what a pretty dog you have there. What's his name? It's a her. Her name's Boojum. What's your name? <laughs> Holmes. Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock? <laughs> That's a funny name. Yes, yes, it is, isn't it? Uh, look here, Sarah. Uh, here's a nice, shiny half-crown for you. Why are you giving me money? Well, because I love dogs, my... I want to borrow, um, what did you call him? Boojum. Boojum, oh, yes, yes. I want to borrow Boojum for half an hour. Why? Well, I, I want to, uh, I want to play with her, Sarah. You can play with her here. She's awfully friendly. <laughs> well, you see, I, I, I really want to take her for a nice walk. Why? She's just had one. Now, look here, Sarah. It's a beautifully shiny half crown. Mommy's told me I mustn't take money from strangers. But I'm not a stranger. I'm a friend of Colonel Warburton. Having trouble, Mr. Holmes? Yes, I am, Mrs. Watson. You see, I, I want to give Sarah half a crown for borrowing Boojum for a short while, but she, well, she doesn't want to do it. Sarah, does Boojum like bones? Oh, <gasps> yes. Loves them. We've got a lot of bones up at the house we'd like to give her. Have they got plenty of meat on them? Mm, plenty. She can have a wonderful feast, and then we'll bring her back in half an hour. All right. Go on, Boojum. Now, promise you'll bring her back in half an oh, hour. We promise. Yes, Sarah. And, and Sarah, what about the, uh... Now, what about the half crown? Well, I'll take it home and ask Mummy if I may keep it. Good. Goodbye. Goodbye. And take care of Boojum. <laughs> oh, she's a sweet little girl. Mr. Holmes, you're not going to expose Boojum to any danger, are you? None, Mrs. Watson. Otherwise, I shouldn't have borrowed her. I'm convinced that Boojum will give us the clue to what appears to be Colonel Warburton's madness. <laughs> Now, let me see. We're all here. Miss Warburton, the Colonel, Miss Nada, Hacker, and the dog, Boojum. Yes. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I propose to conduct an experiment. Before I conduct it, I should like to point out the chronology of the events in this case. First, Miss Nada arrived here. Mr. Holmes, you're not suggesting uh, uh, Please that... let me finish, Miss Nada. First, Miss Nada arrived here. Second, the Colonel first heard the mysterious whistle. Third, your dog was killed, Miss Warburton. Fourth, the whistling set in in dead earnest. Uh, the Colonel Warburton and Miss Warburton... Doesn't that pattern suggest anything to you? No, I can't say that it does, Mr. Holmes. I don't see what you're driving at. Well, more do I, Holmes. We should be more explicit. Very well, then I will. I shall uh, now conduct my experiment. I want you all to watch Colonel Warburton and the dog Boojum. Excuse me while I turn my back. Now. Oh. There it is again. That whistle. <laughs> The dog heard it, too. Yeah. Great, Tom Holmes. What does it mean? It means that this wooden whistle in my hand is the answer to the mystery. The sound made by this cunningly designed instrument is above the normal range of pitch. You see, the colonel has hypersensitive ears. So the dog heard it. Perhaps I should have said the normal human range of pitch. Then do you suppose someone has deliberately been trying to drive the colonel mad? Of course, man. That's why the dogs were murdered. Whoever it was knew that a dog would give the game away. And it's not hard to guess who that someone is. Nada, this started when you came here. Is this your gratitude for the colonel's kindness to you? Endangering his sanity with your evil black magic? That is not true. Uh, one moment, please, Miss Warburton. Miss Nutter. Yes, Mr. Holmes. Dr. Watson and I watched you in the barn some three quarters of an hour ago with Hacker. Were you engaged in practicing any form of black magic? No, no. I was praying to my old gods to save the colonel's sanity. What were you doing there, Hacker? Don't tell me you were praying to old gods, too. Oh, I used to be a chapel-going man, sir, but I don't know. No harm in trying something new, I always say. In any case, why should Miss Nada wish to persecute the colonel? It might be for some tribal revenge. Oh, but that's ridiculous, Ellen. Her father and I were sworn blood brothers. Exactly, sir. No, it should be obvious. Who had a motive for making the colonel appear mad? His niece and heiress. What do you mean? She has studied physics, you will remember, and so could know about supersonic research. Possibly she was afraid the colonel might leave his estate to Miss Nada. And so wished him to appear insane and thereby invalidate a new will. What? In any case, I found this whistle in a drawer in your room, Miss Warburton. Ellen! Ellen, how could you? I did it for your sake, to save you from Nada. She's just an adventuress, only you won't see it. Colonel Warburton, what action do you wish me to take regarding your niece, Miss Warburton? My niece? I have no niece, Mr. Holmes. Come, Nada, my dear. <laughs> Oh, what an amazing case, Holmes. Mary, wasn't it clever the way Holmes solved it? It was very interesting, dear. I was quite enthralled. 
Oh, now I think I shall return to London and let you two finish your holiday in peace. Before you do that, Mr. Holmes, there's one thing we should do. What, Mary? Boo jump. <laughs> we promised, you know. Oh, yes, yes, of course, of course. I think the three of us might walk her home. But before we do that, I suggest we rummage through the kitchen. The kitchen? What on earth for? Bones, dear. Exactly. And bones with plenty of meat on them. <laughs> Say, Doctor, that was a swell story. And look, uh, you mean there really is a whistle that only dogs can hear? I thought you'd ask me that question, so I've got one of those whistles to show you. There. Well, there's nothing unusual about it. Blow it, Doctor. Well, listen, Mr. Bartell, if, if I want you to come quickly, I don't just have to whistle. All I have to say is, would anybody like a glass of Petri wine? And, hey, hey, presto, there you are. <laughs> well, can you blame me? I know a good wine when I hear it. And Petri wine sure is good wine. It ought to be. The Petri family's been making wine for generations. As you know, ever since they started the Petri business, way back in the 1800s, that business has always been family-owned and operated. So just think of all the experience the Petri family's gained. They've been able to hand on down from father to son, from father to son, all they've ever learned about the art of turning luscious California grapes into fragrant, delicious wine. So whenever you're choosing a wine, a wine to serve before dinner, with dinner, or at any time, you can't go wrong with a Petri wine. Because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is based on an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Engineer's Thumb. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Oh, the Petri family took the time to bring you such good wine. So when you eat and when you cook, remember Petri wine. To make good food taste better, remember... Pet, Pet, Petri wine. This is Harry Bartell saying good night for the Petri family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invites you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting story about his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And we'd also like to tell you something you really ought to know. The fact that the one sure way to make good food taste better is to try that good food together with a glass of good Petri wine. Did you ever try Petri wine with dinner? No kidding, that's one bandwagon you sure want to hop on. Take, for instance, a deep red, hearty Petri California Burgundy. Wait till you taste that Petri Burgundy with, let's say, a delicious old-fashioned beef stew. Or maybe try a glass with spaghetti. I'm telling you, when you add the luscious flavor of that Petri Burgundy to the flavor of your favorite foods, you're really living. You're finding out for the first time what good eating really means, on the level. So better keep a bottle of that Petri Burgundy right on the dining room table. And never forget... The best friend a good meal ever had is a glass of Petri wine. And now for our weekly visit with the good Dr. Watson. May I come in, Doctor? No, 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 Mr. Bartell. You know me better than that. Of course you can come in. I'm expecting you. I always look forward to these Monday evenings together, you know. (laughs) Me too, Doctor. In fact, I always say this is the one doctor's appointment that never scares me. Oh, that's very nice of you, my boy. Draw up your chair and make yourself comfortable. Thanks. 
And uh, what prescription do you have in mind for us tonight, Doctor? Oh, well, now, let me see. Take one measure of subterranean peril, one of aristocratic lady in distress, a sprinkling of assorted villains, a corpse or two, and a little more than a dash of Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Shake the mixture well, and you have the case of the out-of-date murder. Well, how did the adventure begin, Doctor? Exactly enough. It was in September of 1900. I remember that Holmes and I went to Eastbourne for a much-needed rest. The first couple of days we spent in soothing idleness. On the morning of the third day, Holmes, a dash of color back in his cheek and a hint of the old sparkle in his eye, suggested that he should go and call on his good friend Evan Whitnell, curator of a nearby museum. And so, just after lunch on that September day, found the two of us talking to Professor Evan Whitnell in his private office at the museum. It only seems yesterday. Holmes. Mr. Whitnell, your recent discoveries in this part of England have made you world famous instead of just nationally famous. My congratulations. Uh, Professor, I do wish you'd tell me uh, about your discoveries. Well, with pleasure, Dr. Watson. Uh, uh, less than two months ago, I was excavating on the downlands in this neighborhood when I was fortunate enough to discover a number of underground caves. Uh, caves saturated with a heavy deposit of lime uh, that gave clear evidence of having the property of rapidly mummifying any flesh, human or animal, uh, deposited in them. Oh, gracious me. Interesting. And what treasures have you unearthed, Professor? Well, a number of mummified specimens of animals clearly belonging to bygone eras. My prized specimen is the body of a large wolfhound. Uh, the inscription on its collar identified the animal as be having belonged to some local squire in the year 1748. Amazing. I didn't know that limestone had such qualities of preservation. Uh, come in, come in. Uh, yes, Alan, what is it? It's Lady Clavering, Professor. She asked me to tell you that she was in the museum. Oh, yes, 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 sir. Uh, uh, sure up here, will you, Alan? Very good, sir. Yes, sir. I'm most anxious for you both to meet her, and she in turn is even more anxious to meet you. Now, I dined with her last night, and when I told her that you were coming here today, she insisted on meeting me. Oh, wait, no, you scoundrel. There's a twinkle in your eye. I suspect that Lady Clavering is here to consult me in my professional capacity, and that you engineer the meeting. <laughs> well, uh, perhaps I might have dropped a hint. No, no, I warn you, Professor Holmes can't become involved with another case. He's completely run down. Well, don't worry, Doctor. All that Lady Clavering requires is a little advice. Advice? Oh, well, well, that's a different matter altogether. Yes, sir. Well, uh, I knew you wouldn't mind, Holmes. Ah, uh... oh, Helena, my dear, there you are. Uh, come along in. Uh, thank you, uh, Alan. Allow me to introduce Lady Clavering, uh, Mr. Sherlock Holmes and uh, Dr. Watson. How do you do, Lady How are you, gentlemen? Now, uh, there you are, my dear. Uh, sit down here. I may as well tell you, Helena, that our little plot has already been discovered. Oh, dear. And I was just getting ready to exert all my feminine wiles in an attempt to persuade you to help me, Mr. Holmes. Oh, I'm certain that he found you utterly irresistible, my dear Lady Clavering. You flatter me, Doctor. <laughs> no, no, I, I mean it. The professor tells me that you're in need of a little advice, Lady Clavering. Yes, Mr. Holmes. I'll put my question simply. Five years ago, my husband, Sir George Clavering, left me. Left you? It was me. How uh, stupid of him. I haven't seen or heard tell of him since. I now wish to remarry. But, of course, I couldn't do that without having my husband declared legally dead. My dear Lady Clavering, I can't help feeling that a lawyer is the proper man to consult, not a detective. Uh, perhaps you're suggesting that there was foul play in connection with your husband's disappearance. Oh, no, Dr. Watson. The Claverings are a strange family, self-willed and headstrong... George and I were not happy together. I think he disappeared deliberately. You reported his disappearance to the police, of course. Oh, yes, Mr. Holmes. But they've never been able to trace him. Uh, this kind of thing has happened in the family before, Holmes. Uh, tell them about Sir Nigel, Helena. Well, he was one of my husband's ancestors. He walked out one day in 1777 and was never seen again. Extraordinary family. Always disappearing. George oh, knew of the legend. And he often threatened to do the same thing himself. But your problem, Lady Clavering, is not that of your husband's fate, but rather of your own freedom. Yes, Mr. Holmes. Well, I'm afraid my advice can be of little consolation to you. The law has specified a number of years that must elapse before anyone disappearing can be declared legally dead. I would suggest that you possess your soul in patience until that period has elapsed. Oh, dear. And I was hoping you'd be able to think of some terribly clever way of getting round the law, Mr. Holmes. Uh, Lady Clavering, uh, 
Sometimes perhaps my methods may be unorthodox, but I assure you that getting around the law, as you put it, is a procedure I do not indulge in. Oh, dear me, now I've offended you, Mr. Holmes, and it's the last thing on earth I meant to do, I assure you. My friend's a little touchy about matters concerning his professional honor, you know, Lady Cameron. Oh, nonsense, my dear Watson. I'm not touchy and I'm not offended. And now, may I suggest we all examine the professor's latest treasures, and after that, perhaps, he'll take us for a stroll on the downs. I'm most anxious to examine those lime pits of his. The uh, lime pits are about a mile from here. It's a nice walk across the cliff tops. Well, I'm sorry Lady Clavering didn't want to come with us. A charming woman, even though she did rub you up the wrong way. A beautiful woman, Watson, but I must confess her charm eludes me. Her lack of concern about her husband's fate seemed completely unnatural. Yeah, not if you'd known her husband, Sir George Clavering. He was a tyrant and a bully, both in his home life and in the village. Huh? Who's this coming towards us? It's uh, Timmy. Daft Timmy, they call him in these parts. He isn't quite right in the head, poor fellow, but he's perfectly harmless. Has uh, two passions in life, birds and bonfires. Hello, Timmy. I've got something beautiful to show you. Oh, it's so beautiful. Well, what is it, Timmy? Look, it's in my cap. See? Oh, isn't it lovely? It's a robin's egg. I found it when I was bird nesting. Did you... Ever see such a blue egg? It's a beauty, Timmy. Where did you find it, my boy? Down by the lime pits. Oh, I'm going to build a lovely fire on the downs tonight. I'll let you come and watch it if you give me a shilling. Now, you be careful, Timmy, or you'll be in trouble again. Timmy doesn't get in trouble anymore now. Not since he had Sir George carried away. Sir George Clavering used to whip Timmy when he found him on the land. Uh, Timmy, tell me, how did you have uh, Sir George, uh, as you put it... uh carried away. I told my birds about him. I told them how he used to to beat poor Timmy, and they said they'd carry him off and drop him over the cliffs. (laughs) And and, and that's what they did, because he never came back again. Oh, Lord, here comes Harry, Sir George's brother. Now there'll be trouble. Timmy, you'd better run. Oh, oh, no. No, Timmy can't run. He'll break his pretty blue egg. Timmy! Timmy! Get off my land. If I catch you here again, I'll take my riding crop to you. Timmy hasn't done anything. Go on, be off with you, do you hear? I'll tell my birds about you. That's what I'll do. Oh, don't forget my bonfire. Infernal scoundrel. Hello, Whitnell. Hello, Harry. Uh, Have you met uh, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson? Oh, Mm. Sherlock Holmes, the professional nosy Parker, eh? Yes, yes, Helena was just telling me about you. I'm very angry with her for talking to you about my brother. It's a private affair, and I intend it should remain one. You understand, Holmes? Well, upon my soul. The devil with your brother, sir. And with you. I'd advise you to remember that you're not addressing a half-witted villager who can't defend himself. If you know what's good for you, you'll do what I say. Here, Chris. Impertinent brute. He spoke to you as if you were a stable boy, Holmes. (laughs) Oh, really? He was quite refreshing. I'm reminded of an apposite quotation of my young friend James Elroy Flecker. Thine impudence have a monstrous beauty, like unto the hindquarters of an elephant. Yeah. He's almost as much disliked as his brother before him. Uh, tell me, does he succeed to the title when his brother is declared legally dead? Oh, yes, and, and what's more, he's Helena's unofficial fiancé, worse luck. I see. Uh, personally, I'm beginning to get a trifle bored with the affairs of the Clavering family. Let's go on to the Lime Cave, shall we? These caves are amazing. We must be 50 feet below the level of the ground, aren't we, Whitnell? Well, more than that, I should say. Rock formation is most unusual. A series of caves connected by a veritable honeycomb of tunneling. Yes, yes, yes. I, I think I'll light the lantern now. It's dark in here, and I haven't explored this particular cave before. Yes, I've uh, had a wall cave in on me a couple of times, so you'd better watch where you're walking. Uh, uh, now we can see better. Uh, let's go deeper, shall we? Uh, but do watch your step. Hmm. It's eerie down here, isn't it? Hello. Oh, what's this in the covers here? 
Looks like a mummified bird of some kind. It is a beautiful specimen. Judging by its markings, a black streak here and bars of white in the tail, I'd say it was a peregrine. That's exactly what it is, a falcon. Dating back a couple of hundred years, I should say. And in a perfect state of preservation. Oh, this is a treasure. Uh, come on, uh, let's explore deeper. There's another cave over here. If you hold the lantern up a little, I'll... Uh... Oh, I say. Good Lord, the, the whole wall's collapsed. Watson, you're not hurt, are you? No, 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 Holmes, I'm all right. Why, you've unearthed another cave, Dr. Watson. Uh, uh, let's go in. I, I think we can just manage to crawl through. Great Scott, I, I don't believe my eyes. Magnificent. Whitnall. This is a treasure indeed. A perfectly preserved body dressed in 18th century costume, powdered with an all. Yes. And there's no mistaking who it is. Look at that typical beak profile. It's a clavering. And it isn't hard to identify which one. Uh, you mean the one that Lady Helena told us about this afternoon? Exactly. Without doubt, this is the body of Sir Nigel Clavering, who disappeared in 1777. Uh, let's search his pockets. We might find some identification. Yeah. Uh, uh, here's a snuff box of the period. And some coins. Yes, the inscription of George III is still visible on them. Hello, here's, here's his diary. This is unbelievable. What are you up to, Holmes? We're examining the body, Watson. This man was murdered. Murdered? This wound just above the heart. Obviously inflicted with a sharp instrument, probably a dagger. This is interesting. An entirely new experience for me. The opportunity of solving an unsuspected murder committed well over a hundred years ago. Glance through that diary, Watson, will you, old chap? Let's see if the poor devil suspected his fate. Well, hard to read. All the S's look like F's. The peculiarity of the 18th century writing. They are paying, or I should have been saying, they are paying in the coffee houses that my brother Harry hath been coveting my wife. But this is amazing, Holmes. See how history repeats itself. It's an exact parallel of the situation existing today. Harry is coveting his brother's wife, Helena, and Sir George has not been seen for five years. What an extraordinary coincidence. If it were one... As it is, it's one of the most ingenious frauds I've ever seen. The clothing appears authentic, so do the coins and the faded ink, the paper of the diary, and due to the peculiar mummification of the body, it would be almost impossible to say how long it's been here. Nevertheless, I am convinced that this is a recent corpse, and undoubtedly that of Sir George Clavering. Well, what makes you so sure, huh? Writing the diary. 18th century used an S. It looked like an F, it is true, but never at the end of a word. You will recall, Watson, that you were reading... H-A-F, have, for H-A-S, has. That's perfectly true, I was. Well, that would be incorrect and genuine 18th century writing. No, obviously, this is an extremely clever attempt to disguise the comparatively recent murder of Sir George Clavering. It's incredible, Holmes. And yet I believe you're right. I'm sure of it. Well, what are you going to do about it? Do? You and I, old chap, will mount guard over the body. You, my dear Whitnall, if you don't mind, will be good enough to go and fetch the police. <laughs> Holmes. Yes, old chap? What do you suppose is keeping the police? Whitnell must have gone over an hour. And the lantern with him. Here we are, crouching in the dark in a smelly cave, 50 feet under the cliffs, with a mummified corpse. Very true, Watson, but I don't... Uh-huh. Here comes the lantern. It must be Whitnell and the police. Whitnell! That you, Whitnell? That lantern's blinding me. Is that you, Whitnell? Answer, can't you? Look out, Watson! Dr. Watson's story will continue in just a second. And I'm going to take that second to ask you what you think of when I say good food. When you say good food to me, I can see myself really going down on a piece of fried chicken, but, but really fried, you know, crisp and sort of a light brown. 
When I see that chicken, I sure want to see some Petri California Sauterne. Because, believe me, Petri Sauterne is a white wine that's the wine for chicken. That Petri Sauterne has a delicate kind of flavor. Delicate like its pale gold color. But what a flavor. and What a wine. If you want a swell white wine, you certainly want Petri Sauterne. Try it and see. <laughs> And now, back to Dr. Watson and tonight's story, The Case of the Out-of-Date Murder. Well, Doctor, you certainly had me on the edge of my chair during the first part of the story. Oh, I'm glad of that, my boy. Say, what happened when Sherlock Holmes yelled out at you in the cave? I was struck from behind with a spade and knocked out. A second later, the same thing happened to Holmes. You see, we were blinded by the lantern and couldn't protect ourselves. When we came to, we found we were at the bottom of a pit. The walls were narrow and vertical, and I saw no earthly way of our getting out of the trap. But as usual... Holmes has something up his sleeve. Oh, my. my head's throbbing. Never mind that for the moment, old chap. Put the coat off in your shirt. Oh, well, no, oh, come on, come on, right. off with it, old huh? boy. Come on, off with it. I, I've already removed mine and tied them together. Oh, what for? Oh, dear me, that blow on your head must have been unusually severe. I'm trying to make a kind of rope, Watson, a rope to get us out of here. Oh, what's the good of a rope unless there's someone on the ledge above us to haul us out? But you think you're performing the Indian rope trick. My dear Watson, this is no time for your rather heavy-handed humor. Why do you keep whistling like that? You've been doing it for the past 20 minutes. I'm whistling for help. Well, why not shout? Whistle carries further. No, dear. Who's going to hear that? That, Timmy, I hope. Remember, he was having a bonfire on the tip-top tonight. My whistle is that of a nightingale, a song unheard in Sussex at this time of the year. If he does answer it, I'm sure it'll bring him down here. I hope you're right. Seems to me that Whitnell and the police will never find us here. We shall mummify just as the filthy murderer intended us to. Courage, Watson, I'm sure. It's worked! It's Timmy! Cutting a burning log! Get out of here, Timmy! Nightingale? Pretty birdie! What are you doing down there? Timmy! I've tied these clothes together to make a rope. I'm going to throw them up. You ready? Catch! Good. He's caught it. Now, Timmy, lower it to us. Oh, I shouldn't do this. They'll whip me? No, no, no. Nobody will whip you, Timmy. And we both want to give you a shilling to come up and see your bonfire. Oh, oh, that's different. Two shiny shillings. I'll lower the rope. Here it comes. Ah, that's it. All right, I'll throw it. You first. All right, Timmy, pull away. Uh, here we go. Splendid. I'm up, Holmes. Now I'll lower it for you. All right. I've got it. Look out now. Here I come. Ah. Uh, thank goodness we got out of that place all right. I don't see the nightingale. Oh, you must have him inside your coat. Well, well, never mind. We'll all go up to my bonfire and get warm. It's such a pretty bonfire. Did you ever see a finer bonfire? Never, Timmy. It's lovely. It's the most comforting sight I've seen for the last couple of hours. Oh, just one thing's bad, though. Somebody tried to burn a book in my lovely fire. It must have been when I was off getting more wood. I, I found it when I came back, and I pulled it out of the fire and stamped on it. See? Here it is. Oh, let's have a look. Hello, it's the diary that we found on the body in the lime pit. Precisely, Watson. Now I begin to see daylight. People shouldn't burn books. Books are nice. Books are like birds and, and bonfires. Well, they're nice to be near. Oh, oh, your nightingale must be cold. I'll get some more twigs to burn. Well, now that fellow's gone away for a moment, I can see why we were attacked tonight. The murderer knew that we were going to, to the caves. He was afraid that his devilish plot wouldn't stand up under your scrutiny. So he, he watched us. When we discovered the body and sent Whitnell off for the police, 
He knew he'd got to get rid of us. And who do you think that somebody is, old fellow? Oh, that's easy. Only one person strong enough to have knocked us both out and shifted our bodies. The dead Sir George's brother, Harry Clavering. I think not, old fellow. Didn't you observe as we entered the caves that pickaxes and wheelbarrows were much in evidence? Yes, that's, uh, that's right. They, they were, of course. Strength was not required under the circumstances. We were extremely vulnerable in the darkness. Any man with a modicum of cunning could have disposed of us, or any woman, for that matter. Good Lord, you, you're not oh, suggesting that... Uh... Watson! Oh, what no! Why, thank heaven you're safer! I've had the police with me for the last hour, but we couldn't find you. You went where I left you. True. Uh, Whitnell, I want you and the police to take me to Lady Cavering's house at once. After that, I wish to lodge information and make a charge of assault and possibly a charge of murder. And that, Lady Clavering, is the story of how we found your husband's body. How oh, horrible, Mr. Holmes. Horrible. But who in thunder could have planned such a devilish plot? Yeah, why did the murderer attack you and Watson? There, my dear Whitnall, you have the key to the murderer's identity. The man who so cunningly conceived and executed the murder of Sir George could never have bungled the job of disposing of Watson and myself unless he had meant to bungle it. You mean he didn't mean to kill us? Exactly. He merely wished us out of the way while the incriminating evidence was removed. You mean the diary? Of course I do. You will recall we found it partially burnt in Timmy's bonfire. Then it was Timmy who... No, 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 my dear fellow. Surely it's obvious. One person and only one. Knew that the diary was the key to the murderer's identity. The man who was present when we discovered it and detected the fraud. Great Scott, Professor Whitnell. Whitnell, you murdered my brother. Evan. Evan, you? Oh, no. I did it because I love you, Helena. All these years has been nothing in my life that meant anything but you. How could you? I thought that if George were out of the way, I could make you care for me. And when I realized that you loved Harry, I, I was mad with jealousy. And so I planned to conceal George's body forever. It was a clever plan. You said so yourself, Holmes. If it hadn't been for you, it would have worked. Yes, it was diabolically clever, Whitnall, but I'm afraid that no amount of cleverness now can prevent you from paying for your crime. Sir George... I suggest that you instruct the police to come in. Our work is done. Holmes, Holmes, look there on the point. Timmy's bonfire is still burning away. Yes. Timmy's a simple fellow with simple tastes. Why are you so gloomy? You solved the case brilliantly. My dear fellow, my... My faith in human nature has been sadly shaken, or trapped. Evan Whitmore was a good friend and an old one. Hard to be instrumental in sending him to the gallows. Well, he richly deserved yes, it. Yes, yes, I know he did. That's quite true. But it's depressing just the same. Come on. Let's continue our walk home across the downs. I heard Sir Harry offering you a fee. Did you take it? No, I didn't. But I did accept his offer of an acre of land on the downs over there near the Abbey Ruins. You can see them silhouetted against the sky. An acre of land? What on earth would you do with that? Well, when I retire, and I shall retire soon, I've often thought of bee farming. This would be a heavenly spot for such a venture. Well, I can't imagine you as a beekeeper. Oh, why not? After a life spent unraveling the tangled affairs of human beings, it would be soothing in the twilight of one's days to study the exact and predictable behavior of bees. Singing masons... Building roofs of gold. Oh, well. One day, perhaps. Perhaps. One day. Well, Doctor, that was a swell story. You know, I'm sure glad we get together like this once a week. Oh, thank you very much. Next week, why not come over a little earlier for dinner? Oh, no, I, I wouldn't think of having you go through all that trouble. Oh, well, of course, if you feel that way, well, say, aren't you going to coax me? <laughs> <laughs> to tell you the truth, I, I knew I wouldn't have to coax you. Mr. Bartell, I was just going to show you the two thick steaks that I've got frozen in my refrigerator. Oh, no. Oh, yes. I'll also put aside a bottle of Petri Burgundy. Well, in which case, I'll bring along a very hearty appetite. If you pick the steak, I know it's good, and when it's Petri wine, you know that's got to be good, too. Because the Petri family has been making fine wine for generations. They've owned and operated the Petri business ever since its inception, way back in the 1800s. During all that time, they've sure learned plenty about the fine art of turning luscious grapes into clear, fragrant, delicious wine. 
And they've been able to take this experience and hand it on down from father to son, from father to son. That's why when you want a wine for any occasion, you can't go wrong with a Petri wine. Because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Now, Dr. Watson, what story do you have lined up for us next week? Well, now, let me see. Next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you an adventure that occurred to Holmes and me in the shadowy depths of the Limehouse District in London. It's a strange tale of death and terror. I call the story The Eyes of Mr. Layton. Well, Doctor, we'll be sure not to miss it. And meanwhile, don't you forget you promised to contribute to the National War Fund. National War Fund? Of course, Mr. Bartell. It's a must. The money you give to your war fund not only helps the men and women in our armed forces, and it not only helps our allies, but that money goes to work right in your own community, helping make possible many relief and welfare agencies in your own hometown. So let's all be generous in victory. Give to your community war fund. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is based on an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventure of Wisteria Lodge. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro Goldwyn Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invites you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting story about his good friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And I'd like to tell you something that maybe you already know. The fact that America's favorite wine is port wine. Did you know that? If you didn't, you'll know why port is the way out front favorite if you'll just sample some Petri California port. You just look at that Petri port and you know it's good. That wonderful, deep, rich red color. And Petri port is so clear. Just hold it to the light and you can sort of see right through the glass. But what you want to know really about a wine is how does it taste? And I'll tell you something. I've never yet been able to find the adjective that'll do Petri port justice. It's wonderful, honest. You've just got to taste it for yourself and find out for yourself. You'll love that Petri port in the evening after dinner when you're sitting around listening to the radio. And it's perfect to serve your friends when they come over. You can show them that Petri label, too. In fact, you can show it proudly because the name Petri is the proudest name in the history of American wines. And now for our weekly doctor's visit. Let's see... No, 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 Mr. Bartell, don't say let's see if he's expecting us. You know, I always expect you this time on Monday evenings, my boy. So draw up your usual chair and settle down. Thanks, doctor. Ah, that's it. Ah, All alone this evening, doctor? Where are the puppies? Out on the patio. They had a most unfortunate encounter with a dead seal on the beach this afternoon. In consequence, they're a little uh, malodorous, shall we say. (laughs) In that case, doctor, perhaps we'd better change the subject. So, suppose I ask you about tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure. Well, my boy, as I told you last week, the story took place in the foul alleyways of Limehouse. It was there on a foggy December evening in 1890 that my story began. An old friend and patient of mine, Isa Whitney, had disappeared, and his distraught wife had come to me for help. Knowing the man to be the victim of the shocking habit of taking opium, I suspected that I might find him in one of the vile dens inhabited by the dregs of the waterfront. And so, Mr. Bartell, about five o'clock on that December evening, I began my search. After an hour of fruitless wanderings, I found myself in a vile alley called Upper Swandham Lane. I could hear the distant moans of the river boats as I walked, eyes alert, and hand on the revolver in my coat pocket. <laughs> Suddenly, I saw a steep flight of steps leading down to a black gap like the mouth of a cave. I walked down them. The steps were worn hollow in the center by the ceaseless tread of stumbling feet. I reached the bottom. A door faced me and above it, a flickering oil lamp 
Weak warning, Zedman. I found the latch and lifted it. The door squeaked open protestingly. And I entered. There was a tinkle of Chinese wind bells as I walked towards a long, low room. A strange sight met my eyes. Through the gloom, thick and heavy with a brown opium smoke, I saw that the room was terraced with wooden berths, like the forecastle of an emigrant ship. Out of the shadows, there glimmered little red circles of light, now bright, now faint, as a burning poison waxed or waned in the metal pipes. Bodies lay in strange, fantastic poses, bowed shoulders, bent knees, heads thrown back. The attendant came up to me with a pipe and beckoned me to an empty berth. I haven't come here to smoke your filthy drug. I'm looking for a friend, Mr. Isa Whitney. No, Mr. Whitney here. Well, I'm going to search the place. You must not disturb the place. I'm carrying a revolver, so you'd better not argue with me, my good man. Out of the way. I searched that filthy den, but found no trace of my missing friend. As I was leaving in despair, a long shaking hand reached out and plucked at my sleeve. I turned, and there sprawled in a berth was the wreckage of a man. His gaunt face yellow and twitching his clothes filthy and ragged, and the pupil of his eyes like pinpoints. He spoke to me in a thin, quavering voice. Mr. Reverend Saint, get me out of here. Now, look here, my man. Don't say you won't help me, Governor. Ain't you got no heart? Please help me, Governor. Take me out of here. Strike me pink, I'm going to bomb me, I tell you. Well, what must you expect if you indulge in this filthy habit? Take me out of here, Governor. I'll go straight this time. Cross me out, I will. Oh, very well. Come along with me. I suppose it's my duty to help you. Ah, bless you, Governor. Here you are. Here now, give me your arm. You cannot take him away. He owe me money. That's a bleeding lie. I paid him when I come in, I did. He cannot go with you, mister. You remember what I said about my revolver, you blackguard? If I have any more trouble with you, I'll, I'll fetch the police. Come along. He owe me money. He owe me money. Infernal scoundrel owe me money. You tell him all proper, Governor. And I hope you didn't. Now, look here, my good man. I'll give you a square meal, some advice, and some medical attention. But the rest... Never mind the advice, Watson, but I'll take you up on that square meal. Holmes! Yes, I'm very glad to see you, old fellow. What brought you to that filthy den of iniquity? Oh, uh, this is me. I want to find a friend. And I, an enemy. (laughs) Your disguise is wonderful. It completely fooled me. But I'm afraid the proprietor was beginning to penetrate it. That's why I staged the little rescue scene. Had I been recognized, my life wouldn't have been worth an hour's purchase. How long had you been there? Why were you there? Come on, Holmes, tell me all about it. With pleasure, old chap. But first, let's find a a chop house. I want that square meal you promised me. Excellent meal, Watson. Yes, you're surprisingly good for such a shoddy-looking place. Well, Holmes, now perhaps you'll tell me what you were doing in that opium den. I've already told you my story. I'm shadowing a most unusual criminal. A man who haunts the opium dens. Yet I know that he himself is not an addict. I don't see anything very criminal about that. He might be looking for a thrill, or perhaps he's one of those writer fellows or something. But this man pretends to be an addict. I've watched him closely. He fakes his smoking. And grease paint has enabled him to simulate the characteristic pallor of a drug victim. He even affects the typical mannerism of nose-scratching. But it's his eyes that give him away. The pupils are wide open, I suppose. Exactly, old fellow. Whereas... If he were really addicted to the drug, they would, as you know, be contracted. I myself always treat my eyes with a special, well, a special kind of drop on the occasion when, uh, well, I have to enter these dens. Well, why does a man haunt an opium den in order not to smoke? That, my dear Watson, is the problem that I intend to solve. Well, perhaps the fellow's a policeman or a private detective like yourself, Holmes. I've already checked on those possibilities. No, Watson, I believe there is only one answer. I believe the man is planning a murder. A murder? It's a tempting setting for a murder. Your victim is an addict, drugged and helpless. Your witnesses are in an equal state of befuddlement. The proprietor is anxious to cover up the crime because of the police. That you. Yes, sir. Now, the question is, who is the intended victim? That, my dear Watson, is why I've been shadowing this man. Unfortunately, he was not present in the den we just left, but I intend to continue my search. Holmes, uh, can, can I help you? My, my wife's away, you know. You know, it's... 
a long time since we were on a case together. I should be delighted, my dear chap. I've missed you sadly during the past few months. And I, are you, Holmes? What's the next move? Back to Baker Street, old fellow. My disguise is wearing thin, and I must contrive a new one. <laughs> New disguise, eh? Well, which one shall it be, Watson? Well, how about the old flower cellar? <laughs> I love that one. <laughs> well, it's pretty <laughs> fresh, <laughs> <it's> well, <laughs> Oh, no, 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 my dear fellow, no. Hardly appropriate for an opium <laughs> dinner. In any case, the clothes are so wretchedly uncomfortable. Well, how about the music hall singer? Oh, that chap, yes. Oh, I don't want to be beside the seaside. Oh, I don't want to be beside the sea. I don't want to stroll along the prom, 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 where the brass band plays tiddly um. Oh, confound it. Who can that be? You weren't expecting anyone, were you? No. This is just like the old days. The doorbell ringing, Mrs. Hudson toddling off and bringing up some poor devil in trouble. And... You say that rather wistfully, old fellow. Don't tell me that you repent of marriage. No, oh, of course not, Holmes. Mary's a perfect darling and I couldn't be happier. Just the same. <laughs> it is rather fun to be back here again. Come in. Yes, Mrs. Hudson? Uh, it's a gentleman, sir. He gave me this card. Says he's very anxious to see you. Hmm. Wayne J. Layton, President, Layton Corporation, Chicago, United States. Ask him to come up, will you, Mrs. Hudson? Aye, sir. Well, it's quite the cold times to see you back here, Dr. Hudson. Well, that's just what I was saying myself, Mrs. Hudson. Hmm. Mr. Layton has scribbled a message on the back of his card. If a thousand pounds for a week's work interests you, you'll see me. A thousand pounds? Big fish, Watson. Very big fish. Uh, this way, sir. Thank you. Oh. How do you do, Mr. Layton? I guess you're Sherlock Holmes. You guessed correctly, sir. Excuse me. Oh, Mrs. Hudson, just a moment, Mrs. Hudson. Hi, Mr. Holmes. Sit down, won't you, Mr. Layton? My name's Watson, Dr. Watson. I'm Sherlock Holmes's colleague. Uh, yes, I've, I've heard about you, too. Uh, like a cigar, Doctor? It's a good one. Sent me back three shillings. Oh, three shillings? Oh, thank you. That's very nice. You just put one. Oh, no, I think you do yourself. Splendid. And now, Mr. Layton, may I ask what brings you here? I'll talk fast and to the point. I'm a businessman. I like to do things in a business way. I have a chance to control the guano deposits of the Republic of San Pedro. Their minister will be in London tomorrow, and if it weren't for one thing, I know that I could swing the deal and get the concession. And what is that one thing, Mr. Layton? The deal is secret, see? I thought no one knew about it, but when I got here, I found out that my biggest business rival has gotten wind of what's going on. He's an Englishman. I've never met him, but uh, he's right here in London. Now, I'm not going to tell you his name, not until you give me your word that you'll work for me. Just what you wish me to do, Mr. Layton. Get this rival of mine and keep him out of circulation for a week. I don't care how you do it, and I won't ask. In a week's time, I'll give you the other half of this 500 pounds I brought with me. Oh, good, Scott. What kind of uh, detective Watson, do you... Watson, give Mr. Layton his hat and gloves. That's it. Thanks, old fellow. Goodbye, sir. Uh, what are you doing, throwing me out? I can't think where you uh, gathered the impression that I indulged in kidnapping. Once again, goodbye, sir. And here, sir, you can take back your cigar. Well, if you don't want some easy money, I'll soon find someone else that does. This is the last you'll see of me, Mr. Holmes. Life is full of little consolations. Hmm. Some people seem to think that money can... Watson, buy... the game's afoot. Mr. Layton is the man I've been seeking. The man who pretends to be an opium smoker. Why, Bays, did you let him get away? Here, I'll go after him. No, 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 no. don't worry. I've already arranged for that. Oh, how? When I left the room just now to talk to Mrs. Hudson, I was intending to tell her to summon some of my band of street urchins. You know, the Baker Street Irregulars. When she informed me that half a dozen of them... We're in the kitchen at this very moment, partaking of one of her incomparable steak and kidney pies. The rest should be obvious. You left instructions for one of them to shadow Mr. Layton when he left her. Elementary, my dear Watson. Oh, don't tell me that Layton back again. No, I think not. I should say that at the moment he's just about to walk out of the front door. No, I think we shall have another visitor. And judging by the commotion, the incoming and the outgoing visitors know each other and are not on the best of terms. Well, it sounds to me as if we're having a fight. Here comes Mrs. Hudson to tell us about it. Come in, come in. Oh, Mr. Holmes, you've got another visitor. Uh, so I gathered. Mrs. Hudson, you gave my instructions to one of the boys? I did that, sir. Young Wiggins was going to follow the gentleman. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Hudson, what was all that commotion about downstairs just now? Oh, it was the two gentlemen shouting at each other. Him that was leaving and the one that was waiting on the doorstep. And who is our new visitor, Mrs. Hudson? Here's his card, sir. Oh, thank you. Linton Chumley, 9 Belgrave Square. Well... Ask him to come up, will you, Mrs. Hudson? Very well, Mr. Holmes. Oh, one thing more. Yes, sir. Uh, please instruct another of the Baker Street Irregulars to follow this Linton Chumley when he leaves here and report to me. All right, sir. Hmm. You're taking no chances, Holmes, eh? 
You're having this fellow shut out, too. Leighton is a potential murderer. Of that, I'm convinced. This Mr. Chumley might possibly be his intended victim. While we are talking to him, Watson, old fellow, I want you to be sure to look at the condition of his eyes. Uh, I certainly will. Come in. Oh, good evening, Mr. Chumley. How are you, Mr. Sherlock Holmes? I am. This is my colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do, sir? Uh, that was Wayne Leighton that was just left here, uh, wasn't it? Uh, won't you sit down, sir? Uh, thank you. I don't want to sit down. All right, you needn't answer my question, but I know it was Leighton. I have never met him, but I've seen his picture in the newspapers. Oh, very well, then, sir. It was Wayne Leighton. Ah, I know why he came to you. He's, he's trying to have me put out of the way while he closes that deal on the San Pedro and Guana concession. Now, look here, Holmes. You've got to be on my side. Whatever fee he offered you to dispose of me, I'll double it if you'll take care of him for a few days. Oh, dear me, this is becoming monotonous. Watson? The hat and gloves? Thank you, old chap. That's right. Good night, Mr. Chumley. Uh, look here, Holmes. I'll, I'll treble his fee. I'll quadruple it. My dear Mr. Chumley, I have accepted no fee from Mr. Layton. I don't propose to accept one from you. Your hat and glove, sir. Uh, that man is out to kill me, Holmes. Well, if you won't help me, I'll go to the police. That's an excellent idea, Mr. Chumley. Again, good night. Did you notice his eyes, Watson? Yes, the pupils were contracted. He's obviously an opium addict. And also a potential corpse. Well, what do we do now? Wait for the irregulars to report? No, you'll return home for your medical bag. I have a feeling that you'll need it before the night is out. Then come back here. If I've gone before you return, I'll send one of the irregulars to bring you to wherever I may be. Wait until you receive a message from me. On your way, old chap. There's work ahead of us. <laughs> Wiggins, you're certain that this is the place that Mr. Holmes told you to bring me to? Oh, yes, Dr. Watson. The corner of Swanham Line and Brixel Street, Mr. Holmes said. Yeah, well, this is the spot, all right. I don't see any sign of him. Hello? This old woman coming towards us. Oh, so that's the disguise he chose. Oh, spare me a few coppers, will you, mister? <laughs> My feet had something awful, and I ain't had a bite of food all day. Oh, no. no, you don't, Holmes. You... Can't fool me this time. As a matter of fact, your makeup isn't very convincing. You hardly look like a woman, and nobody's nose could be quite as red as that. Don't look like a woman, don't I? <laughs> my nose is too red, is it? I'll take that. Uh, no, steady, look there. My confounded, but poor old woman has plighted me. Oh, I, I'm so sorry, old. madam. I, I didn't mean to insult you. <laughs> well, Maddie, she gave you a bit of work for all right, didn't she? I box your ears. No mistake about it. You mind your own business. <laughs> and anyhow, why aren't you aboard your ship at this time of night? Because I'm not a sailor, Watson. It's Mr. Holmes. Great heavens, Holmes. I wish you, you wouldn't confuse me like this. I'd never have recognized you. My dear Watson, when you're able to recognize me, it will indeed be the beginning of the end. When your eagle eye penetrates my disguise, I shall realize that my retirement is imminent. But enough of this. See that house opposite? You mean the ramshackle place with the broken tiled roof? Yes, I gave the irregulars instructions to let me know at once... If our two quarries ever enter the same house at the one time, they're inside there now. And I'm going in after them. Be careful, Holmes. I'd better come along with you. Can't I come too, Mr. No, no, certainly not. Both keep watch outside. If I need any help, I'll smash one of the windows, and then you can come in after me. Wait here for me. I don't expect I'll be very long. But... I'll be here, Holmes. Don't worry about me. Just take good care of yourself. <laughs> It's one o'clock, Doctor. Yes, I know, Wiggins. He's been in there half an hour. I'm beginning to get worried. Start going off, No, him, no, sir. no, Wiggins. You know Mr. Holmes. When he gives orders, he likes some... <laughs> There's a signal for help. Keep watching the house, Wiggins. I'll be out in five minutes. Go for the police. Right, sir, sir. All right, Holmes, all right. I'm coming. You have searched my house from basement to attic. Why do you not give up? I tell you again, there has been no one here tonight. But my friend came in here half an hour ago. I saw him, and before that, two other men are known to have come in here. Uh, if that is so, then where are they? Three men cannot vanish. That's just the point, you scoundrel. Out of the way. I'm going to search this hovel again. I'm not leaving here until I find Mr. Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> You'll hear the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just a second. 
And if you don't mind, I'll take that second to say just one word to the ladies. And that word is muscatel. Petri California muscatel. I want you women to know about it because Petri muscatel is one wine that practically every woman likes. Maybe because it's such a beautiful color, like pale gold. But I guess really because Petri Muscatel brings you the wonderful flavor of luscious, sun-ripened Muscat grapes. And that's a flavor. Try Petri Muscatel after dinner, or any time as a change from Petri Port. Remember, if it's a Petri wine, you know it's a good wine. And now back to Dr. Watson and tonight's story, The Eyes of Mr. Layton. Well, what happened next, Doctor? When you searched the house for the second time, did you find any trace of Sherlock Holmes or the two rival businessmen? No, Mr. Bartell, I'm afraid I didn't. What did you do? I told Wiggins to report the matter to the nearest police station and then rattle back to Baker Street in a handsome cab as fast as I could. When I arrived at the old familiar doorstep, I wrenched at the bell in a frenzy of anxiety. Finally, the door opened. And there stood Mrs. Hudson. Dr. Watson, what is it, sir? Why, oh, you're as white as a ghost. Mr. Holmes, is he here? Aye, sir, came in half an hour ago. He was dressed as a sailor and was half carrying some drunken friend of his. Oh, thank heavens he's safe. I'll go up. All right, sir. I want to know, chap. There you are. Holmes, I can't tell you how glad I am to see you. Who's that, uh, that lying on the sofa? Well, I'll be back, Watson. Though I'm afraid the poor devil's done for. Great Scott, it's Wayne Layton, the American fella. With a knife wound between his ribs. See what you can do for him, will you? All right. This is extraordinary, Holmes. You said that Layton was a potential murderer. And now he's a victim himself. The biter bit, eh, old chap? Yes, he's still breathing, but he, he hasn't a chance. I'll try him with an injection of strychnine. Holmes, how did you get his body out of the house? I, I searched the place from top to bottom, I... I found no trace of any of you. When I went in, I found the stabbing had already taken place. The proprietor then bribed me, or rather the broken-down cellar he took me for, to smuggle the body out through the secret stairway leading to the wards at the back of the house. Oh, there's no trace of Chumley there? No, he must have left before me by the same exit. Well, then you smashed the window and bolted. Yes, I knew that I could count on you to hold the fort while I was getting the body away. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's uh, try to say something, Watson. I, yes, the injection's <laughs> beginning to take effect. Uh, yes, Mr. Layton? What are you trying to say? Uh, Tell us, who stabbed you, uh, sir? Shh, shh, shh. Lips are moving. Mandalay. He's dead, Holmes. Yes, but he gave us the clue to the murderer's identity. How? In the word he mumbled just before he died. It sounded to me as if he said Mandalay. Precisely, old fellow. Never did a corpse give us a clearer instruction as to our next and final move. And that is? Back to Limehouse, Watson. Back to Limehouse. Now, here we are. This must be the place. What's this? Another opium den? Yes, I knew that since Chumley refrained from smoking earlier on in the night... In order to keep his faculties alert for murder, that an enormous reaction would set in. He'd have to find a den at once, and beyond question, a different one from that in which the murder was committed. But how do you know that he's inside here? Well, just before you returned to Baker Street tonight, I had a message from one of my irregulars. He tracked him here after he escaped from the scene of the stabbing. That was a couple of hours ago. He might have slipped away again. No, Watson, tonight he came to drown his senses with a wretched drug. He'll be here. Come on. Second injection of caffeine should bring him round. He's heavily drugged, but I think it'll work. Surprising what a five-pound note will do, isn't it? Yes, the proprietor let us bring Chumley into his private room and he... <laughs> he, he he's coming to. Who, who, who are you? Who, what, what do you want? You remember me, sir? I'm Sherlock Holmes. Oh, yes, yes, I, I remember you. You're in serious trouble, Mr. Chumley. Very serious trouble. Uh, trouble? What, what trouble? Wayne Layton didn't die. Oh. He's badly wounded, but he's going to live. 
He's at Baker Street now. He wants to go to the police and give evidence. You, you've got to get me out of this, Holmes. I'll, I'll pay you anything. Uh, Ten thousand, twenty thousand. Why did you stab Leighton? He, he was in my way. I wanted the San Pedro concession. I, I meant to kill him. But we can fix it up now, can't we, Holmes? We can fix it up yes, now. Yes, we can fix it beautifully, sir. As neat a murder confession as ever I listened to, Holmes. Exactly. Come along, Mr. Chumley. I think some night air will be good for you. We'll take you for a nice drive to Scotland Yard. <laughs> You some kippers, gentlemen. You've both been up all night, and I'm sure you can do it. Ah, it's very thoughtful of you, Mrs. Hudson. Yes, indeed it is. Uh, what is Mrs. Watson going to say when she finds you've been out all night? Oh, don't you worry about that, Mrs. Hudson. She's very understanding. <laughs> it's lucky for you that she is. Well, I'll go and leave you to your breakfast. Holmes. Yes, dear fellow? There's only one thing that puzzles me about this case. Oh, what's that? When Leighton was dying, he muttered the word Mandalay. How did that give you the key to the murderer's identity? Oh, the dead American had never met Mr. Chumley, you remember, except when they bumped into each other in our hallway. Yes, he told us that he recognized him from the newspaper photographs. Now, being an American, he had no reason to know that the name Chumley is in no way pronounced the way it is spelt. Oh, Joe, I never thought of that. Chumley. That name spelt C H O L C H O L M O N M O N D E D E R L E Y. Chal Mondele. Mondele. Precisely, old fellow. What you thought to be Mandalay was really Chal Mondele, the name of the murderer. What an amazing case. You did a remarkable job, Holmes. <laughs> I'm, I'm beginning to be confoundedly sleepy. Well, why not sleep, old chap? Your old uh, room's all ready for you. Are you going to take a nap? Oh, dear me, no. Hmm? I have much too busy a day ahead of me. Let me look at my engagement book. Uh, Baxter Square Murder. Mm-hmm. I've put the police on the track. The Duchess of uh, Ferrers. I've got her material. The princess who was about to run away from home. Good gracious me, let her run. The Pope's cameos. Ah, yes, yes. His Holiness must not be kept waiting. Uh, can, uh, can I help you again, Holmes? Uh, Mary doesn't return <laughs> until tomorrow. Well, I thought you were a sleepy old fellow. Sleepy rubbish. I never felt more wide awake in my life. <laughs> That was a swell story, Doctor. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. And it was really funny when you mistook that old lady for Holmes and she slapped your face. It wasn't very funny at all. <laughs> ah, sure it was. Come on, admit it, Doctor. Well, she did look like Holmes in disguise, you know, and you would have made the same mistake that I did. Okay, okay. Her nose was ridiculously red and she did look like a man. Now, uh, look, Doctor, forget I ever said anything. Hmm? I won't say another word. I I'll keep my mouth closed forever. Oh, come on, I wouldn't do that. Mr. Bartell? Mr. Bartell? Well, won't you even open your mouth to uh, finish your wine? Your your Petri wine? Okay, you win. You know I'll open my mouth for Petri wine any time. That Petri wine is always good wine. And for good reason, too. The Petri family has always owned and operated the Petri business. They've been making fine wines for three generations, since way back in the 1800s. That adds up to a lot of experience. Experience handed on down from father to son, from father to son. The Petri family really knows how to turn luscious California grapes into fragrant, delicious wine. And that's why, no matter what kind of wine you want, I'm sure you'll like it better if it's a Petri wine. Because Petri took time to bring you good wine. And now, Dr. Watson, what story are you going to tell us next week? Well, now, next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you a most unusual adventure that Holmes and I had in the heart of the English countryside. It concerns a corpse, a missing revolver, and a beautiful girl who was frightened of her own shadow. <laughs> Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is based on an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Man with the Twisted Lip. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series.
The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invites you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And while you're settling back comfortably in your chair, mind if I tell you about something I'd like you to share with me? It's a glass of Petri California Sherry. Of course, most people think of Petri California Sherry as the one wine that's really swell any time, but personally, I like a glass of that Petri Sherry just before dinner. You know, that's the time you're a little on edge, you've just finished your day's work, and you're waiting for your dinner, and, well, that's when you want to lean back and take it easy. And boy, that's the time a glass of Petri Sherry tastes like something just too good to be true. Try it. Petri Sherry is the perfect before dinner wine. And incidentally, if you like your sherry dry, you know, not sweet, then you'll find that Petri Pale Dry Sherry is just made for you. The important thing is the Petri label, because when it says Petri, it always means good wine. <laughs> And now for our weekly visit with our good friend and host, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Mr. Bartell. You're a bit late. I've been keeping some dinner hot for you. Here, pull up your chair and join me. That's very nice of you. Thanks, Doctor. Are you all set with tonight's story? Yes, my boy. I'm all set, as you call it. As a matter of fact, I was going over my notes on the case just before you arrived. Uh, last week, you hinted that a beautiful girl figured prominently in your adventure. That's quite right, Mr. Bartell. An extremely beautiful girl. In fact, I often used to say to Sherlock Holmes that if I'd been a little younger at the time, I might... Oh, well, you haven't come here to <laughs> listen to my personal reminiscences. You want to hear the story that I called The Problem of Tor Bridge. That's what you promised us, Doctor. How did it begin? On a windy morning in October... In, 18, in the 1890s, it was. As I was dressing, I observed how the last remaining leaves were being whirled away from the solitary plane tree which graced the yard behind our Baker Street house. I descended to breakfast, prepared to find my companion in depressed spirits, for, like all great artists, he was easily impressed by his surroundings. But, to my surprise, he was in an unusually gay mood. As I entered the room, he looked up at me and, with a, with a smile, my dear fellow, hope you slept well. Splendidly, thank you, sir. I'm so glad. Well, you're very solicitous this morning. I, I think you must have got a new case. <laughs> Am I right? The faculty of deduction is certainly contagious. Yes, I have a new case. After a month of trivialities and stagnation, the wheels revolve once more. Good. Tell me all about it. Well, as yet, there isn't much to tell. Have you ever heard of Neil Gibson? Neil Gibson? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Something to do with gold mining, isn't he? A great deal to do with it, my dear fellow. In fact, he's considered the greatest mining magnet in the world. About five years ago, he bought a large estate in Hampshire. Perhaps you've read of the tragic death of his wife. Oh, yes, of course. I remember the case now. She was murdered by a jealous governess who was in her employ, wasn't she? That point will be decided when the lady in question, uh, Grace Dunbar, I believe her name is, comes up for trial at the forthcoming Winchester Assizes. In any case, it's hard for me to see... What I can do for my client at this late date. Your client? Oh, yes, I forgot I hadn't told you. I'm getting into your involved habit of telling a story backwards. Mm. Better read this letter. Came this morning. Oh, let's have a look. Dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes, Miss Dunbar is innocent. I can't see the finest woman in the world go to her death without doing everything possible to save her. I shall call on you at 10.30 tomorrow morning to discuss the matter yours faithfully, Neil Gibson. Good gracious me. There you have it, Watson. That is the gentleman I await. Do you know anything about his dead wife? Only the, what I've been reading in the papers. Apparently, she was past her prime, which was the more unfortunate as this Miss Dunbar, who superintended the education of the two young children, is reputed to be a very attractive young lady. <laughs> the eternal triangle, eh? Well, where did the murder take place? On Gibson's estate in Hampshire. His wife was found in the grounds nearly half a mile from the manor house, late at night, clad in her dinner dress with a shawl over her shoulders, and... A revolver bullet through her brain. Any weapon found near her? No, there were no clues found at the scene of the crime. What made them suspect the governess? Well, in the first place, there was some very incriminating evidence. 
A revolver with one discharged chamber, the caliber corresponding with a bullet in the dead woman's head, was found on the floor in Miss Dunbar's wardrobe. Oh, was it? Pretty damaging evidence, Holmes. Hmm, so the coroner thought. And to make the case even blacker against Miss Dunbar, the dead woman had a note on her making an appointment at that very spot. And the note was signed by the governess. It seems obvious that the girl's guilty. And the motive's clear. Mr. Gibson would be a great catch for a young girl. Love, fortune, power, all dependent on one life. Possibly, Watson, but circumstantial evidence can be very misleading at times. Ah, there's the gentleman in question, unless I'm very much mistaken, considerably before his time. I can see him from the window here. Formidable-looking fellow. Must be well over six foot tall. <laughs> Judging by the way he's wrenching at that doorbell, he's a man with a violent temper. Mrs. Hudson's opening the door to him now. Uh, meet him on the stairs, will you, old chap? It'll save Mrs. Hudson a journey. Right, sure, Holmes. Up here, sir. Thank you, Mrs. Hudson. All right. Are you Mr. Sherlock Holmes? No, no, indeed. I'm his colleague, Dr. Watson. Uh, come along in, won't you? Mr. Neil Gibson, I presume? That's right. So you're the great Sherlock Holmes, huh? <laughs> the adjective is your own, Mr. Gibson. Sit down, won't you? By the way, you must speak uh, quite freely in front of Dr. Watson. Hmm. Well, I may as well begin by telling you that money means nothing to me in this case. You can burn it if it's any use to you in lighting the truth. Miss Dunbar is innocent, and it's up to you to prove it. Just name your fee. Now, uh, Mr. Gibson, my professional charges are on a fixed scale. I don't vary them, except when I omit them altogether. Very well. I imagine that you've read the newspaper reports of the coroner's inquest. Yes, very thoroughly. I don't see that I can add anything that'll help you. But if there are any questions you'd like to ask, I'll answer them. Thank you. First, now what were the exact relations between you and Miss Dunbar? I suppose you're within your rights in asking such questions, Mr. Holmes? We will agree to suppose so, shall we? Then I can assure you that my relations with Miss Dunbar were always those of an employer towards a young lady with whom he never conversed or even saw, except in the company of his children. Oh. Rather a busy man, Mr. Gibson, and I have no time or taste for aimless conversation. I wish you good morning. What the devil do you mean by this, Mr. Holmes? My dear sir, the case is difficult enough. Without your giving me false information. Meaning that I lie, sir? I was trying to express it as delicately as possible, but <clears throat> if you insist on the word, I won't contradict you. Why, you confound it. Don't be noisy, Mr. Gibson. Please don't be noisy. I find that after breakfast, even the smallest argument is unsettling. I suggest that a stroll in the morning air and a little quiet thought will be great to your advantage. I suppose I can't make you take the case, <clears throat> but you've done yourself no good this morning, Mr. Holmes. I've broken stronger men than you. No man ever crossed me and was the better for it. Good morning, Mr. Gibson. You've a great deal yet to learn. <laughs> On my soul, Holmes, you were unusually severe with him. <laughs> I dislike liars, Watson, and I cannot tolerate arrogance, particularly when it's coupled with great wealth. Well, how did you know about his relations with the governor? I didn't. It was pure bluff. Bluff? Well, it certainly worked. Think he'll come back? Oh, of course he will. He needs my help too badly. He'll probably change his mind before he's halfway down the stairs. Come in. <clears throat> ah, <laughs> Mr. Gibson. Just saying to Dr. Watson that I was certain you'd be back. I've been thinking it over, Mr. Holmes, and I feel that perhaps I was hasty in taking your remarks amiss. Just the same, I can assure you that the relations between Miss Dunbar and me really don't affect this case. Surely that is for me to decide, Mr. Gibson. You see, Mr. Gibson, my friend is like a doctor. He wants every symptom before he can give his diagnosis. Fire away, Mr. Holmes. What is it you want to know? The truth. I can give it to you in very few words. To begin with, I met my wife when I was gold mining in Brazil. Uh, your wife was Brazilian by birth, wasn't she, sir? Yes, doctor, and very beautiful. Well, to make a long story short, I fell in love and married her and brought her to England. After a few years, I realized that we had nothing, absolutely nothing, in common. And then I suppose this young governess, Miss Dunbar, arrived on the scene. That's right, Mr. Holmes. Well, the story should be obvious to you from there. You, uh, fell in love with this girl, I suppose, sir. Who could help it? Did you suggest marriage to her? Yes. Though I knew that my wife would never divorce me. I see. Then you made an utterly insincere proposition to her. Now, look here, Mr. Holmes. I came to you on a question of evidence, not of morals. I'm not asking for your criticism. It's only the young lady's sake that uh, forces me to touch your case at all. Now, tell me, sir. Uh, what is your own opinion as to Miss Dunbar's guilt? It's very black against her. I can't deny that. One explanation of the tragedy did come into my head, Mr. Holmes. I give it to you for what it's worth. Pray continue, Mr. Gibson. My wife was bitterly jealous. She was half crazy with hatred. She might have planned to murder Miss Dunbar, or we'll say to threaten the girl with a revolver and so frighten her into leaving us. There might have been a struggle in which the gun exploded and gone off and shot my wife, who was mm -hmm. holding it. Well, that possibility has already occurred to me. 
It's the only obvious alternative to deliberate murder. The revolver, Holmes. It was found on the floor of the governess's wardrobe. Now, Mr. Gibson, I should like to examine your house and the scene of the murder as soon as possible. Certainly, Mr. Holmes. Sergeant Coventry of the local police is still down there. He'll give you any help you may need. Excellent. Watson, old fellow, I'm out with the timetable. We're catching the next fast train to Winchester. <laughs> So if I have to have someone else on the case, I'd rather have you, Mr. Holmes. The yard gets called in, then, then we local police loses all credit for success. <laughs> Generally gets blamed for the failures. Now I've heard that you play straight. <laughs> I know not appear in the matter at all, Sergeant Coventry. If I can clear it up, I don't ask to even have my name mentioned. Oh, that's handsome of you, I'm sure. And I, I know your friend Dr. Watson can be trusted, too. Oh, don't worry, my dear fellow. We won't steal any of your thunder. Well, that's nice and friendly of you, Doctor. Well, come on, gentlemen, I'll walk you down to the bridge. That's where we found Mrs. Gibson's body. It's not far from the house here. Well, I must say, Mr. Gibson has a beautiful estate. It must be 60 or, or 70 acres. Oh, well, nearly twice that, Doctor. The woods back of the house there belongs to him, too. Mr. Holmes. Yes, Sergeant? There's a question I'd like to ask you. A question I wouldn't ask anyone else. Then please ask it. Don't you think there might be a case against Mr. Gibson himself, sir? I've been considering that possibility. That there, Miss Dunbar's a bit of all right. If you ask me, he wanted his wife out of the way, and the pistol she was shot with was his pistol, you know. Oh, uh, was, uh, was that fact uh, proven? Yes, Doctor. It was one of a pair that he had. One of a pair? Where's the other? Well, Mr. Gibson has a lot of firearms. We never quite matched that particular pistol. But the box was made for two. Well, if it was one of a pair, surely you'd be able to match it. Well, we have them all laid out at the house if you want to look them over. And we'll do that later. Ah, this, I presume, is Tor Bridge. That's right, sir. Found Mrs. Gibson's body lying right here at the approach to the bridge. I see. I gathered from the newspaper reports that the shot was fired at very close quarters. Yes, sir, very close. Near the right temple, wasn't it? Uh, just behind it, sir. How did the body lie, Sergeant? Oh, on its back, Doctor. No trace of a struggle, no marks, no weapon. The note from Miss Dunbar was clutched in her left hand. Clutched, you say? Yes, sir. We, we could hardly open the fingers to get at it. Ah, that's a... Of greatest importance, it excludes the idea that anyone could have placed the note there after death in order to furnish a false clue. What did the note say, Sergeant? Little enough, Doctor. It just said, uh, I will be at Tor Bridge at nine o'clock, and it was signed Grace Dunbar. Did Miss Dunbar admit writing it? Oh, yes, sir. What was her explanation? She wouldn't say nothing. Said she was saving her defense for the trial. Yes, it seems odd that Mrs. Gibson was still clutching that note. Seems perfectly natural to me. Oh, come now, old fellow. Argue the thing out logically. If the letter is genuine, it was certainly received sometime before the tragedy, say an hour or two. Why then was the dead woman still clasping it in her left hand? Why should she carry it so carefully? She certainly didn't need to refer to the note at all at the interview. Doesn't it strike you as rather strange? Well, now you put it that way, it does seem a little peculiar. Hello. Did you notice this, Sergeant? Oh, you mean that chip out of that <clears throat> stone on the underside of the parapet of the bridge, sir? Yes, I noticed it, uh... Didn't think nothing of it, though. Oh, it's a very large chip. Yes, but it's been done recently. Notice how the stonework is white just here. It took some violence to do that. Hand me a cane, Watson, will you? Here you are, Bullock. Thanks. Yes. It's a hard knock. And in a curious place, too. But it's 15 feet from where we found the body, Mr. Dow. Oh, yes, Holmes, I don't see how it could have any connection with Mrs. Gibson's Not murder. it hasn't. But it's a point worth noting. There were no footprints, you say, Sergeant? None, Mr. Holmes. The ground was as hard as iron. It's been a very dry summer, and we haven't had any rain to speak yes, of this. Yes, mm. Well, Sergeant, I'm much obliged to you, and now I think we'll get back to the house. Right. Uh, Cesar will show you where the firearms are, sir. Oh, uh, who is Cesar? Oh, funny kind of a bloke. Brazilian, he is. Brazilian, eh? Like Mrs. Gibson? Yes, Mr. Holmes. Uh, comes from the same town that she does, as a matter of fact. Something very fishy about him, if you ask me. Now, if you'll excuse me, gentlemen, I'm going to take a little stroll around the grounds. You started me on a new train of thought in this case, Mr. Holmes. Oh, oh, oh. I'm delighted, Sergeant. I'll get back to the house. I see. And these are all the firearms in Mr. Gibson's possession, eh, Cesar? Mm. Except for the revolver that is missing from the case, 
Yes, so I say I see him. Man, I've never seen such a collection of guns and revolvers in my life. Mr. Gibson had many enemies, senor. He always sleep with a loaded pistol beside his bed. She's a man of great violence. There have been times when all of us were afraid of him. Did you ever witness physical violence towards Mrs. Gibson? No, senor. I cannot say that I have. But I have heard him say many terrible things to her. She would taunt her in front of we servants. I have heard him do it many times. Thank you, Cesar. That will be all. Muy to bien, senor. You know, Holmes, I still think the case against Miss Dunbar looks very black. I should agree with you if it were not for one fact. The finding of the revolver in her wardrobe. On the soul, Holmes, that seems to me the strongest evidence of all. I think not, old chap. Huh? We must look for consistency. Where there is a, a want of it, we must suspect deception. I don't quite follow you. Suppose for a moment that we visualize you in the character of a woman who in cold, premeditated fashion is about to murder a rival. You've planned it. A note has been written. The victim has come. You have a, a weapon. The crime is well done. It has been workmanlike and complete. You mean to tell me that after carrying out so crafty a crime, you'd be so stupid as to forget to fling the incriminating revolver to the bottom of the stream? Or perhaps in the uh, dense reeds that border it? Would you carefully carry it home and put it in the first place that would be searched? Your wardrobe? Well, perhaps in the excitement of the no. moment, one... No, my dear chap, I won't admit that's even possible. When a crime is coolly premeditated, then the means of covering it are coolly premeditated well, also. Well, then if Miss Dunbar didn't shoot Mrs. Gibson, who the devil did? I hope I can give you the answer to that question, Watson, when we've made one further visit. Oh, Lord, where are we going now? To prison, old chap. Prison? Yes, we're going to Winchester Prison to call on Miss Dunbar, I'm certain that the key to this strange mystery lies in her hands. You'll hear the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just a few seconds. Just time enough for me to remind you that the easiest way to make good food taste better is to serve that good food with a good Petri wine. If you like a red wine, well, you want a Petri California Burgundy. If you'd rather have a white wine, then you want a Petri California Sauterne. But red or white, Petri Burgundy or Petri Sauterne, you're choosing a dinner wine that's sure to turn a simple meal into a feast. Your whole family and all your friends will love Petri, the wine that makes good food taste better. <laughs> And now, back to Dr. Watson and tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure, The Problem of Tor Bridge. Well, uh, Doctor, did you go to Winchester Prison and see Miss Dunbar? We did, Mr. Bartell. An hour later, I found the two of us sitting in a dank and gloomy cell, talking to one of the most beautiful girls that I've ever seen. Her bright, flashing eyes and her air of quiet confidence seemed sadly out of place in such a setting. Holmes spoke to her quietly... Dunbar, tell us of your true relations with the dead woman. She hated me, Mr. Holmes. She hated me with all the passion of her distorted mind. Please tell us exactly what happened on the evening of Mrs. Gibson's death. Well, I, I received a note from her in the morning. A note imploring me to meet her at the bridge after dinner that night. She said she had something important to say to me. Did you keep that note, Miss Dunbar? No, Doctor. She... Well, she asked me to destroy the note, so I burned it in the schoolroom grate. I saw no reason for such secrecy, but, well, I, I did as she asked. Mm, and yet she kept your reply very carefully. It's interesting. Tell me what happened when you met her that night. When I reached the bridge, she was waiting for me. I, I won't tell you what she said, but she poured out her whole wild fury and burning horrible words. I didn't answer. I couldn't. It was dreadful even to look at her. She was like an insane woman, standing there screaming disgusting insults at me. I, I put my hands to my ears and rushed away. Where was she standing when, when you left her? Within a few yards of the spot where her body was found later. And yet, presuming she met her death shortly after you left her, you heard no shot. No. No, I heard mm. nothing. But I was so upset, Mr. Holmes, that I rushed straight back to my room. Did you leave it again that night? Yes. When the alarm came that Mrs. Gibson was dead... I ran out with the others. Did you see uh, Mr. Gibson? Yes, Doctor. He had just returned from the bridge when I saw him. 
He had sent for the doctor and the police. Uh, this pistol that you found in your room, have you ever seen it before? Never, Mr. Holmes, I swear it. When was it found, Miss Dunbar? Next morning, when the police made their search. It was on the floor of my wardrobe where I keep my shoes. Mm, you had no idea how long it had been there? Well, it hadn't been there the morning before. How do you know? Because I had tidied up the wardrobe that day. I see. Then someone must have come into your room and placed the pistol there in order to incriminate you. I'm certain of it. Uh, when, uh, when could they have done that? Well, it, it, it could have been at mealtimes or when I was in the schoolroom with the children. Yes. Miss Dunbar, on examin examining the scene of Mrs. Gibson's death, I noticed that a piece of stonework on the underside of the parapet of the bridge had been broken away. Can you suggest any possible explanation for that? Oh, surely it must have been a mere coincidence, Mr. Holmes. Possibly. But why should it appear at the very time of the tragedy and at the very place? Could it possibly be the... Why, yes, of course. Idiot. Why didn't I think of it before? Come along, Watson. Where are we going, Holmes? Back to Thorbridge, old fellow. As fast as we can get there. What have you found out, Mr. Holmes? The answer to this mystery, I hope, my dear young lady. You will get news before the day is out. And meanwhile, take my assurance that the clouds are lifting and that the light of truth is breaking through. <laughs> Well, Mr. Holmes, you're soon back here. What have you found out? Turn on a few moments. Have you got my message? Oh, yes, sir. Here you are. Ball of twine. What you want it for, I can't imagine. Uh, you'll soon see, Sergeant. Uh, Watson, I uh, have some recollection that you usually go armed on these excursions of ours. Yes, I'm carrying my revolver. Why? Uh, give it to me, old chap, will you? Uh, Thanks. Thank I, I believe your revolver may have a very intimate connection with the mystery we're investigating. <laughs> you're joking. Now, Watson, I'm very serious. What? I have a test to make. If the test is successful, Miss Dunbar will be free before nightfall, and the test will depend on the conduct of this revolver of yours. Yes, I'll take the precaution of unloading it. Uh-huh. There we are. Now, Sergeant, ball of twine, please. Wish I knew what you was up to, sir. I tie one end of the twine like this to the handle of the revolver. So... Sergeant, see if you can find me a heavy stone, will you? Oh, right, your sir. Holmes, what are you doing? Trying to reconstruct the killing of Mrs. Gibson. But you've seen me miss the mark before, Watson. I have an instinct for such things, and yet it has sometimes played me false. It seemed a certainty when it first flashed across my mind in Miss Dunbar's cell. But one drawback of an active mind is that one can always conceive alternative explanations which would make our scent a false one. And yet, oh, well... We can but try. Here's a nice stone, Mr. Holmes. Thank you, Sergeant. Yes, now, sir. I tie the other end of the twine to the stone. Wait a minute. Like that. Splendid. Uh, Sergeant, will you please take the stone and stretch the twine across the parapet of the bridge there so that the stone will swing just clear of the water on the other side of the bridge? Right, sir. I'll stand on the spot where Mrs. Gibson's body was found. That's it, Sergeant. Over the parapet. How's that, Mr. Holmes? The stone swinging about eight feet above the water. Splendid. Now, Watson, watch closely. I raise the revolver to my head. Careful, Holmes, careful. Don't worry, old chap, it's not loaded. Now, let us imagine I am the late Mrs. Gibson. I raise the revolver to my head and fire it. Instantly, my fingers release their grip and... There's your answer, Watson. Great. It's got the revolver flashed back out of your hand. Struck the parapet of the bridge and then the weight of the stone flipped it over into the water. Was there ever a more exact demonstration? Come on, old fellow. You're a blooming magician, Mr. Holmes. That's what you are. A blooming magician. Look at that. Observe the second chip on the stonework, the parapet here. Same size as the first. And then the murder of Mrs. Gibson... It wasn't murder at all. It was suicide. What? We can follow the various steps quite clearly. A note was extracted very cleverly from Miss Dunbar. A note which made it appear that she had chosen the scene of the crime. Mrs. Gibson, in her anxiety that the note should be discovered, somewhat overdid it by holding it in her hand to the last. That alone should have excited my suspicions earlier than it did. So she stole one of her husband's revolvers... And planted the other one in Miss Dunbar's wardrobe. Exactly. After discharging one of the cartridges, which you could easily do in the woods without attracting suspicion, she then went down to the bridge, where she contrived this exceedingly ingenious method of getting rid of her weapon. When Miss Dunbar appeared, she used her last breath in pouring out her hatred, and then, when the girl had left, carried out her terrible purpose. In the missing reward... You'll find it uh, with the aid of a grappling hook at the bottom of the stream, and also the stone and the string. Uh, with which this vindictive woman attempted to, to disguise her own crime and fasten a charge of murder on an innocent victim. Yes, Sergeant, and don't forget while you're at it that my revolver's down there, too. Oh, don't worry, Doctor. I'll get some grappling hooks right away. 
I must say, Holmes, you solved this case brilliantly. Quite brilliantly. Uh, I disagree, old chap. And I fear that you will not improve my reputation by adding the case of the Torbridge mystery to your annals. Oh, nonsense. But that's ridiculous. Oh, no, it isn't, old boy. I've been sluggish in my mind and wanting in that mixture of imagination and reality, which is the very basis of my art. I confess that the chip in the stonework was a sufficient clue to suggest the true solution, and I blame myself for not having attained it sooner. Well, Holmes, personally, I agree with the sergeant's opinion of you. Oh? What was that, old fellow? You're a blooming magician, Mr. Holmes. That's what you are, a blooming magician. Oh. <laughs> Doctor, Holmes really was a magician. That is, if you did find Mrs. Gibson's revolver and your own in the oh, stream. Oh, we found them all right. You don't think I'd tell you the story otherwise, do you? Uh, what do you take me for, anyway? Well, now that you ask, I'll tell you. I take you for a very charming gentleman, a wonderful oh, storyteller, yeah. and a fine host. Oh, well, I do, uh, really, I... Well, you are a gentleman of the old school. Oh, and you do old... tell a fine story. <laughs> You flatter me, you... Uh, and you are a perfect host. Oh, I that mean, meal we had tonight was wonderful. Oh, it was, eh? And, um, that, that wine, what kind was it? It was Petri wine, and you know it. <laughs> and I should have known that you were leading up to something. Mr. Bartell, you should be ashamed of yourself. You will do anything to get a chance to talk about Petri wine. Oh, I can't say that I blame you. Well, honestly, Doctor, I meant everything I said. But you don't really want me to stop talking about Petri wine, do you? After all, it's worth talking about, isn't it? What other wine is made with the loving care that goes into Petri wine? Don't forget, Petri wine is made by the Petri family. Winemaking is their business. Why, they've been making wine for generations, handing down from father to son, from father to son, all their skill and knowledge and experience. You can be sure the Petri family really knows plenty about the fine art of turning luscious grapes into delicious wine. That's why, whether you want a wine for before dinner, with dinner, or for any time, you can't go wrong with a Petri wine, because Petri took time to bring you good wine. And, and now, Dr. Watson, what new story are you planning to tell us next week? Well, next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell an adventure that Holmes and I had amid the oriental magnificence of a Maharaja's palace in India. India? Sounds intriguing. Uh, what were you and Sherlock Holmes doing out there, Doctor? Well, we'll have to wait until uh, next week for the answer to that question, my boy. But I can tell you that it was one of the weirdest problems that we ever had to solve. I call the story The Vanishing Elephant. <laughs> Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is adapted from the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Problem of Tor Bridge. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. 